morning. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. Trying to get everything set up. Had power outage. Unex well, all power outages are generally unexpected, but uh, we had a power outage last night and everything's a little wonky. So we are going to continue on with the, uh, well, an alternate drawer. Sorry. We're going to continue on with the Shanda uh, Vander arc or Shonda, as her son was calling her, trial today. Um, if you have been watching this trial, you have probably seen some or heard some really bad testimony. She is accused of torturing and basically starving her 15-year-old son uh, to death. And her older son, Paul, who I believe was 19 at the time, uh, he, they're kind of saying he was in on it, that he helped when they read his text messages. It sounded horrible. Uh, but he testified Friday. Well, I played it Friday. He testified that day. This trial actually started Wednesday. I started streaming it Friday. Um, it was heartbreaking to hear his testimony. I believe that he is now away from his mother's influence and he is now, his eyes are opened and he has seen what they did, how wrong it was. And I, I think he is just, he's very remorseful. He doesn't call her mom. He calls her Shonda. She allowed uh, her attorney to, ba to try to throw him under the bus, which to me was disgusting. As a mother, you take your punishment for what you did. She was in control. She was calling the shots. She did horrible, horrible things. They had leg shackles for this boy. He died of hypothermia in July. They left him in an ice bath, I believe, for six hours. And he was already pretty much on the edge of, of death at that point anyway. They put him in there, I think, to kind of wake him up. Uh, she says in a text message to Paul that she had threatened him, his name was Timothy, to take him to the emergency room if he did not uh, sit up or, or something. She, this poor kid, all she fed him was bread and water. Most of the time, the bread was soaked in hot sauce. And I'm not talking like Frank's or Tabasco. We're talking Carolina Reaper, uh, some kind of scorpion. I'm not, I don't do spicy stuff. So I'm not familiar with all these pepper names and all that sort of thing. But that's the kind of spice level we're talking about. And he would have to eat three or four pieces of bread with that hot sauce on there. And then she would say to her son that if he kept it, I think she meant if, she, if he kept it down for 30 minutes, then he could just have some bread. When he was in his final moments, she told her son, because she was, she was at work. She actually worked in the courthouse that we're going to see here in just a second. Her lawyer just keeps going on about how smart she is. She graduated second in her law school class and uh, just super smart, worked in the courthouse. I'm like, so she worked around all the help in the world that she could have had for her son and chose not to get it. But she had cameras in the home, motion. Some of them were motion sensor cameras, always watching. She could talk back and forth through the cameras. In one of the text messages, I, for, I forget what our son Paul said, but it basically was kind of her saying, you better fix this or it's going to be bad for both of you when I get home. So I don't know where Paul really probably didn't feel like he had much of a choice. Um, I believe they are suspecting that Timothy was autistic. Uh, had And Paul seems to, if, it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't have some sort of level of autism as well watching him uh, testify. But depending on where Timothy, if Timothy was autistic, depending on where he was on that spectrum, I'm not super familiar with autism, but I know they can be nonverbal. I know they don't want you to touch them. I, there's a lot of things that are different. 
His dad had called her, Shonda, from Oklahoma and told her, I'm putting him out. I can't deal with him. Either you come get him or go to, he's going to go to CPS. He should have went to CPS. And I know that's not always the good answer. He should have went to CPS. He might still be alive. Uh, she got him. She had a younger son, G, in the house, if they have referred to him. And she would tell Paul all the time, make sure G doesn't see. So she had to have some level of knowing what she was doing was wrong, even though her attorney says she didn't intend to do anything. I don't know of any somebody that has abused a child and ended up actually beating them, you know, to death or or what have you that says they meant to do it. They all say I didn't I didn't mean to. I lost control. That hearing the stuff that we have heard that doesn't fly here. Knowing she's an attorney well, she's I don't know, she passed the bar, so I don't know where she was at in all of that, but she worked in the courthouse. She was clerking for judges. She had resources available to her. She would have just asked. She knew on a level of what she was doing was wrong because she hid it from her youngest son. She involved her oldest son. And when she he sent her a picture of Timothy, who was 15 years old, and at the time of his death, he weighed 69 pounds. He was nothing. The judge has not allowed the prosecutor to show any pictures of Timothy, even like even when he was alive, just out of respect for Timothy. So you can only imagine what he probably looked like being six, 69 pounds at 15 years old. They said the average 15 year old weighs about 132 pounds. So she tried to claim he went, had went on a hunger strike for two weeks. And like, you can't explain the weight loss like that. So there's one more witness for the state. Uh, the only thing I was confused about that I was thinking today is why hasn't the state called any people that she works with? Because after, so January of 2022, her husband suffered a stroke. He had to move out of the home. He could not walk up and down stairs. She seemed to break at that point in time. After that happened in January, which I believe was January 3rd, there's no more pictures of Timothy on her phone. So if they're, if they're using that as the, the spot, then that kind of leads me to believe that prior to January of 2022, there were pictures of Timothy on her phone. Was she talking about Timothy at work and then just all of a sudden she didn't talk about Timothy anymore? Did she lie and say he went to live back with his dad? Did she, what's her story there with people that she worked around? knowing now there's zero evidence that Timothy even exists on her phone or anywhere. He wasn't allowed to go to school. He wasn't allowed to go to the doctor. He, the only time he was allowed to go outside was out back when he sometimes got to walk the dog or on his punishment when he got to run up and down the stairs. But Paul said you couldn't see him. There, you, there was no way for anybody to see him when he was back there. So nobody saw Timothy after January. So I kind of have questions about where no was why was nobody questioning where's Timothy? Why are you not talking about Timothy? What'd she say? And maybe we'll find out. So she's gonna take the stand after this next witness, who I think is a doctor, so I don't know if it's an ME that's gonna kind of tell us what his state was when uh, he passed away. I'm not sure. Uh and then she's on stand for the rest of today. And then what we will do tomorrow, which is going, which is Friday's testimony. She's on the stand. It looks like all day. It went to the jury Friday, but I've been super careful to not find, like to, to not see anything about a, a verdict. I don't know how they come back honestly with anything else. Unless she comes up with some remarkable thing on the stand. Um, but I don't know that there is a verdict in yet. I haven't looked super hard. I just have everything from Friday saved so that we can do it tomorrow. And maybe there might be a verdict in there. So um, we shall see. But let's get started. And because this is, so, so far there's not been any bad pictures. Um, 
the testimony is hard to hear. So please be aware of that. All right, I have everything boosted, ready, turn these on. And maybe we'll get to speed it up today. I don't know. Sometimes these attorneys talk super fast and other times they're like, eh. whatever. Or that I, <laughs> I think it's the you judge breathing in the mic. Please. This matter now pending. You swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So if you got. I do. All right, put your hand down and grab a seat. Please spell your name for the record, or state your name for the record, spelling your first and last. My name is Joyce Young. It's J-O-Y-C-E. Last name is D-E, capital J-O-N-G. Thank you. And could you state your occupation for the record, please? I am a forensic pathologist and the medical examiner for 12 counties in Michigan, including Muskegon. And where are you currently employed? I'm employed at the Western Michigan University Homer Stryker MD School of Medicine in Kalamazoo. And you said you are the currently the medical examiner for a number of counties here in Michigan, including Muskegon, is that correct? Yes. Um, you do serve some of the other adjacent counties as well? Other adjacent counties in southwest Michigan, Muskegon, Mason, and then um, uh, Grand Travers and Lee Lanon. The uh, And could you just briefly go through your qualifications? I don't believe there's going to be an objection to your qualifications or your, your being qualified as an expert, but could you just give the jury a brief overview of your educational and uh, professional background? Yes. So I am a board certified forensic pathologist. And uh, my educational background, starting with college, was I graduated from Grand Valley State University with a Bachelor's of Science degree. I then graduated from Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine with my DO. Uh, I'm a physician. Uh, I did a one-year internship, and uh, which was a traditional internship rotating through multiple areas uh, in the hospital, followed by four years of a uh, an anatomic pathology fellow uh, residency where I'm learning general pathology and that was followed by a one-year forensic pathology fellowship where uh, where I was trained specifically in forensic pathology which is the study and investigation of sudden and unexpected deaths um, and to, to answer questions about those types of deaths so I'm board certified by the American Board of Pathology in both anatomic and in forensic pathology, so general pathology, which is a very broad uh, study of disease for physicians and things like, you know, if you have a skin biopsy or something biopsy, that goes to the pathologist. But then um, uh, I'm subspecialty trained, like I mentioned, in the uh, in the study and investigation of, of deaths. Uh, I've been uh, employed as a forensic pathologist since. Uh, uh, since I finished my fellowship, which was in uh, 1999, and I've been the medical examiner for Muskegon since January of 2000. And as the medical examiner for Muskegon and for the other counties, what are your responsibilities there? The responsibilities for the medical examiner, there are certain deaths that are required to be reported to us, not all of them. Uh, most deaths are natural and most of those are, are, do not get reported. Uh, but when a death is sudden, unexpected, traumatic, uh, or just it's very unclear maybe why a death occurred, that gets reported to us. Our, our duties uh, with those deaths that are reported are to investigate them. On behalf of the medical examiner, we work, uh, we work in parallel and, and uh, with other agencies that are investigating deaths. And, and we will then, in many of them, if it's indicated, do a post-mortem examination, an autopsy, uh, in order to answer questions. The, the biggest questions that we answer are what caused the death. Sometimes it's very apparent, sometimes it's not, but what was the cause of death? And um, that, that can be something, the cause of death is, there are a lot of different causes. There's thousands of different causes. You could die from lung cancer or a, a, you know, a, a myocardial infarct due to coronary artery disease. So there's lots of different causes um, a gunshot wound to the head could be a cause of death. But we also render an opinion on the manner of death, and that's part of our role as the medical examiner. We're required on the death certificate to complete that part. And the manner of death 
we're, we're limited in the state of Michigan. Uh, every state has their own, but, but they're, they almost all follow this standard, and that is that you, death could be classified as natural, as a suicide, as a homicide, as an accident, or in some cases as indeterminate, where um, uh, there's not adequate information to make that, to render an opinion on that. And could you sp uh, speak a little bit more to what those causes are? Natural sounds pretty obvious, but if you could just briefly explain those different types of, I'm sorry, not causes, those are manners of death. Sure, so the, the manners of death, um, if it's a natural death, that means that the natural disease was, it was 100% natural. So you died from your lung cancer, you died from your myocardial infarct that ruptured or that caused an arrhythmia, or you died from your, um, uh, uh, you, you died from any other kind of natural condition, all right? So um, pancreatic cancer, I know we keep thinking about cancers, but there's a lot of different natural diseases from COPD. Um, so, so those are the natural ones. If it's an accident, that means that, um, and some of those like uh, motor vehicle collision and, and where, we're, where nobody really intended to do harm, but somebody runs a red light and there's a collision and there's an accident. Um, and and uh, uh, we classify those as accidents. Somebody may have done something wrong, but, but, uh, um, but it's so classified as there wasn't any kind of intent there. For a suicide, there, there was, uh, it appeared, you know, if, if you're looking at all of the circumstances, and, and in order to, to determine the, the, the manner of death, you do have to have the circumstances of the death. And that would be, uh, um, you know, to, to gather that information. And, and I like to use the example of a gunshot wound of the head, for example, using the circumstances. And let's talk about that to try and differentiate a suicide from an accident from a homicide, you're pretty sure if someone died of a gunshot wound that it's not a natural death. There's something that's exogenous that's outside that's, that's happened here. But if it's a gunshot wound to the head, how do you decide if this is a suicide, an accident, uh, someone dropped a gun and the gun went off, or a homicide, another person shot at that person with the intent to do harm or to frighten or to hurt them, um, or is it a suicide where they shot themselves? And you have to gather information from the scene and from the findings on the body and from the history in order to make those and classify those deaths. Uh, so that's generally more. And so homicide would really be the death at the hands of another um, and suicide at, at one's own hands. And um, uh, that, that's generally how, did that answer your question? Yes, I, I okay. believe so. But, but just so we're clear, homicide is classified as what? Death at the hands of another. And then the final cause you said was indeterminate is that, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, when you basically can't figure out exactly what the reason sure. was for, for the cause of that. Right, if there's inadequate information. Um, I would offer Dr. DeYoung at this point as an expert in the field of forensic pathology. No objection. Okay, the court will accept her as a uh, expert in the field of, you said, forensic pathology? Yes. All right. Sir Roberts, before you continue, can you, we have a sidebar real quick. <clears throat> Long sidebar, Judge. Sorry, I know it's boring getting through all these qualifications. All right, you can continue, Mr. Roberts. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> not quite sure where we left off, so I guess I would just ask this. Doctor, did you become involved in the investigation into the death of Timothy Ferguson, which occurred on or around July 6th of 2022 in the city of Norton Shores, kind of the skiing state of Michigan? Yes, I did. And um, how did you become involved in that process? This was a death that was reported to our office. One of our investigators responded to the scene uh, and um, a, a determination was made that an autopsy was needed and I conducted that autopsy uh, on uh, July 7, 2022. And uh, you referenced there an investigator. Can you just explain a little bit to the jury about the role the investigator plays and how that, that coincides or, or works with uh, what you're performing in terms of the uh, overall examination? Yes. So. Uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, we cover a lot of counties. There's a lot of uh, geography there. In each county, we have medical examiner investigators. They are non-physicians who are trained to perform investigations on behalf of our office. When a death occurs, one of these investigators uh, will respond to the scene, gather information on our behalf, will communicate with the forensic pathologist, the medical examiner, or one of the deputy medical examiners, and they then arrange for, in, in cases where an, an autopsy is needed, they'll arrange for transport of the, uh, of the deceased body to come to Kalamazoo for that exam at, at the medical school. So in this particular case, you said that one of your medical examiner investigators did respond to the scene and uh, conducted an investigation on behalf of, of the school. Is that correct? Well, on behalf of the medical examiner. On behalf of the medical examiner. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. So, yes. And did, uh, as a result of that, did you have the information from that investigator at the time that you conducted the autopsy? Did you have some of it? What? I had some information, yes. They, uh, they always provide us. We need to have, we need to have some kind of context for for how somebody was found as opposed to uh, uh, just blindly going in and doing an exam so uh, they, they provide that information in advance of the autopsy then do you wait for that information before you make a determination that an autopsy will be conducted or is that the determination of an autopsy there wasn't a lot of uh, there wasn't a lot of uh, discussion over whether an autopsy was needed in this case uh, it was a, a essentially a pediatric case of someone who died and uh, the findings on the scene everything looked like this was not uh, the, the, this could this could possibly not be a natural death or even if it was we would need to know what that natural condition was so there were a lot of questions there wasn't a, a cause or manner known um, but there wasn't any question in your mind upon hearing the facts and circumstances that an autopsy had to be conducted there was no question then what is the process involved in natural Again, I know this is boring. So according to the, Paul, her son, when he testified, when they found him non-responsive, he wanted to call 911 and she wouldn't let him. We, He said for 18 minutes and the defense really kind of grilled him on that. Like, why did you pick 18 minutes? I mean, most people would say five minutes or 10 minutes, but 18 is very specific. Well, the prosecution told him that and... uh. And the prosecutor asked him. I mean, it's kind of crazy when the state is your friend in these cases because Paul's also charged not with first. She's charged with first degree uh, unaliving of another, if you will, as she should be. Um, he is charged with, I believe, first degree child abuse. Um, I don't know if he's going to go to trial or not. He did agree to testify against his mom. And he is going to hopefully, you know, maybe get some consideration on his sentencing. I think he deserves it. The kid is just devastated by what he did. When the defense asked him if he loved his brother, he said, uh, obviously, you know, obviously not at the time I didn't. He said, I do now, but I didn't then. I didn't enough then. It was so sad. It was awful. And it was infuriating. God, I can't even speak for his mother to allow that. I, I just, as a mom, I could not imagine just sitting there watching just somebody repeatedly driving the bus over my child as I, and I said, I gave him the green light. I would not, I would not have done that. I would have just said, just be easy on him. And they went after him so hard. And I just didn't agree with that. So I will continue on. I have so many thoughts on that. <laughs> it's sad and it's so maddening. And I, I will maybe explode. You might see just me explode once she gets on the stand. I have no idea what she's going to say. But if she doesn't take responsibility and she doesn't show remorse and she doesn't say she's sorry, uh that's going to be hard to watch. They're conducting the autopsy, and you can use specific examples from this case, how that take, takes place. Sure. So uh, when we first uh, when, when we first start, that I actually start with, with at least uh, reviewing the information that's available from the investigator. Uh, then we do an external examination of the body. Uh, we'll take x-rays of, of, the, of the body. 
but we, we look at the body just as it's received with all of its clothing on, if there is clothing and any other any other materials. Oh, we, yeah, and they got him dressed, according to Paul. We then uh, remove the clothing from the body and, uh, and repeat that process, clean the body up, and take another full set of photographs. To do the internal examination, all of these findings are, are documented as well. Uh, we, we measure the body. We weigh the body. Uh, we we uh, we will also then take um, we'll make incisions in the body, incisions in the chest and the abdomen, so we can uh, and uh, go allow we'll see how this goes. I may have to slow it back down uh, from the, the the neck, the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis. We then also make an incision in the scalp and have to make uh, cuts in the skull in order to examine the brain as well. That's all done. We also are gathering body fluids for when testing. She gets uh, to uh, testing on the blood what's actually happening testing. and what she actually did. Actually I may slow it back down. For other but right now, she's just talking about what she does. Uh, and these are all things that were done in this case. So a lot of that we're looking for. I also took samples to look at things under the microscope. So we're looking um, under the microscope for any kinds of evidence of natural diseases or other findings like that. Um, all of these things get uh, documented, and, and sometimes, obviously, you don't have all the answers on day one because you're waiting for other laboratory tests and toxicology exams, but that all then finally gets integrated <coughs> into a report uh, that provides uh, the information and, and documentation of what the observations were. And you then speak to, uh, specifically with regard to Mr. Ferguson, uh, your initial observations and what process was, uh, what you did to, to reach a determination as to the cause of death for Timothy Ferguson. Sure. So uh, it, was, it was readily apparent uh, upon viewing the body of Timothy Ferguson that uh, he had a very low body weight. He appeared extremely emaciated. You think? Uh, he, uh, he was 68 inches tall, uh, inches long, inches tall, uh, and he weighed 69 pounds at that point. Uh, he had, it was clear he had really a loss of, uh, of, of all of his body fat. His cheeks were, were very narrow. Uh, he had, you could, you could see and count all of his ribs. And even internally when we're looking at him, uh, he had, in, in areas where you typically have some body fat in, within your abdomen and, and in different areas, there was none. There was only the little bit of connective tissue that would normally hold the, the, the fat. But you could see uh, all of his bony prominences. And on his back, he had started getting some pressure sores because there wasn't a lot of padding in between his bones and his skin as well. So where those areas had pressure, the skin was starting to break down. So you talked for just a moment about the, his weight and height. As it relates first to his height, uh, I think you indicated he was 68 inches tall or 69 inches tall? He was 69 inches, uh, 68 inches tall and weighed 69 pounds. Right. So as it relates to height at 68 inches tall, how does that rank in terms of an average, uh, and he was 15 at the time, how does, how does he fall in the scale for average uh, height? Right, so in order to determine that, if you've ever taking a kid to the pediatrician or whatever, but there are growth charts and there's normals for what people should be, what kids should be as they grow up. And they, they have kind of, uh, you know, a percentile, like if you're the 50th percentile, about half the population might be taller than you or way more at that age, at that same age, and half the population's gonna weigh less than you if you're at the 50th percentile. Uh, and so uh, in, in this case, for his age, uh, at the time he died, at 68 inches, he was in the 60th percentile. So 40% were taller than him, and 60% uh, are shorter than him at that at that age. For so his, a little over average. So. Yeah, a little over average, but no, uh, very normal so height. I think you were likely going to get into, so the next question would be, can you do the same analysis as it relates to his weight? His weight was 69 pounds. That was... Uh, on the chart, less than the first percentile, essentially zero percentile. Every other child at that age largely would weigh more than him. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a really uh, severe, um, extreme emaciation. And how, you said you've been a medical examiner, at least for Muskegon County, for 20 plus years, is that correct? Yes. And do you get a lot of cases where a person has, has died as a result of emaciation or starvation? 
Mr. Roberts? I think it goes to the issue as to whether or not, uh, it, well, the question here is whether or not Ms. Vander Ark was responsible for the death of the child and whether or not it's, it's unusual for a person to have been uh, essentially starved to death. And I think this medical examiner is certainly qualified to testify about whether or not there have been other cases, other similar cases uh, that have resulted in starvation. Your Honor, I would concede that she could, she's qualified to testify to that effect. However, I, our argument is this, this relevance to this matter. What, what relevance does it have how often this happens in the state of Michigan or the United States or in the world for that matter? It's simply not relevant to the facts for this jury. Yeah, I, um, I think she's testified to where he, he landed on the scale of, of normal adults his age. Um, I think asking her how many other cases like this she's seen is, is not relevant to this particular case. I am going to sustain the objection. Thank you. Um, so we talked about the height and the weight, and you said that part of the analysis also involves a um, internal examination of the organs. Is that correct? Maybe he was asking and her. Specifically, as it relates so to your internal examination, talk did about that examination her having combined knowledge. With, with the overall examination reveal any other contributing factors to Timothy Ferguson's death? Well, at the, t at the time of autopsy, one of the findings we had were that the lining of the stomach had what we call um, Wisniewski spots. These are dark brown spots that are in the, uh, in the lining of the stomach, all right? And it, they're a little bit unusual. They're very uh, well demarcated, dark brown, almost black spots scattered over the inside of the stomach. And uh, at the time of the autopsy, uh, I, I certainly took note of it. Uh, the, these are seen on occasion. Uh, most commonly they're seen in individuals whose body temperature is very low, uh, who have hypothermia, a, hypo meaning low temperature. Um, uh, and they can also be seen in somebody who ha who's, a, who's a diabetic and goes into diabetic ketoacidosis. Those are the two, by far the two most common scenarios that we, that we see this. Uh, so I noted it at that time, uh, and that was a significant finding. Uh, the other organs, like I said, had changes you'd expect from extreme emaciation. Uh, some organs, they, the organs tend to get much smaller as well as the body. Uh, but but the, uh, the hypothermia, the, the findings in the stomach were significant, and then later I learned that there were uh, reported prolonged ice baths. And I believe that that was a th those were truly hypothermic type Wisniewski spots. And uh, in what way would those have been a contributing factor, if any, to the death of Timothy Ferguson? Well, the the spots themselves are not the contributing factor. It's an indicator that there was hypothermia. Uh, it, it supports that that finding that that was uh, that was present at the time. And in, and in this in this scenario, uh, especially in someone with uh, with this extreme emaciation, to be subjected to extreme cold temperatures, the body is not at all equipped to, to handle that. Uh, typically, the body, you know, someone can shiver and that will help raise their body temperature. We have a lot of mechanisms within our own body to try and keep us warm and eventually you have to, the, when somebody does die of hypothermia, there's typically, or if that's a major contributing factor, there's some reason why they didn't extricate themselves from the cold and go put on blankets and get warm. And uh, in, so, so in this case, though, how the hypothermia contributes is it does just continue. And the ice baths were a normal thing. They were very routine, very regular. She would have Paul put Timothy in an ice bath. On this day, like I said, they left him there for six hours. One thing I started to say and think I got sidetracked was, she told Paul the, the day that um, he was dying, put him in an ice bath because Paul couldn't wake him up. Put him in an ice bath. Put uh, like a pizza, pizza roll in the microwave or whatever, cook a pizza roll. Put it in front of him, like in front of his mouth. And if he tries to, to eat it, pull it away. Because then you would know he was faking. Horrible. And also she had said at one point around the time that he was, you know, dying, that uh, 
Paul could give him two pizza rolls. And I think if he set up or something after he, this little fake pizza roll thingy, you know, like the little taunting of it, uh, if he did whatever it was that she wanted him to do, then Paul could give him two pizza rolls and she didn't care if they were cooked or frozen or, or not, basically. Just it's horrible. weaken the body and it can also slow the heart rate and 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 uh, cause and contribute to that process of, of dying essentially um, it, it, so if I understand you correctly a normal a person with a normal body weight or even close to a normal body weight there, there's a mechanism within the body that will protect you from that uh, even if you're exposed to it and, and not able to extricate yourself from that uh, in some fashion well y you'll be You'll be able to last a lot longer. Um, obviously, if you're in an ice bath or, or you get into cold water, at some point your body can't handle it anymore. But uh, in someone with extreme emaciation, it's gonna their their capacity to overcome that would be markedly diminished. And what is the reason for that? Well, because the the body itself, uh, the mechanisms that it can use, the the use of fat as an insulation. Uh, the ability to be strong enough to, to shiver. There's other things that are going on with different uh, hormones in the body from the adrenal glands and from the thyroid gland to help warm the body as well and to increase your metabolic rate so that you're, you're generating more heat. But with all of those systems really uh, in, in very poor condition because of starvation malnourishment, uh, they're not responding adequately as well so you're going to be much more susceptible to the cold you said that uh there there's a, there's one other uh, there may be more than one other but you list i think when you talked about it you talked about um the hypothermia being a potential cause and then there also might be a disease or ketoacidosis i think is what you referred to it could be a contributing factor to create in those spots were you able to rule out other other causes as potentially contributing to why you observed those spots in timothy ferguson yes Yes, and so diabetic ketoacidosis, although typically uh, glucose levels will decline after death, even if they're normal, uh, in somebody who does die of diabetic ketoacidosis, when we test the eye fluid, we'll see um, elevated glucose levels in, in that area. It's a, a very stable fluid that we can detect that in. And we'll also find ketones, uh, which are a product that happens in the body and gets into different body fluids. Uh, and neither of those were present. We, we, this, was not, uh, this was not diabetes, uh, and this was not diabetic ketoacidosis. So Timothy Ferguson didn't have diabetes or, no. or, or any, any, any disease that would have otherwise explained those spots? No. Did he have any, any diseases or anything that you could uh, determine that would have caused his death other than the malnourishment <clears throat> and the contributing factor with the hypothermia? No, he did not. Um, as part of your analysis, does, does it involve obtaining any available medical records uh, to, to review? Yes. And did you attempt to do that for Timothy Ferguson? Yes, we did. And what was the last medical record you were able to, well, first of all, I guess let's talk about the process. How did you go about obtaining those medical records? The process is to try and, number one, find out which medical facilities he was treated at. Uh, we couldn't find any evidence of him being treated here, but we have an investigative staff and they called around, they called other family members of Timothy to find out maybe in Oklahoma where he had been treated and we did get some, some information on that. Uh, and so with that then we, as the medical examiner's office, we reached out to these agencies or organizations and healthcare uh, organizations to, to get copies of his medical records for review to see if he had a history of a significant natural disease that might have been the cause for why he was like this. And were you able then to obtain any medical records for Timothy Ferguson? Um, you said you couldn't find any in Michigan. Right. Were you able to find some records or some recent records for him? We did. I think the most recent record we had was from 2019. So about, so, and was it from, I think you indicated it was from April of 2019 when we discussed it? I, I believe it was. I have a copy of it here. Yeah. If you need to, but approximately. Okay. It, was, it was about 2019. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Okay. I'm just going to grab my report here. Sure. Um, you need to refresh your recollection by looking at I it. I would That's like fine. to do that. Go ahead. Yes, it, it was uh, April 6th of 2019.
So that was uh, over three years from the time Timothy passed away was the last medical record you were able to obtain, is that correct? Yes. And in that medical record, uh, is there anything noted in terms of any uh, diseases, any physiological problems with Timothy Ferguson that might have been a contributing factor to his death? I found nothing like that. Is there a reference in that report to his weight at the time in 2019? Yes. And what in, was that? His, in 2019, he weighed 95 pounds. And what percentile does that put him in for essentially for uh, weight for a child? He would have been 12 at that time. Right. So at that time and uh, for, for that age, he was in the 46th percentile. Um, so He's right, so small. <coughs> just right in the average. average range. Right. Correct. I guess. So I, I, I think you've testified, but just to make sure that we're the clear, doctor, not me, what so. <laughs> is, in your opinion, what was the cause of Timothy Ferguson's death? So his cause, the other finding that I, I should, I'm going to clarify because it went into the cause, was that we were able to determine that he was uh, severely dehydrated as well. Uh, and that was from the testing on the eye fluid, which gave us additional information uh, that, um, that, 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 that demonstrated that. But his, his cause of death was... Uh, dehydration and extreme emaciation due to malnutrition and starvation. Um, go ahead. No, no that's all right. Uh, yeah, there was a. I, I also contributed. There's uh, 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 there's another significant contributing condition, and that was something called exogenous hypothermia, meaning hypothermia, but it was from outside sources. You can actually have condition in your body where you don't make enough heat and that's endogenous so your body's not doing the right thing uh, but in this case it was uh, and most of our hypothermia deaths are from um, cold exposure um, and those that finding that cause of death get, does get reported and uh, is contained in the death certificate for when you make a cause of death determination that gets reported on a death certificate is that correct that's correct and you also make a determination as to the manner of death and we talked about the different categories of manner of death did you also render an opinion as to the manner of death for timothy Ferguson? yes my opinion um, based on all of the circumstances that i had available to uh to examine was was that the manner of death is best classified as homicide and could you explain the reasoning behind that uh, <coughs> Uh, this was this death was caused uh, by the actions of others to do harm or, or cause death. Um, for the record, your if I could just take a look at the exhibits that I've got up there for you. Yeah, People's Exhibit number 42. Do you recognize that document? I do. This is a copy of the autopsy report. And is that the report that you prepared for Timothy Ferguson? Yes, it is. And does it contain the findings that we've discussed here today? Yes, it does. And if you recognized, I... I, I would be bawling my eyes out right now if they were talking about my child. The only other time that she, well, the only time she has shown emotion at all was when they started reading her text messages between her son, her son Paul and her. She, when they started reading those text messages... She supposedly had a panic attack. I don't know if she did or she didn't didn't see it. They didn't really show her. They took a break, whatever. She looked kind of, she was, you know, shaking her head no and it looked kind of angry or annoyed maybe. Maybe mad's not the word. Angry's not the word. When Paul was on the stand, there's been zero tears from this woman. They're describing the horrible way that her son died. And she's just sitting there. I don't, I would, I couldn't. I mean, it annoyed me enough on day one of trial when she was sitting there chewing gum. I couldn't believe it. The judge finally saw it and called her, called him, called her out and said, you know, spit your gum out. But you work in the court, you know, you know better. You watch five minutes of Judge Judy and know better or Judge Million, whatever. You don't chew gum in court. So she already annoyed me then, but this, this face that she's shown right now, it's been that way the whole time. Just stoned, D stoned, <laughs> stone faced. Like she's just cold in my opinion. Maybe you guys see something different. I, I understand you don't necessarily <clears throat> prepare your document number 45, but could you explain what that is to the jury please? 
So uh, the document number 45 is a copy of the death certificate. This is actually a document that is, we provide information, but then it's produced by the county clerk's office. And uh, does that list the cause and manner of death on the death certificate? Yes, it does. And does it contain your, your identifying information as the uh, pathologist in the case? Yes, it does. Uh, these have been previously admitted as people's 42 and 45 judge. Okay. All right, finally, Dr. DeYoung, the, the, there's two photographs there, and out of respect for Timothy Ferguson, we are not displaying those on the monitor. Um, if you could just take a moment and review those photographs and ask if you recognize what's in those photographs. Yes, I do. And uh, what is depicted in those two photographs? I think the number is probably on the back. So um, on People's <coughs> Exhibit number 43, this is a photograph of Timothy. It's kind of uh, just from above the... the genital area up and it shows the front of his body without any clothing on the, the there's a ruler there and that's ruler has our case number in it it shows us that that was our our um, w which case this was and, and is that if I could just stop you for just a second is that one and in fact the next photograph photographs that are taken early in the autopsy process these are taking after, <coughs> after any clothing that he was wearing was removed um, so that it is early before any incisions are made, yes. And the, and the second photograph, could you just identify what we're looking at in that Yes, um, People's Exhibit number 44, we're looking at largely the right side of his torso. You can see his right arm as well. You can see his neck. But I think it, uh, both of these display the significant loss of, of body fat, and uh, you can see the ribs, and you can see the bony prominences. There's also actually a lot of uh, uh, scratches on there. In some of the areas that look discolored, it's because the, the thin the skin is so thin you can see tissues beneath it. Uh, it's very oh transparent, gosh. but there are also uh, scratches and and uh, and Not some a bruises tear. on here. Thank you, Doctor. I have no other questions. I would like to publish those photos to the jury at this time. Yes, you may. So because they're not putting them up on the monitor, he's, I think he's handing them the pictures and they're passing them around. So it takes a minute, but yeah, not a tear, see nothing. And I, it, until her son testified, I, you know, her attorney has to provide some defense, right? So I don't have a problem with that. I just have a problem with the way she was trying to kind of blame her son. But. You know, you probably take a job as a medical examiner and think you'll never, you just don't think that you're going to see these things. And hopefully you don't see them very often, but if you see them once, it's too much. I can't imagine. It's like, I get why lawyers, doctors, law enforcement, EMTs, whoever, that see this terrible stuff every day, day in, day out, have such dark senses of humor. They have to get rid of they have to get rid of it somehow. They have to, well, maybe that's not the way to put it, but they have to be able to deal with it somehow, and I think that's just how they do it. Just the people in law enforcement I've known, and see some horrible, horrible stuff. So when they tell bad jokes, I don't fault them for it. <laughs> I get it. I understand. to the point, to the extent I can get it, I understand. And there hasn't been a lot of objections from my other side in this case. A lot of sidebars. A lot of stuff we just don't hear. And I feel sorry for the jurors. I'm sure these are horrible photos to look at. Uh, 
Mr. Johnson in the cross-examination? I do, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. DeYoung. Good morning. Welcome back to Muskegon. Thank you. Uh, you and I have met. It's been a while. I'm Fred Johnson. Yes, yes we I'd like have. to ask you a few more questions, if I may. Uh, and, and I guess um, where I want to go is right to, to, the, to the heart of the matter. Uh, you've ruled this matter to be a homicide. Yes. Were you provided with any other documents other than the physical body of this of this young man uh, in, in terms of your evaluations? Yes, I was. What, what other documents were you provided? I, uh, I obtained as many documents as possible, uh, and so I, I, will, I will give the list of that. Okay, okay I like it shorter. Did you get any police reports? Yes, I did. Okay, so there was information in the police reports that you used, is correct? And, and and making yes. This, and helping to make this determination. Okay. Um, do you recall if those police reports included any information regarding uh, whether or not there were the the young man uh, refused eating, voluntarily stopped eating, or or, or stopped eating? He stopped eating. Hunger strikes. I think they call them in the police reports. There was some mention of those. Okay, but most but most of those but you saw police reports. Correct. Yes, I did. And you saw, and those did those reports have? Uh, you recall who was? Well, you recall if 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 the mother was one of the people whose information was listed in that police report, her, her comments, her, her her arguments, her information about her. There, there might there was some early information uh, about given provided by her. Yes. Okay. Anything from Paul Ferguson? Yes. Okay, and. In the, in the course of those police reports, uh, there are occasions when an, an officer who's writing up might offer an opinion, might offer an insight. Were there any of those in those police reports? I, I didn't see much in the way of opinions. It was more uh, recounting um, what, what was stated in interviews. Uh, in very you know, sort of brief sentences about about what uh, uh, what different individuals said. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, uh, <laughs> okay, let me ask you're you welcome. This. Um, you mentioned that two years ago, two, 2019, four years now, uh, that uh, Mr. Ferguson, Timothy Ferguson here, uh, was in the 46th percentile of of, of someone his age yeah. in terms of his weight. Uh, can you give us an idea what that means? Is a person with forty six percent percentile? Would, is it, Did she already explain would this? Would a person might a person at the forty six percentile rate be considered chubby or obese? Are you kidding me? No, no, not 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 if they're. I, I guess if that's their weight, uh -huh. and so kind of that piece about that would would it correlates with how tall they are. So okay. if this person but let's say in the at that time they did not get his height. Yes. Okay. But uh, but so let's say he's um, you know if, if he's ninety five pounds and and forty eight inches tall you might say oh that that is it's more of a body mass index thing which is used some on occasion body mass indexes you have to be careful with it because uh, sometimes people with a lot of muscle mass will have a very high BMI, even though it's not unhealthy. Okay. But uh, um, now I forgot your question. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I so do that all the time. Uh, okay. but, but you answered it, actually. All right. Okay. Were you ever given any photographs of, of uh, Mr. DeYoung's, I mean, Mr. DeYoung, Mr. Ferguson's siblings uh, so that you could make a, a visual comparison as to their body? body Who's Mr. Dion? <laughs> I did. I was. I had no photos of his siblings. Okay, including Paul Ferguson. You didn't get to see him. Is that I correct? did not. Okay, um, you mentioned um, that that being uh, emaciated diminishes the person's ability to fight off cold. Okay. Yes. For, for lack of a better term. Uh, and <laughs> no, it just does. They can't shiver. Might a person even under uh, difficult circumstances as, as Mr. Ferguson found himself in might be visibly shivering. Oh yeah, certainly. They, they would still shiver, but it, the capacity for shivering even 
to, uh, to generate enough heat to compensate for the significant loss of, of body fat and, and, and body weight would also, uh, it would be limited in how much your shivering can help. Okay. Sit down. You're asking horrible <laughs> questions. <laughs> what? What sure with awful situations that Mr. Ferguson found himself in that his mother <clears throat> put him in. His mother, your your client, put him in. I yeah, I would I'd sit right. down too. Mr. Roberts. Um Dr. Mr. Johnson asked you about uh, references in the blue report to a hunger strike. Um, and uh, is it possible that a person could die of starvation because they are on a hunger strike? Yes. And um, but for the reasons that the person is losing weight, is there any meaningful distinction for what the body goes through between if you're on a hunger strike or if you're denied access to food? The physiological responses would be very similar. And what are we talking about when we're talking about physiological responses, whether you're going through a hunger strike, whether you're denied access to food, whether you have something that's causing your body to, to, to not process food? What, what right. physiological responses would Timothy Ferguson be going through, no matter the cause of why he, he was weighed 69 pounds at the time of his death? Right. And, and uh, hunger strike is a broad term, too. Uh, and sometimes people refuse. Uh, uh, people and, and oftentimes it's people who are imprisoned who will go on a hunger strike uh, that uh, that they will um, they will lose weight but some will say all right I'm not eating but I will drink fluids uh, occasionally hunger strike uh, individuals on hunger strikes will take a protein shake or something but by and large if it's a true if it's a hunger strike where they're still a lot they're still drinking water uh, the, their body, obviously their body weight will, will, will decrease if you're not eating at all. The body goes through a lot of physiological changes. Your ability to, uh, is even, I mean, in, in uh, Timothy, we saw it too, in some of the organs that are active in your immune system, they, they start to shut down. Uh, the heart gets smaller. Uh, the, the liver can go through goes through metabolic changes and is no longer able to produce the energy your body needs and the liver does a lot of production. There, there's all of these changes that occur. Uh, Timothy was also though, uh, he was dehydrated, so he was he was not getting adequate water either. And that is that, that, that makes it even more complicated and uh, you're more he's even then more prone to low blood pressure. Uh, and we were able to determine that by looking at these uh, the, the, the concentrations of dis different substances, the urea, nitrogen, and creatinine in his eye fluid. You could say he was clearly very dehydrated. You could tell by looking at him, too. So, so you talked about what the body is going through in terms of what's happening with internal organs. Outwardly, what is, what is the body going through? What, what signs are, are there for a person who's having regular contact with a, with a person who's either on a hunger strike or denied access to food? Well, obviously, uh, he's losing a lot of weight. He's gaunt. Uh, you're you're going to see that. You're going to see a mark and diminish. But they'll be, they'll be weakened. Uh, that they're... Um, uh, they're, they're, they're just their whole body. They, they have a, a, a large, a, a vastly weakened state. Muscles begin are, are, are in atrophy, uh, and their ability to to uh, to do you know to, to walk long distances to do anything is is really markedly diminished. When you talk about muscles atrophy, what, explain what that is. Yeah, an atrophy just means that if your muscles, especially if they're you know they're, they're going to start wasting away as well your body will start breaking down muscle to try and gain energy, uh, which then is counteractive as well. Um, if you're having regular contact with a person who's going through this process, are those signs going to be readily apparent? Yes. Um, I want to show you what's been previous, and, and I think I have an opportunity to see at least one of these photographs this morning. I want to show you what I believe are people's 36A and B. Again, out of respect for Timothy Ferguson, these aren't up on any monitors or anything, but if you could take a look at people's 36 A and B, I think you looked at A this morning. 
And those are photos taken apparently by Paul Ferguson and sent to the defendant in this case approximately three weeks before Timothy was uh, Timothy passed away. The, the, what you're looking at in those pictures, is that consistent with a person going through what you've described here today in terms of emaciation and weight loss? It is. They are. Uh, clearly, you can see all the bony prominences. You can see his ribs. His face is gaunt. Uh, he's lost the even the you know the fat around his eyes. Uh, they appear sunken. Uh, that is consistent with what one would see. And, and the legs. So is is there yes. some evidence there in the legs? Right. The, and just you could. I mean, the legs are very very skinny because he's losing muscle. Your legs primarily you have bone, but then you have muscle and typically fat. That's all gone. But even the muscle starting to to. Uh, to leave as well. And there's a text message actually associated with that leg photo, is that right? Uh, yes. And because it's, this is a part of the record, if you could just read that text message. You can... It says, uh, also, it's no wonder he's hardly capable of standing. So would that yeah, tend they to he was, support they what said he was faking. Today, that there are some outward, obvious physical signs that Timothy Ferguson was going through, at least on June 13th, which was three weeks before he died? Yes, he'd be, he'd be very weak. Yeah, they said it's shaking and stumbling, not being able to stand, that he was faking all of that. Now, Mr. Johnson asked you about uh, those records from 2019. Um, and I think you said that height wasn't taken in 2019, so it's difficult to make an analysis of whether or not Timothy was chubby or anything of that nature in 2019. Is that, is that correct? That's correct. So without, in other words, you could be average weight, but if you're you know, on the way low side of the height scale, it's, it's more likely that you're going to appear heavier. If you're very tall, it's more likely that you're going to appear skinny, correct? Right. So you can't make a determination because you don't have a weight, uh, or you don't have a height determination from 2019, correct? I do not. Okay. Um, and if you need time to review this record, that's fine. But did you also obtain some records from 2017 for Mr. Ferguson? Yes. And, um, and again, if you need some, some time to review those, please please go ahead. But did you was there a specific cause that caused Timothy to be examined medically in 2017? This would have been now five years before he passed away. Yeah, in 2017, I recall he was brought in because he was, uh, and this was again in, in uh, I believe, Oklahoma, uh, for inappropriate weight gain was... Uh, the reason he was brought in at that time. So in 2017, he was brought in because he was gaining too much weight? Yes. Uh, finally, Doctor, um, Mr. Johnson asked you about the, the body going through the process of shivering as, as it goes through hypothermia and experiences those things. With the extreme weight loss and emaciation and dehydration that Timothy Ferguson had gone to, it, is it possible to even lose the ability to shiver? It is possible. Uh, I, I think that at, at some point you're going to lose that ability to shiver. You're not going to have enough energy to shiver. But you, you still might. That might be something. It's just almost a primal thing that your body does. But when we, th when we think about shivering, we all think about you know, being out at a cold football game or being outside and we're kind of doing this and, and shaking you know, for, for extended periods of time. Uh, would that be happening with Timothy towards the end with his weight loss? Well, it, it could be, but it's also possible, it, it, it certainly could. He could be shivering, but it's also possible that he doesn't have the capacity any longer. So if he's not shivering, it's probably more, uh, uh, it, it's probably more alarming than if he were. Thank you. Thank you, John. After this, always one question we just, we just can't get away from. So this is it, the 46% battle thing. How, how do, how Why is he hammering this? Where a person is in terms of their percentile? Yeah, right. So, um, uh, and, and there were some other heights and weights from previous events as well. But they, they take, if they have a, 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 a child, right. typically the, the growth, growth charts are used for children. Right. They will measure their height and that, that gets plotted on there. Like uh -huh. for this specific age, uh, they weigh this much. And then there's one for the height as well. Okay. So even though you didn't have the height, whoever would have given you that information that it was 46%, if he followed or she followed the procedure, 
they would have had the height and they would have the weight, and that's how they came to the 46 percent. Is that correct? The 46 percentile is purely for his weight. Okay. Okay. He's in the 46 percentile for his weight. Okay. Uh, and so that's why uh, at the time of his death, he was in the 60th percentile for his height. So he's okay. above average for his for his height, uh, but he was less than one Zero percentile for his for weight. His weight. Oh. So you, th th there's two okay. different factors there. So at the time he passed, he was above average for his height. Yes. And at the time, 2019, we didn't know what his height was. We just know he was Who right cares? around that 50 percent mark for his weight. For his weight. Thank you. What was the point? I think I can do it one question. <laughs> it sounds like what you're saying is that the determination of the weight percentile and the height percentile are conducted independently of each other. They are. So in other words, you look at every you look at every child with a weight, whatever that weight is, that's where the child falls regardless of the height and vice versa. Correct. Thank you. Any follow up to that, Mr. Charles? All right, uh, Mr. Weaver. Oh, and by the way, we didn't have. Grab the jury oh, I forgot. The jury <laughs> forgot to tell you. Jury gets to ask questions in this <clears throat> trial. All right, Mr. Roberts. So, I, I don't know. I heard her, her talking about this. So, my mom passed away four years ago at the end of January. She passed away January 30th, 2020, fortunately, before the world went nuts. Uh, of from Alzheimer's watching her deteriorate in the end was horrible we were doing everything that we could except we weren't doing a feeding tube or going to anything like that but uh, all right doctor uh, we have one question this is how long we were giving her while when while she would take them because she thought they were ice cream and she had a sweet tooth like no other they were called magic cups and they were protein and they were just a lot of protein. So we would give her those just to try to give her some protein. But, it, and, you know, she just got to the point where she didn't eat anymore. And she probably weighed, I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing 90 pounds when she passed away. Uh, she was 5 foot 3 or 4 probably five, three, but watching her waste away like that was horrible because we, you, you could see it how and, but we knew what was happening. We knew the cause, but watching your own child waste away by your hand is a whole different level of, I don't even know what to, to describe that. I cannot imagine because now, for me, you have to look at it from his point of view. We're looking at it because we were looking at it from our point of view when it was my mom because it was horrible and we didn't want that for her. And I don't, we don't know because she had Alzheimer's. She didn't communicate anymore. Who, I don't, you know, sometimes I wonder, are they locked in their head kind of like a stroke victim? Or do they just really not know? But she couldn't communicate. We were trying to get her to understand, you know, you need to eat. He understood he needed to eat, and she understood he needed to eat, and she understood she wasn't giving him anything. I, so I don't know how she does it because I, I know what it did to me to watch somebody. And we were trying. She wasn't at all. And he was able to eat. He was able to sustain, like, be able to be a functioning person. And she took that. All right. Let me. Back up five seconds so we can see what this question from the jury is. All right, doctor. Uh, we have one question. This is how long does it take to go from 46% uh, to 0%? Yikes. Good. Yeah. Great. Good question. Um, I would say that that is likely um, uh, if if there's no food whatsoever, uh, it, it, not some sprinkled in there, it's still going to take uh, many, many weeks and likely some months to get to that point. 
But uh, she's shaking her head no. You know that, that and, and that is they've done some studies on weight loss percentage in prisoners who have gone on hunger strikes and they lose about uh, I, I think it was like 18% uh, of their weight per a certain amount per you know per per uh, month or uh, along those lines. And I better not quote that exactly, but but it, it was a prolonged period of time, okay. Uh, and but yet, if there's food interspersed in there, that's going to change that somewhat. Any thoughts that? Yeah, it, 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 so you're saying with, with complete denial of food, in other words, no nutrition whatsoever, you're talking about a matter of at least weeks, if not months. Correct. And if food is interspersed in there, I'm guessing it doesn't shorten that time period; it extends it. Yes. No question, Chair. Uh, Dr. Young, I, I do have one question. Does that change uh, with water? Does that make a difference? So you're, you're saying absolutely no food whatsoever would take weeks or months? Well, right. So they're, they're drinking water, yes, in those okay. scenarios where there was no food ingested, but they still were taking water. If you're not drinking water at all, you die much quicker. That's days. Any follow-up to that question? No. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. DeYoung. Uh, you can stand down. May this witness be excused, Mr. Uh, Roberts. Yes. And Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. Have a good day. I cannot believe she was shaking her head no, like the doctor doesn't know, because uh, she's still hanging her head on the fact that he was on a hunger strike for two weeks. Uh, I have no additional witnesses at this time. I would, uh, I, I believe that they have all been admitted by stipulation, but I would move for the admission of people's one through. I believe it's 45. Yes, 1 through 45. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming there's no objection, Mr. Johnson. We've stipulated, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. That could be for us. All right. Uh, I think it's a good time to take, it's a little early for a morning break, but given the transition from the defense side, I think we'll go ahead and take a 15 minute break. Uh, come back here at 1015, please. Yeah, she's, she, they're going to really try to hang their hat on this. He was on hunger strike for two weeks and went from, I guess, being a normal average weight teenager. But we don't know because somebody didn't take him to the doctor ever for three years, two and a half, whatever it was. He died in July 2022. So there's nothing after 2019, April 2019. So he didn't go to the doctor all that time. Uh, so we don't know. We don't know what his weight was because she didn't take him. And, but yeah, this two week hunger strike thing, he needs to maybe get rid of that one. I know that's what they're hanging their hat on. While the court has received information as to the the, the uh, address of, of this home, uh, we don't think it's ever been established at this time. Hang on. Yeah, so sorry. While the uh, basis is, uh, and he's going for a direct uh, verdict. On, on two bases. Uh, the, the first basis is, uh, and my notes indicate, and, and uh, talk to my staff here, that the proper jurisdiction has not been set in this matter. While the court has received information as to the the, the uh, address of, of this home, uh, we don't think it's ever been established that this, this particular home is in Muskegon County or within the jurisdiction of this court. Uh, we recognize that folks going to shore responded, but there was still, I don't think, any testimony from any witness saying this was within the court's jurisdiction, uh, according to our notes. So we move that it be uh, dismissed on that basis. Secondly, we were moving that it be dismissed on the basis that a reasonable person could not find guilt in this matter, <laughs> uh, that the testimony is virtually unanimous, that uh, my client uh, disagree. Uh, uh, does not perform any of the, the conduct which which would lead a reasonable person to believe that she's the one responsible for this. Uh, all these actions uh, even taken to the prosecutor's uh, uh, Best by the prosecutors were performed by Paul Ferguson and not my client. Uh, that uh, my client, uh, quite frankly, and, and the testimony indicates that she held Paul back from doing some other things that he wanted to do, uh, and therefore she is not the one responsible for for this uh, this homicide. Uh, furthermore, the, that's rich. the there's indication that there's food in the home. 
There's indication yeah, that she kept it was locked the home, away. That she's responsible for that. There's further indication by the fact that uh, uh, the, those individuals under her care, uh, which would be Paul and the, the younger son, G, were uh, of healthy mind and body. Uh, given all those factors, Judge, we don't just say person find no. guilt in this matter. We'd ask that there be a directed verdict to that effect. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Roberts. Thank you. First, as it relates to the jurisdictional issue, Your Honor, I, I asked. Pulling some Daryl Brooks. There were three different witnesses at the 4788 Marshall was in the city of North Shores County, Muskegon State, Michigan, to my recollection. Um, Officer Stefanich, I believe Officer Pisky, and certainly Lieutenant uh, Hooksom uh, all testified to the effect that your, that location was in the city of Norton Shores County, Muskegon State, of Michigan. So I, I think that, that argument is without merit. As it relates to the uh, other portion of the argument I here, I understand this is a motion that Mr. Johnson does need to make, but I think there is ample evidence here from which a reasonable juror could conclude that Ms. Van der Ark had at least one of the states of mind requisite for a murder charge here, uh, whether or not she had the intention to kill. Uh, on a personal level, I hope she didn't have the intention to kill. I, if you were going to kill somebody, I, I, I would hope you would do it a lot faster and a lot less torturous than the way that this was done. Um, but she certainly did have a requisite state of mind to form the intent necessary to do either great bodily harm or to create a situation uh, where great bodily harm was the natural result of, of her actions here. As to whether or not she actually physically did any of the things that were alleged to have happened here, uh, Paul's testimony alone, as well as the text messages, established that she was not just the person who directed that these things to be done, and, and you don't get to use as a defense, well, I just said to do these things and somebody else did them. Uh, that alone is a basis for to find that she is complicit in this charge, uh, but also that she actively participated in a number of these things. Paul repeatedly testified that if he didn't administer the punishments, that she would administer those punishments, uh, that it was essentially an effort between both of them at the times when she was at work and he would not be at work. If she was at work, he was at home, he was responsible. If he was at work and she was at home, then she was responsible for doing these things. There's also been testimony from Paul that, that Timothy was in the ice bath after uh, the, the, the ice bath right before he died, uh, and that Shonda is the one that was actually administering the ice bath at that point, and the text message about dragging him back into the small room uh, sent to Paul, that was one of the last text messages that we have on July 5th, the day before, the morning, essentially the night before Timothy uh, passes away and is discovered the next morning. Uh, so again, I understand that the motion needs to be made to preserve certain appellate issues here, but I would indicate to the court that there is ample evidence for this court to that Ms. Van der Ark had one of the requisite states of mind to commit a murder in this charge, as well as evidence that she did engage in the infliction of emotional or mental or physical harm, serious physical or serious emotional harm on a child, which is the basis of the child abuse first degree. Right, thank you, Mr. Roberts. Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Roberts has indicated that his recollection is that the at least three witnesses uh, established jurisdiction for the court in terms of, of where this happened. Your response to that? Your Honor, it, as the court is aware, a lot of things are going on while we're we're, we're doing the, these matters. But I I I can my my staff here, and we don't recollect <clears throat> that those that phrase was used. We, we recollect that the address was used. However, we don't recollect that it was noted there was in Norfolk Shores or that it was in the county of Muskegon. That's the phrase I think that offers the court this jurisdiction in this matter, and that's it doesn't reflect that in our notes. So, and, it, and quite frankly, it's one of the things we check off as, as we do a trial like this. So, uh, from our recollection, uh, we don't see it, and we leave the court to its recollection. Okay. Um, well, first and foremost, <laughs> as to the okay. jurisdiction of the court, uh, I don't know if it was used in the exact terminology that Mr. Roberts indicated, but my recollection independently is that jurisdiction had been established through one or more of the witnesses. Um, now, Mr. Johnson, if you if if you prefer the court to review the record, I'm happy to do that. Uh, my independent recollection is that jurisdiction was established yeah, yeah, yeah. through one or more of the witnesses. But don't I'll, forget, I'll she's you smart. To, uh, what you like the court to do? Judge, you were satisfied with the court's recollection. Okay, thank you. She uh, wasn't. So the court is going to deny the directed verdict as on, on that basis. Or she didn't the appear to be. Verdict. Maybe she was uh, saying yes. As both parties know, uh, pursuant to case law, a directed verdict of acquittal is appropriate only if considering all of the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution. No rational trier of fact could find that the essential elements of the crime charge were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, it's a site taken right from People versus Mihal, which is 454 Mish 1, uh, 1997 case. That case, as well as uh, those cases before it, indicate that uh, the court is not permitted 
to make any sort of credibility determination uh, in deciding a motion for a directed verdict. Uh, so although Mr. Johnson did um, somewhat attack Mr. Ferguson's credibility, the court cannot make a judgment call in regards to credibility. Uh, based on the evidence that the courts heard so far, it seemed pretty credible. Uh, the courts cannot find that uh, that no rational trier of fact. That's really what it comes down to: is essentially can any person, any rational trier of fact, and there has been enough evidence, at least presented by the prosecution, taking that evidence in light most favorable to the prosecution, uh, that a rational trier of fact could find. In this case, the essential elements of the crimes charged, specifically uh, open murder, which could be first degree felony murder as well as second degree murder as well as child abuse in the first degree, uh, were proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So based on that finding, the court is going to deny the motion for a directed verdict. Surprise. Uh, anything else on that, Mr. Roberts? No, no, no. Mr. Johnson? No, sir. All right, now Mr. Johnson, my understanding is your client intends to testify, is that correct? That is our intention, Your Honor, yes. All right, and I'm, I'm assuming, and I know you very well, and, and uh, you've, you've spoken to her about this decision, is that correct? Yes, sir. And, yes. and how many times would you say you've spoken to her about this? Uh, virtually, well, we, we've discussed it for months, and okay. we came to the conclusion at least a month ago, uh, and we've had, I think, three conversations. Uh, and in the jail to this okay. effect, and then again during the course of this trial. All right, Ms. Vander Ark, uh, do you understand that you have a Fifth Amendment right not to testify? Yes, sir. Uh, a, the jury would be instructed that if you did not testify, that they could not use that against you. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Uh, have you had an ample opportunity to talk to your attorney, Mr. F uh, Johnson, about that decision? Yes, sir. And you feel you have enough information to make an informed, intelligent decision? Yes, sir. And um, are you choosing to testify? Yes, sir, I am. All right. Any questions, uh, the court, uh, you wish to inquire about the defendant, Mr. Roberts? No, thank you. Mr. Johnson? No, sir, thank you. All right. Put her up. I'm ready. Anything before we bring the jury out, Mr. Roberts? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Johnson and I just discussed briefly, um, as I had indicated to the court, uh, that before even the jury selection process, we discussed the two videos, which were sort of a late discovery, and discussed uh, under which circumstances I would use those. And I indicated at that time that the court adopted the, the, the finding here that the second video, which I'll refer to essentially as the 911 video, um, would be something that I would be seeking to use, uh, certainly if Ms. Maynard chose to testify, and it now does appear that she would do so, whether or not it's played during her testimony or played as part of my rebuttal case, that I would certainly do that. So I anticipate being able to do that. Um, and the other, the, the second video, the one that we, we also discussed that I had indicated my, my, my choice is I do not want to show that video to the jury, um, regardless of any discovery issues that may exist in the case. However, because Ms. Vander Ark is going to testify, I do think it's, it's necessary for me to ask questions about that, and part of that might involve showing maybe just her the video. I would not show it for, for the whole jury, but, if, if, but I think I would have a right to ask her questions because it is the last time that she had contact with Timothy before he died. And I think I have an opportunity to ask her under the circumstances, but also because it goes directly to refute statements that she made to the police about how she discovered Timothy and what she had done with him the night before. Um, my intention would be to not play that video again for the jury, but if Ms. Rainer Ark is unable to answer the questions because she doesn't recall or makes a, an, an inconsistent statement, I certainly do envision a scenario where, where that is played, if not, if at least for her, and then if not for the jury, if, if we get to that point. If that happens, Mr. Johnson and I have discussed, there's some younger members in the audience today, I would, <laughs> that person should be out of the courtroom if, if, if that happens. It's, it's there's a disturbing. one uh, younger person. That's not my call to make, but Mr. Johnson and I have discussed that as a right, well, I, And I just want to understand, so you're, you, you would intend to use it potentially to refresh your recollection? Potentially, or, or or a prior inconsistent statement, perhaps. I can I can envision a number of different scenarios. It starts with me asking for the question. I, I understand that. I understand that that in order to to challenge a person's recollection or to refute a, with a prior inconsistent statement, you have to confront them with what has taken place first. And I fully intend to explore that as a line of questioning and cross-examination with Ms. Van Dyer. 
um, as it relates to whether or not I need to actually play the video, a lot of it just depends on what the saying. response is. Exactly. Yeah. Just depends on if she lies or not. Play it as a, it, it, if, if she gets up and acknowledges that she did and said the horrible things that she does, then I don't think there's a need, there certainly isn't a need to play that for the jury, <laughs> and the court was, would not allow that because she's adopting essentially that she did make those statements and take those actions, and it would not be appropriate to play that for the jury because it would be done only to essentially to, to inflame the jury, and, and the evidence would have already come in. But, I, but it's grounds for cross-examination. Uh, and, and again, whether or not even she sees that video depends on what her response is to the question. Mr. Jones? Your Honor, thank you. She and, shouldn't and testify, for, in my opinion. For purposes of this conversation and for, for a possible appellate record, I'm going to refer to the two videos. There's one while uh, 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 Timothy is still alive, and there's one after he's deceased. It's the one while he's still alive that we've agreed that we would enter into evidence. Um, uh, there, there is no agreement uh, in terms of limiting uh, uh, Mr. Roberts in terms of his ability to, as he described it, uh, to cross uh, unless there's a specific court rule. So we're not objecting to that. In theory, uh, we'll see what the circumstances are, what questions are being asked, and then determine at that point uh, if we want to object to issues even for that purpose. As for the, purpose, the, the post-death uh, video, that video is the one that we've agreed uh, can be admitted if, if he chose, chooses to do so. I would still have concerns about that video being played in open court. Uh, there, there, there are ways we can get around that, but, but certainly uh, ne neither of these videos I think are appropriate for, for people who don't know they're coming and who haven't agreed to, to, to watch this stuff. This is just difficult for both of them to watch. So what, I'm, what I'm saying is I'm, I'm trying to agree with, with most of what Mr. Roberts said. Uh, We'll, and I think we may be, while we're appropriate in talking about it now, I think that the, 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 the final determination probably would be governed by the facts on the ground at the time he attempts to, to, to use them. So uh, I, we want the court to be aware of those issues, uh, but I, I would ask at this point to withhold any rulings until such time as, as the materials are, are presented for evidence. Okay. Uh, and maybe I was mistaken. It was my understanding that the first uh, pre death video was never going to be admitted, Mr. Roberts, is that? And, and that's, that is still my intention, Judge, okay. but I, I guess the, the, so there's always an out with the lawyer, right? I guess the only, the, the, the only caveat to that is I don't know what Ms. Van der Ark is going to testify to when I ask her the questions about that. Um, and I don't, I don't think the fact that, that we've made that agreement or that there might be some discovery issues there gives her carte blanche to get on the stand and lie about what took place. Um, so my, my hope would be that she would just answer the questions truthfully and honestly about what, what is on that video, and then it, I, then it doesn't even need to be shown to her. If she needs her recollection reflect, re re refreshed about what took place, or if she makes a prior inconsistent statement about that, I think I still have an ability to confront her with that prior inconsistent statement, and I think I can do that without even playing that for the jury as well to see if that changes her testimony. But if she absolutely refuses to acknowledge that what we all see on that video is what actually took place, I think that is that is a that is a scenario here where she doesn't get just get up there and say that that this didn't happen. Um, so so that that's what my concern is. And I think that's what Mr. Johnson is alluding to when he's indicating that we really need to have to have a determination of the facts and circumstances at the time. And I'm happy to take a break at that point when we get to that point to, to have the jury excused and we can really drill down a little bit more on that particular issue. But I don't want to play that video for the jury. I do not want to play that video for the jury. It must and be Mr. pretty Johnson's bad. Correct about the other video, we did discuss that, and I think there, there's certainly some evidentiary value in playing that, or, or at least asking Ms. Van der Ark questions about that. And it is likely that at the conclusion of that, I may recall one of the officers to just admit that video because there is some independent evidentiary value as it relates to that because it goes directly to statements that she made to the police at the time about the discovery of Timothy and how things happened. So, so that one I don't think we have much of a disagreement about. And, and again, the, the concerns about folks in the audience seeing or hearing some of those videos I think can be addressed when we get to that point. Uh, so I guess that's my position. The first video, I don't want to play it for the jury, but I can see one narrow path here, and that all depends on Ms. Van der Ark, that that becomes something that the jury actually has to see. If that happened, I would not play it for the gallery. Mr. Johnson, I just want to be on So what Mr. Roberts was saying is that he, he envisions a at least a, a, some sort of instance where the pre-death video could be played. 
And my understanding of what you're saying is that you're acknowledging that possibility. Is that correct? No, sir, it's not. My, my recollection is what the course recollection is that that video is not going to be played regardless and aimed at other circumstances. Given, and given what he's already said, it's just too prejudicial. And given the fact that it was given late. So it just my has recollection to be awful. is that we wouldn't pay that for uh, as an evidentiary piece under any circumstances. The, the part where I'm agreeing with Mr. Roberts is, is, is if my client needs to recollections reflect refreshed or there's another legal basis to for her to see it uh, that's not part of any agreement that part uh, it, as long as there's an evidentiary requirement or, or rule or, or that, that allows him to do that then, then that's still on the table we didn't have any, we didn't have any discussions of that issue and certainly he's not bound by something he didn't agree to but I do believe the parties did agree that that that, that the, the first video the pre-death video would not be used as the evidentiary piece that presented to the jury under any circumstances, and that's I, that's our position at this point. Okay, Mr. Roberts. Your Honor, I, I will I'll accept whatever ruling the court wants to make here, obviously, and, and, and do that with with respect here. But again, this all depends on Ms. Van Dorn. Well, hold on, Mr. Roberts. Listen, yeah. my my recollection of our discussion yes. was simply this. There was two videos turned over very late by the city of Norton Shores Police Department. That was not the prosecutors, did not have it in their position or their possession. And as a result, those are not turned over until, I believe, last Friday, correct? Yes, well, call me on Thursday and we okay. saw them on Friday. So the pre-death video was one of those videos. There was a discussion about potentially adjourning this trial. And the, the people's position at that time was, if the court is simply going to adjourn it based on the possible admission of that video, then we would rather agree to simply keep it out. That way this trial could proceed this week. That was my recollection. Sure. I'd say that's accurate, yes. Okay. So I, I people, I'm, listen, these are agreements that we make. Um, but Mr. Johnson is saying essentially, if I now allow that in, that creates a real issue for him, I would think, Mr. Johnson, that uh, well, wait a minute, if this would have gotten in or under any circumstances whatsoever, then I, he would have asked for an adjournment. Am I correct by that, Mr. Johnson? You're correct, Your Honor. So, based on us moving forward, I want to make sure, I understand you're saying, well, I'm, I'm putting it on you, Judge, but I'm going to hold people to their agreements. And my understanding was that the, that was the agreement of the two attorneys. Is that, that correct? That, that is what we agreed to, Judge. And again, I, I, I guess maybe I, maybe... Maybe there could have been a little bit better clarity. I will accept that as the court's ruling because, again, it's my preference to not play this video. Uh, and, and, and I am perfectly willing to accept at this point that I have the opportunity to, at a minimum, ask Ms. Van Dart questions about it. And then if she's, if she's unable to recall those events or if, she, or, or if she provides an inconsistent statement, that I can certainly confront her with those without presenting that, that to the jury. No. That's acceptable. I think you're not objecting to that, Mr. Johnson. You're saying, listen, if it's being used as a non evidentiary tool to refresh recollection or something like that, you don't have an objection to that, but in terms of evidence being admitted to the trier of fact, which is the jury, you have an objection to that. That's correct. Okay, so I'm going to make a ruling right now. It's not going to be shown as an evidentiary piece that's based on the agreement uh, between the parties, um, part of the agreement to not adjourn this trial. Uh, it can be used for other purposes, certainly, but it cannot be admitted to the jury uh, as a piece of evidence. But obviously, the post-death video, as we discussed, uh, was essentially fair game. I think, Mr. Johnson, you'd agree with that, correct? Yes, sir. That okay. Was and Mr. Roberts, you'd agree with that, too, yes, correct? Yes, Okay. All right. All right. Good enough. Uh, any other issues, Mr. Roberts? No. Mr. Johnson? No, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's bring the jury in. Please rise. So given that we've heard over and over and over again. For, for the young man in the courtroom. Oh, hang on. Uh, he was how, how smart she is. I wonder, it's just my own wondering, if she uh, thinks that she's just going to outsmart everybody here. We've heard, you know, second in her law class, not taking it away from her. I would applaud her if she wasn't sitting over there after doing supposedly horrible things that I think she probably did. But I think she thinks she's smarter than everybody else in the room. So she's going to, she can outsmart the jury. And I really wonder, because really, 
I would not have said, yeah, you need to get up and testify. <laughs> no way. No way. But I'm not a lawyer. I give no law advice. I've never been to law school. I say that all the time so nobody gets confused. Because I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> but I bet that prosecutor is just raring to go. Like, put her up there. You don't get to ask any questions. Mr. Johnson, she's all mine. I want her. And I'll say this. I do not. I do not say good things about prosecutors a lot. I think he's done okay. Now, this is the only trial I've ever seen him in. Maybe he pulls shenanigans and others. But I don't feel like he has this time. So, there you go. Now, let's see about this young man. I wonder if it's her son. I wonder if it's, we learned his name uh, because Paul accidentally said it. And I had somebody else accidentally said it too, but I'm just going to call him G. I wonder if it's G. And he is pretty young, probably nine or 10 years old, maybe. 10, maybe at the most. So, I, if whoever brought him, no. If he's not a witness, get him out. Like, he shouldn't be here. For, for the young man in the courtroom, uh, he was asked to leave, and I don't know why he's back in here, ma'am. Well, if I clarify, this was an admirable time, so that could be on my mind. Okay. Well, this is this is going to be very sensitive information, and um, I don't think it's appropriate for, quite frankly, anyone. But uh, we are adults in here. I don't believe this person is older than age eighteen, and I'm not going to allow uh, a young man to be exposed to this. So, ma'am, I'm going to ask that you, if he's old enough to be left in the hall alone, you certainly can, you certainly can stay. Uh, if he's not, then I'd have to ask you to step out. You understand? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. He's going to leave him sitting out there for hours. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how old he is. I don't know who it is. But, <laughs> you know, she's going to be up here a long time. Maybe you go home. Catch up on the news later. Because this is, a, I have another thing I've got to tell you. This is a local station out of Michigan. It's not law and crime. It's not court TV. I have no control. And the other day, they just, it's like five o'clock. Cameraman's like, I'm out. And it just cut off. And it's nowhere. There is no, <laughs> when they're done, they're done. I have zero control over it. So just be aware. This is split up into two parts. I have the other part. So, uh, We'll watch the other part when this one's done. But I know, because I was trying to see how long this trial was supposed to go, when it got to just about the very end, it's just done again. And they did that to us on day one. Are you so, seated? Five o'clock uh, there must be the cutoff time. Uh, the fence called, uh, All right, Ms. Vanderock, if you can come around here, please. <coughs> Here, raise your right hand, please. In this manner now pending, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you God? I do, yes. All right, you can put your hand down, grab a seat. Please state your name for the record, spelling your first name and last name. Uh, Shonda, S H A N D A, Vander Ark, V A N D E R, space capital A R K. Uh, thank you, Ms. Vander Ark. Uh, uh, you're being called to testify in your own cases. You understand that? Yes, sir. And, and to do that, you have to make sure that everyone can understand you, correct? Yes, sir. With you uh, and knowing you as I do, I don't think volume's going to be a problem with you? Probably not, sir. Talking fast, maybe? Yes, sir, it might. Okay, so this is, uh, are you nervous? Yes, sir. This is stressful? Yes, sir, very. So you're going to be, questions are going to be thrown at you uh, fast and furious. You, you've seen how trials work, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And <clears throat> under those circumstances, you may speed up again as I do. Yes, sir. Okay. You, you may be reminded from time to time to slow down just a little bit. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Let's make sure everyone understands you. You've been sitting through this this, this trial for the, since the beginning, correct? Yes, sir. And you were arrested for these offenses alleged back when? July 7th of 2022. Okay. So you've been living with this thing for more than 
what, 18 months? 17 months, yes, 17 sir. 17 months. So you know what we're talking about, correct? Yes, sir. And you understand the allegations against you? Yes, sir. And, and that it also helps that, that you have a legal background, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, uh, the things they said about how well you did in school and, and all those things, were all those all true? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I, I, I want you sitting there and be yelling this, but, but the things about cum laude ain't going to law school, all that stuff is true. It was magna cum laude, yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> let's start. Let's go back to the very beginning. Does that uh, help? Yeah. When you... It, Okay. <clears throat> when did Timothy come to your care? Uh, May of 2021. Prior to that, who had physical and legal custody of Timothy? My ex-husband. Okay. So just and over a year he was with her. And how, how did it happen that you ended up with custody then? My ex reached out to me um, stating that Timothy was, he could no longer handle him that he was pushing his buttons and that he needed to send him to live with me. Okay. And you agreed to that? Yes, sir. Okay. Had you ever lived with Timothy uh, for during his, his... When he was younger, yes, sir. Okay. All right. So uh, you, you agreed to accept him into your home? Yes, sir. And who was living in your home at the time? Myself, my husband, Adam, Paul Ferguson, and then my little man. G. G. Okay, that's what we've been calling G, correct? It's really hard to do, yes, sir. Okay, do the, just do the best you can. Uh, okay, so they're all living in your home, and then Timothy joins you, correct? Yes, sir. When Timothy's joining you, did your <clears throat> ex-husband ever make any, ex any effort to transfer legal custody to you? Um, we discussed it, but he never did actually sign anything, no, sir. Okay, and without legal custody... How do you get Timothy into school? You can't. And without legal custody, how do you get medical treatment for Timothy? You can't. Did your husband at least send his, I assume he had medical insurance for Timothy, did he, he send that? He did not send me. I requested his medical uh, card, his insurance card, and he never sent it to me. Now, you heard the testimony uh, that Timoth Timothy saw the doctor in 19... 2019. Did you hear that? Yes, I did. That was a year before you received him? Two years before I received him. <clears throat> two years before. So in the prior two years before you received him, as far as you know, based on what you heard here, your ex-husband never took him to the doctor? As far as I know, yes, sir. How do you know if he had medical insurance for this young man? He told me he did. Okay. But he never sent it to you? No, sir. Okay. Um, what was your I'm sorry, Miss Attorney, our law background. Get an attorney. Start the process. Of if he's going to be with you, get whatever you need done, done. So you can do the things that you need to do. That doesn't fly very well. You're so smart, and you did nothing? Sorry, no pass on that one. Oh, and also, at least he went in 2017 and 2019. How many times did you take him? Oh, zero. When he was wasting away, you threatened to take him to the emergency room, and he didn't. So, no. No pass. Not from this person. Not from this mom. No deal. No dice, no nothing. She's going to make me angry, I can already tell. And I will do my best to try not to. I'll just sit here the best I can. Can't promise you anything. Or what was your financial situation once Timothy arrived and your husband had a stroke? After the stroke, we yeah. lost my husband's income. Um, and it was... <clears throat> paycheck to pay, not even paycheck to paycheck, almost everything was paid late. Um, I was struggling. I, I asked Paul for help with groceries sometimes because we were struggling. Okay. And Paul was working full-time? He was working part-time. He was working at, at Applebee's? At yes, the, sir. Okay. So he was working part-time. And so what, were you receiving any child support? No. So the entire financial burden was on you? Correct. Could you have, could you have, uh, uh, a 
afford it, um, daycare for any of your children? Absolutely not, no. And could you have uh, uh, afforded any extra expenses other than the ones that you were providing for? No. What type of expenses were you able to provide for this family? Just basic living expenses. Rent? Yes, sir. Uh, utilities? Yes, sir. Um, uh, food? Yes, sir. Okay, that leads to the next question I have for you. You, you have monitors and, and cameras in your home, is that correct? Yes, sir. And the impression from the, from the testimony I heard is that it was for the purpose, the sole purpose of ensuring that Timothy could not get the food. Was that, is that accurate? No. Why did you have all those monitors and cameras in your home? When Timothy came to live with us, his stepmother informed me that um, they had motion sensors. Um, they weren't as tech savvy as I was. I worked in tech, before law school, I worked in tech support for several years. Um, but they had motion sensors because, she, and she told me that she didn't sleep at night. She only slept when he was at school because he was into everything. And so, because my, my younger child, he used to, when he was about two, he would take all his clothes off. So we started putting a camera in his room. And then once we moved to the Marshall Road uh, location, it was bi-level. My husband was born with a disability. Um, my husband was wheelchair bound. So he would, we had an extra wheelchair that we kept on the upper level. That's where the master bedroom was. Um, but that way, if, the, if little man, if G was down in his bedroom, my husband could talk to him through the camera and have him come up. It was much easier. My husband could crawl down the steps before the stroke, but he didn't, we didn't want him to have to crawl up and down those steps. Okay. Would you rent a different uh, house? <laughs> and, and again, let's go back to the issue of food. Was food the only reason why you felt you had to monitor Timothy, or were there other issues? There were plenty of issues, sir. So, well, well first of all, the, what we've heard some testimony as to uh, Timothy's special needs. What were his special needs? He was on the autism spectrum, but he was completely verbal, and he was grade level in school. He was not behind the school at all. Um, he was diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. He was diagnosed as bipolar and sensory processing disorder. Um, I heard Paul mention physical disability. He didn't have any. Now, Timothy, when he first got there, said he had a physical disability, and I asked his, his stepmom about it to make sure, and she said, no, he's, he was not coordinated at all. Um, the first summer that he lived with us, my youngest was playing baseball, and Timothy actually mentioned, because we had planned to put him in public high school, I'm going to try out for the baseball team, and I didn't say anything to him, but I remember thinking, sorry, sweetie, there's no way. You don't have the coordination for that. All right. Uh, and he, he liked uh, to take, well, you tell me, did, did he like to take things apart? Oh, yes, absolutely. Can you He's, give some examples? Um, he took batteries apart. He took toys apart. My, my youngest son's toys. Um, he, if he could get a hold of anything from Paul's room, he would take like, mostly it was Legos. Paul still had Legos. Um, he, at one point, um, messed with our water heater. What do you mean? Uh, he actually turned the gas off to the water heater. Um, he, he knocked out the pilot light and then turned the gas off as well at different points. Okay. Were you, did you have any concerns as to whether or not this, his, his predilections, his, his desire to get into things, might be a safety hazard for either him or somebody else in the home? Extremely. I was extremely concerned about that, yes, sir. So it, is, it was your desire to, it was it just your desire to monitor Timothy, or did you, did you also have a younger child in the home that you wanted to monitor? Oh, uh, we had both. Okay. Was it, well, who's, who did you want to monitor? One or the other or both? Both. Okay. All right. So you set up these, these video and audio cameras, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, and alarms on the doors? On Those didn't get installed until about three weeks before he passed away. Okay. And uh, motion sensors? Yes, sir. Okay. He got around the motion sensors multiple times. Were you, able to, were you able to stay home and personally monitor your children? No, I had to work full time. Okay. Uh, how were you, were you able to get, specifically, were you able to get Timothy into school? No, we were not. We tried to, to enroll him in Mona Shores High School, and um, Mona Shores told me that my ex, I guess Timothy had damaged a Chromebook in Oklahoma, and because my ex owed money on that, they would not send his records up to us. So we were not able to enroll him. So I found an uh, online homeschool curriculum that I had to monitor, but I, I enrolled him in that. Let me make sure I understand. Was it your original intention to put Timothy into 
public schools? Yes, sir. We okay. started the process. I filled out the paperwork. Um, because of my work schedule, I couldn't actually take paperwork to Mona Shores. My, my husband did that. Adam did that. Um, but yes, we did try to, to get him enrolled. Okay. And the youngest child, G, was he in public schools? No, he was homeschooled. What about Paul? Do you know if he was homeschooled or if he... When he got to you, was he still in school? No, he had graduated high school. Okay. Right. My G was homeschooled. Um, okay. Now, you, you mentioned that you weren't able to stay at home and and uh, uh, care for your children at home, in the home, um, as, as a stay-at-home parent. Is that correct? That's correct. And um, <clears throat> what what type of, I assume you're in the, out working. Yes, sir. Okay. Ex explain to, to the jury the work that you did during the period of time that Timothy arrived in your home. I was, when, when he first arrived, I was still studying for the bar exam so my husband was working full-time um, and I was just doing uh, I, I trained dogs on the side everything from basic obedience up through different types of service dogs for other people and so I had a couple of dog training clients but mostly I was studying for the bar exam I also was an intern here in this courthouse that, that pay time. a lot of money oh it was it was not paid at all sir. okay um, but uh, it was the week of the bar exam um, my actually my, my judge that I worked for here is a law clerk informed me of this position that was open in Waco County, and she knew that the judge referred me, and that's when I did the interview, and, and I started work, I think it was three days, two days after I completed the bar exam. Okay. Was that a paid position? Yes, it was. Was, was it lucrative enough where you didn't have to do any other work? Um, well, with my husband's income, it was. Okay. But your husband's income stopped when he, when he got sick? When he had the stroke, yes. Okay. So at that point, was it enough income to provide for you and your family? No. Were you receiving any other outside income? <clears throat> um, my um, older brother lives in the home that I, used to, that I still own in Oklahoma, and he paid rent to us. Okay. But it wasn't a lot. It was, that went towards our house rent. Child support? No. My, my ex, one of the siblings was forgotten yesterday. Um, I, there's five total. We talked about the four boys. I also have a daughter. Um, she is now 19, but she stayed down with her dad. Okay. So we each had one, so there was no, um, there was no child support. And because of child support on the, the other four kids, I actually was still paying my ex child support. It was still being deducted from my check. Okay. So you had that. That's another deduction from your income. Thousand dollars a month. Yes, okay. sir. Okay. So, um, were you also doing tutoring when, when you went to? The, the judge was paying you. Were you still tutoring or doing any other outside work? Not at that. I was doing the dog training. Okay. Let, let me ask you this. What time in the morning did you leave to go to work? Um, I usually left the house about 6.30. And what time, on average, were you getting home? About 6 o'clock. Okay. So we're talking about 12 hours away from the home? Yes, sir. Okay. Those, those, those monitors, um, uh, the video cameras in your home, you were able to... Or to, re to view them while at work? From my phone, occasionally, yes, sir. Okay. Um, and you were, but you were still working? Yes, sir. I didn't view them at all until after the stroke. I mean, because my husband was there, or we had, we had arrangements where my husband was off certain days of the week. Paul was off one day, specifically one day a week, so he took care of, of Gabriel and Timothy. And then... Um, the other two days that I need to care for Gabriel when my husband's working, he actually went to my in-law's house down in West Olive. May I approach the witness for just a moment, John? You may. Uh, and you just said it to <laughs> uh, Let's see. You, you have, so you have three children at home. Yes, His sir. name's okay. out there, but and I'm not going to say it. You, you faced other challenges personally in terms of your own personal health. Yes, sir, I did. Okay. Uh, for instance, let, let's run down the list. You have insomnia. Severe insomnia caused by attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Okay. And, and uh, for those folks who, who get a great night's sleep every night, don't understand <clears throat> what insomnia does to, to your ability to function, can you explain to them what impact chronic insomnia has on a person? It limits your ability to think clearly. Um, your energy level is, is greatly reduced. Um, takes a lot longer to process things. Um, you forget things easier. Uh, it, was just, it was much harder to function with, with so little sleep. Okay. 
And you talked about your other, your other personal disorders. Were you seeking medications for those? Um, I was for, um, I, had, I have severe attention deficit hyperactivity disorder combined type. Um, I also have sensory processing disorder and OCD. Um, and then after my husband's stroke, as a result of my husband's stroke, because I viewed him, I, I, I wasn't in the room when he had the stroke, but I, it was, I was there right afterwards. And so I developed post-traumatic stress disorder with disassociation from that. The only medication that I was on was for the ADHD. Okay. Uh, and you had you had the service dogs in your presence to. I had one service dog for me. Yes. Okay. Um, what source of medical? What source of interventions were available for for Timothy's disorders? Um, when he came to us, he was on medication. He was on. They gave us a whole like large gallon sized Ziploc bag of medications for him. Um, I could not refill them because I could not get him to the doctor. Um, we were going to try to adjust his medication because when he came to live with us, when he took his medicine, he was a zombie. It was, it was just horrific. Um, and when Paul came to live with us, because Paul had only been there a year when Timothy moved down, or moved up, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and when Paul, he was on the same big bag of medication, um, and there were serious concerns that they just, instead of handling, especially my ex, he wanted to medicate them. But I never got that option because I couldn't take him to the doctor. Okay. All right. Um, there's been uh, some allegations, there's been some implications, put it that way, that you uh, tried to keep people from seeing Timothy, that you tried to keep him away from public view, that he didn't go to school, he didn't go to the doctor, et cetera, that he went, to, he went outside, he was in the backyard. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, sir. Uh, from, if, if someone's outside in your backyard, is he, are there trees or fences or other obstacles to keep the neighbors from looking over there and seeing uh, who's out in your yard? No, there was a clearing before there was, there was woods at the back of the lot, but there was a clearing and at least the neighbors on each side, they, there were pretty sizable windows on the back of their homes. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't in the, I think the next door was a two level, but the one on one side was just a, a single level. It may have had a basement, I don't know. Um, but there was big windows and they could see into our backyard easily. Okay. Um, was it ever your intention to keep people from seeing Timothy? No, my mother-in-law saw him. We had a, they do rental home inspections, I guess the city of Norton Shores. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember if it was late April, or early May of 2022, but it was in that neighborhood. And so we had the inspection that day and my mother-in-law happened to stop by that day. And I invited her in, we, we sat and talked and Timothy wanted to come say hi. So he, he came up and said hi to her. Um, now you're, you're a uh, Muskegon County transplant. Correct. You're, you're, yes, I'm not okay. from around here. So, and where's <laughs> and I'm assuming that your are you're, from around these your parts bi are yet. Direct biological family. There's not a lot of them in this county. There's no. Bi I don't have other than my children. I don't have any biological father, biological family here. Okay. How far away are they? Uh, my older brother is in Oklahoma City, and then I have two sisters that I have not talked to in over 20 years, and they live in Alabama, where I'm from. Okay. So how, how often do those folks, your bio <laughs> family, stop by and to see how sister's doing? Um, the last time I saw my older brother was when we all, we went down to North Carolina for my oldest son's wedding in October of 2021. And then my, my brother and sister-in-law drove over from Oklahoma for the wedding as well. We FaceTimed a lot. We watched football games on FaceTime, but um, I didn't get to see them after we moved up here. Okay. Do you have a lot of friends in the area that will come by, will stop by on, uh, maybe on, does it happen to be in the area, that sort of thing, that will come by and, and, and visit your home? Most of my friends were from work, and they actually, because I worked in Nuego County, they lived in Nuego or Oceana County, or even further, I don't know, I'm not from here, I don't know what county is next to Nuego East, um, but I know at least one person from work lived in, I think it's Big Rapids. Yes. Um, so no, they didn't stop by because they were too far away. Did you have a lot of time for social interactions at your home? No, not at all. And how about Paul? Did he have friends that he'd bring by or? No, he talked about people at work, but he never asked to bring anybody over. Did, were there any, was he ever given any instructions? You can't have people in this house? Absolutely not. And what about uh, the youngest child, G? Did he have any friends that, for sleepovers or anything like that? We didn't have any friends over for, no. Um, he had, he played baseball. Um, because of me not being able to get out, he didn't get out a lot. I mean, I wish I could have gotten him out more. That's why we put him in baseball, so he could get around other kids more. Um, I had been looking into homeschool co-ops, but with my schedule, I just couldn't do that. Okay. What, in your, what, which would you say was more impactful 
in terms of your, you know, get Timothy out of the house? Was it was it your desire he not get out of the house or your work requirements? Um, it was work requirements and his choice. Um, there was, I want to say it was April. The weather was halfway decent. I guess people here were, I mean, there was kids down the street. There's teenagers playing basketball when I came home from the grocery store one weekend. Mm -hmm. And I, I stopped and rolled my window down and said, hey, I've got a 15-year-old at home. Can he come play with y'all? Even though I knew he wasn't coordinated, I knew he, I thought he would enjoy it. And they said, yeah, sure, absolutely. And he <coughs> did not want to go play. Okay. Did he ever request to go play? And you denied him? No, no, he never did. Actually, Paul, we had, um, mom and dad, my, my in-laws, got Timothy a bike for his 15th birthday. And Paul and he, we were on a cul-de-sac. And um, Paul had tried to teach him to ride the bike. Um, okay. I know, I know they had a few sessions. I don't know how many. So those, on those occasions, he'd be outside. Oh in yeah, front he was out house. in the cold, in front of the house, in the cold <coughs> okay. All right. Okay. Let's talk about some of the things that have come up in this case. Uh, there, there were. Uh, okay, there, there are leg irons discovered in your home. Were you aware of those? I, I was aware that Paul had them. Um, you actually could look on my Amazon. Paul had the option to do payment on the Amazon as well as mine, uh -huh. and Paul had actually ordered those under his his account. Okay. I knew she was going to blame that. him. I, not, no. you, I knew did it. Did you ever use them? Uh, no, sir. No, well, I never instructed. Let's be in specific. Did you ever use them with Timothy? No, sir. Okay. Uh, did you ever notice any uh, bruising on Timothy's wrists or legs uh, that might be attributable to the use of leg iron? No, sir. I never saw anything like that. Uh, you heard Paul talk about plastic ties. What, what was that about? I honestly don't remember. Okay. Um, I, I don't know why we would order. I mean, I saw the ties. I don't. I don't remember ordering them. I don't know what happened there. You're gonna say I don't remember a lot, aren't you? Unfortunately, yes, because of the dissociation. Okay. Explain to explain to the jury what that means. Um, well, there, I guess there's different forms. Somebody told me this. I did not find out about the PTSD and the dis disassociation until about seven months after my husband's stroke, even though it had been going on since right. the stroke. I need to place an objection on the record, and I think we're going to have to excuse the jury. <laughs> the jury. Well, why don't you excuse you back to the jury room? Uh, good thing that the, uh, you know, it doesn't forget text messages. <coughs> you know, when you talked about, oh, he slipped his cuffs again. You know those, those text messages, they don't forget. They don't forget what you did. I knew you were going to, I knew she was going to blame Paul. How this woman had so many kids, I have no idea. Come on, Jerry, get out so we can see what's happening. I don't know where that courthouse is, but it's by a lot of sirens. So I uh, feel like the jury is now in the jury room secure. Go ahead, Mr. Roberts. Well, for, first and foremost, Your Honor, she's not qualified to testify about what this association means and what this association is, what affects this association. Anything that she knows about that presumably would have to be told over by a doctor. We've already been down the road. Uh, Mr. Johnson, to my, to my knowledge, has tried multiple doctors that would be able to provide a diagnosis of Ms. Van Ark to indicate that she has you know, some type of disassociation for some type of mental disorder which would have contributed to this offense and has not done so. That's an insanity defense. We covered that extensively. Mr. Johnson, I think, valiantly tried to, to get that and has been unable to, to provide any information to me from any medical doctor who's examined Ms. Van Art that she suffers from any of these diagnoses. So I'm objecting to this entire line of questioning about disassociation, about why she can't remember certain things. Um, if she wants to say she just can't remember, I, I guess she can just say she can't remember, but she doesn't get to use the excuse that this is disassociation. Furthermore, I have, I have a doctor still on standby as a potential rebuttal witness who did examine Ms. Van Der Ark. It's the report from the Forensic Center, which, with, which Mr. Johnson has, which essentially debunks this entire disassociation uh, uh, myth that she doesn't remember things or chooses not to remember things because of some disassociation. So I, I'm objecting to this entire line of questioning. It's an inappropriate, essentially, defense that's being raised here. It's, sounds like it's almost like a diminished capacity type defense, which we all know is not a valid defense. Uh, and I'm not on notice of any insanity defense or any doctor who would provide a diagnosis meaningful to the jury so they understand what these things actually are. 
Right, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, sir. Your initial, let, let me uh, tell you what's not. It's not an insanity defense. It is, and certainly uh, my client can testify as to what she knows. Now, if, if she's, if the people are at liberty to examine her as to what she knows and how she might know that and, and, and determine that her, her sources of information aren't adequate or that her understanding is inadequate, but certainly I can ask her what she knows and what she, how, how what she knows corresponds to what's going on with her physically and mentally. Those, those do not rise to insanity defense, and certainly she says, I don't remember. She can explain why. If she, judge, if she were a drunk and she said, I can't remember because I was drunk that night, we would allow that in. If she says, I can't remember because it's a disassociation thing, then that should be allowable. It's, it doesn't rise to a legal defense. It doesn't arise to uh, a, 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 a argument of insanity. What it does is an, it's an explanation simply of what she did next. Well, how did, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Why don't you remember these things? That's what this explains. And, and quite frankly, that I think is, is relevant and it's certainly, uh, I think, permissible at this point. If, if the people uh, have an expert that they can bring in and say, hey, look, that's not what's going on with this woman, that's, that's their call. But to say she can't even talk about it because somebody else may disagree with her is, is not the standard. The standard here is, is, is the information relevant? And certainly, is, did she act upon it? Certainly. And she's acting upon this information, and, it explain, and does it explain an issue for which the, ju the jury has to determine? They have to determine intention. And, and quite frankly, she, if she doesn't even remember the conduct that she's involved with, certainly that goes to determine, show that she didn't make an, an informed well, I would argue that it shows that she didn't make an informed choice to do the things that, that happened in that household. But certainly she gets a chance to explain why it is I don't remember, because that's going to be her answer. I don't remember. And so she gets a chance to explain that. And that's all we're asking here. We're not going to argue that this is a defense. It's certainly, it's just simply an explanation for why she did what she did. All right, Mr. Roberts. Well, the problem, she can certainly answer. She, she doesn't remember. Absolutely, she can answer that. What she can do is testify about a diagnosis that she says that she's been provided by somebody and an explanation for what that diagnosis means. She's not a doctor. Anything that she learned to talk about disassociation was provided to her by hearsay. And that those individuals, if, if, that was the te if that is going to be the testimony and disassociation is the defense, then I want the doctor here that examined her and diagnosed her with having disassociation so she can conveniently forget the horrible things that happened in this case. It's all hearsay. It's not the same thing as intoxication. So Mr. It's Johnson, I, I think you know, you're know you gonna ask her if she, she doesn't remember, assuming she's gonna answer no, well, why don't you not remember? She's going to say, well, because I have this dissociation disorder, right? I think, Mr. I think you'd have to lay the foundation for that, uh, for that testimony. And the foundation for that testimony would have to come, would be hearsay, uh, would be from some other source. Um, she's obviously not a doctor. She can't self-diagnose herself. She's not been admitted as an expert. So she's, she, she can, as a layperson, testify to what she feels and those things rationally based upon her feelings and what she sees and understands. So I don't think it's an objection well, she can say, you know, I don't remember. Why don't you remember? Well, because, you know, I black out. Now, your example was drunk driving. Well, a lay person can say, hey, listen, in my experience, when I drink eight beers, I, you know, stumble. I can't really remember those kind of things. And it's rationally based on her perception. And she can describe those things that are happening to her. I think that's fair. But to, in order to say, yes, that is exactly dissociation disorder or this, there's got to be a foundation laid for that. Yes, and she cannot lay that foundation. And if she's going to, again, that would be hearsay. Again, if a doctor comes in and says, we told her this, that lays the foundation, okay, fine. But I think Mr. Roberts uh, is correct when he says that foundation has not been laid, which would then implicate him bringing in a doctor to say that's not true. So uh, based on that, I am going to sustain the objection. Again, you can still ask her about what she felt, what she heard, what she saw the symptoms she experienced. I, I don't think you're objecting to that, Mr. Roberts. Is that correct? Well, sy symptoms makes me a little bit nervous. I guess we can, we, we can address it on a, on a okay. answer by answer basis. No, she says, hey, but, look, I felt heart palpitations, or I felt my blood pressure going up, or I felt- Oh, certainly okay. talking about f physical, yeah, physical impacts on, okay. on your own body. Sure, any, any, anybody okay. can testify to those things. 
Right. But but tying it to any specific diagnosis. Sorry, is, that was weird hair. I don't know what it's doing today. There's, there's no foundation that supports it again. I agree. Those. All right. So well, objection well, is uh, sustained. Uh, we understand. We can't talk about disassociation. We can't use that term. Yes, sir. Okay. Second, Judge, and a few moments ago, I, I was given permission to, to, to approach my client. I whispered something in her ear. She was using Gabriel's name. Yeah, Mr. Yeah. John, I did hear. I know. Mr. Roberts <laughs> caught that, too. <laughs> Yeah, so no, I didn't. Have, I didn't say anything then. And I it's out. I, it's out. We've been, you know, practice. I've seen you in practice. You haven't actually practiced in front of me, yet. But, um, but I, but I certainly have seen you in action. So I, I think I. I yeah, trust it's, it's that you're all not doing out there. So thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything else, Mr. Roberts? No, sir. No. Okay. Let's bring it back up. Please rise. <laughs> like I said, I'm not going to say it, but they have said it enough. I don't need to. if he'll explain this objection away or whatever. I guess not explain it away. That's not correct. But just explain it. Right, you may continue, uh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Van Aert, uh, you, you've, you've told the jury about how busy you are, and you've told the jury that, that you have some, some physical If they're paying things going attention, they'll know he lost. Correct? Yes, sir. How did those things impact you state. in terms of, of your, 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 your ability to think clearly, organize, <laughs> and uh, follow through on information? Starting right after my husband's stroke, um, I started experiencing episodes where if you've ever passed out, like the world closed, you get tunnel vision and the world closes in on you until you, you completely black out. It felt like I was blacking out, but I didn't actually pass out. Um, and the events that happened after that, I have no idea of what happened. I don't remember it. I, I don't know. Okay. And this happened anytime I got even a little stressed. So, so you're understanding you're under oath right now, correct? Yes, sir. And you're asked to tell the truth right now. Yes, sir. Okay. So we're, we're asking you that you not fill in, not guess at anything. Correct. That's, okay. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. So it is. If you don't understand, we need to say you don't, or you don't remember, we need to say those things. Correct. Okay. Um, and, and you did you did testify that these symptoms and this pressure impacted your recollections. Is that uh, absolutely, right? yes. And then there's the, the final pressure. You, you're, you're raising children and, and teenage children, uh, some of them, in your home at the same yes. time. So all these things are going on at once. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, while you're at work monitoring... And you've got the ability to monitor the home. Uh, would your job permit you? Did you have the ability to sit in front of a monitor and watch the home all the time, or did were there times that you could not do that? Most of the time, I couldn't do it. And why is that? Because I had work to do. Um, we were part of the time I was in court with my judge, um, and then most of the time I was doing research or doing other tasks that my judge or one of the other judges in the county assigned. So I didn't I didn't have time to do that. Uh, you're, when, when you're watching the videos on the phone, you said you watch them with your, your telephone screen, correct? Correct. And it is a standard screen, nothing special about it? It was an iPhone, I think it was a 12. Okay. Um, I've seen those video cameras where they, where systems where they, you can have four <clears throat> different cameras going all at one time, all the same screen. Was that your situation or did you move from camera to camera and only have that camera visible? No, the cameras were different brands and different cameras, so you could only do one at a time. Okay. All right. So, and were you wearing an eye watch as well? An Apple watch, yes. Apple watch. Oh, thank you. Uh, were you able to monitor your children uh, from the Apple watch? No. Okay. Uh, so, if you, were, if you were, say, in a courtroom like this and you're doing your job, you got a message on your Apple watch, which, what would you get? Um, I, you could get messages and pictures, you couldn't see it, I mean the screen was tiny, um, but you could get messages and then there's certain like pat responses, like pre-programmed responses, or you can type with your finger. Okay, I'm going to ask you about a specific uh, email, a text that you received uh, that accompanied a picture. Uh, it's, it's the one that the prosecutor's given to, to, the, to the jury where that shows Timothy uh, from the chest up and then his legs. You know what I'm talking about? 
I have heard about it. I have not actually seen these pictures. How could what you respond to it? How's it come from that be? I typed on my. We were in court that day. Uh -huh. I actually think I responded. I'm in court. Um, I scribbled out a message real quick. To, back okay. to Paul. Okay. So you, you did you That'll see the be interesting. afterwards? No, I had too many messages on my phone. I don't usually scroll back. Okay. So how did you know to respond to, to, to Paul to say, give him some food? Because of what he said. He had sent a message saying something. Okay. So you were able to see the message. Yes, I saw, I saw the message. And the, the picture, I mean, it's this big, but there was pictures. I just couldn't see what it was of. Okay. Let's, and I, I deviated again. I tend to do that. Sorry about that. I need to be more organized, and we'll get there. Um, we talked about the leg irons. We talked about the plastic ties. and. The, did you purchase those plastic ties? I don't remember, honestly. Okay. Uh, what about the hot sauce? Talk, tell the jury about hot sauce and your son, Timothy. My, my under, well, I'm not going to ask tell you my understanding because you don't need to know that. The question is, whose idea was it to, to get hot sauce and to administer it to your son? The idea was originally Paul's. Okay. I knew it. Come on, punch her. And, and what was the, what was the point of the hot sauce? Figuratively um, speaking, because we had tried multiple other discipline methods, and he thought maybe that would get him to stop misbehaving. Okay. He suggested it to me, and I, at that, I was so wrung out, I was willing to try just about anything. All right. Were you aware of how that this? Were you aware that this hot sauce was purchased online? Yes. Do you know Under why Paul's it was purchased online instead of going to Meyer and, and picking up a bottle of hot sauce? Well, I didn't go, I didn't have time to go to the store. I mean, our groceries were, I did the grocery delivery through okay. the Walmart app or through the Meyer app. Um, so, and I didn't see anything. Um, they just had basic stuff. And I didn't see anything hot enough. our discussion, we had talked about something. And Timothy could handle this child. When I got well, pregnant. I, I, okay. I know you're going. You're gonna, well, hold on a second. Okay, sorry. I, I, I want to make sure we understand this. Th this, this hot sauce has a, has a particular label. I, I've never seen it at Meyer. Did you did you see the label? Did you see the, the hot sauce itself? Did you what what did you did you order it? I believe no, I ordered did. at least one of the bottles. Yes. Okay. Oh well, good. Why good. did you there order you this particular hot sauce or these hot sauces? What do they have in common? Um, because I think it was the same brand, um, the same one. Um, because it was hotter than what you could usually get, and because Timothy could he liked spicy food. Okay. He loved spicy food. All right. Uh, <clears throat> How, how do you know you like spicy food? That actually started before he was ever born. Um, before I got pregnant with Timothy, I didn't like spicy at all. I mean, I nothing, no heat, nothing. And when I got pregnant with him, I started craving. Um, my ex liked spicy foods, but I didn't, and I started craving. Like I would outspice my my ex. Um, it was amazing. Um, I still like, I, not to the extent when I was pregnant, but it, that some of that remained. But Timothy, as early as age two, he could eat a whole bag of the flaming hot Cheetos without a drink, I mean, just, he could down, he, he loved spicy food, it was, okay. used to scare the heck out of me. But you were aware that, that this, these spices were, were hotter than what you needed yes. to admire? Yes, yes. And, and it, it was for disciplinary issues, is that yes. correct? Did you ever, uh, the, the testimony was that you did child care while uh, Paul was at school or at work, did you ever administer any of the hot sauce yourself? If I remember, I might have, have done some on bread a couple of times, okay. um, but usually by the time I got home, um, that either we were cooking food, I, I had to cook, or I had had Paul cook something so I could feed everybody. Um, but I don't recall, I, I think I did it on bread once or twice maybe, but that was it. There's a text out there that says, you suggested putting hot sauce on his penis. Do you remember hearing that? With the I remember hearing it, yes. Sir. Do you remember saying those things? I do not, no sir. Um, oh yeah. Um, we oh talk, yeah. Are we going to blame Paul, right? Like, some talk cold bath, and sometimes they were called ice bath. Do you remember that testimony? Yes, this is Paul's okay. idea too. Uh, the the source of the ice, according to the testimony I heard, was your home refrigerator. No, it was actually a countertop ice maker. The refrigerator did not have an ice maker in it. Okay, and you didn't go on by the. the they showed a picture of, of it. For the home. No, I did not. How much ice are we talking about for that that that? tabletop ice maker kit. It actually made about a cup and a half of ice. I had to measure it to use it for, I made some frappes at times. Okay. Um, the basket was maybe this wide, and then underneath was the water 
um, where the water was kept because that's how it made the ice. Okay. And then it took about two hours to remake more ice. Okay. So my sister has one of those, and one, it makes ice continuously, at least hers did, because I would hear it all the time when I visit her, and two, maybe hers was a different size, I don't know, but it looked like it made way more than a cup of ice, because she would get a glass, fill it up, and there was, looked to be still plenty of ice in there, so I'm, I, I don't know. If I was sitting on that jury and she was sitting there blaming Paul for everything, who looks absolutely glad to be away from this woman, she'd lose me immediately. Take some responsibility for your actions. You said put the hot sauce on the bread. You're the mother. So just because your son suggested something, that's hair, I tell you. Just because your son suggested something doesn't mean you have to do it. You're the parent. You're so smart. Remember how smart she is? She's told us several times. You're the parent. You decide. And if Paul did order the leg shackles, why? Who just orders leg shackles? And I believe they were on Timothy's bed. So... I'm not believing a whole lot of what she says at this point. You admit getting frustrated with uh, your child care efforts with Timothy, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, frustrated, discouraged. Did you ever intend to hurt him? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. You, you, you cry raised ever? other children, correct? Yes, I did. And. Uh, while Timmy was malnourished, do you, to your knowledge, have any of your other children ever been reported as malnourished? No, not at all. I, as I looked at Paul, he seemed uh, like a thin guy to me. He is. That's we're all pretty small. Well, okay. other my oldest is a little bit thicker. Okay. My my question is this: Is it was Timothy's when he was healthy? Was his build like his brothers, or was is he was he built like his older brother, <coughs> who's a little heavier? He went back and forth. Um, he actually, there was an, um, a situation where he actually got on the, the bathroom scale in, it was after Mother's Day of 2022. Um, I can tell you why I know it's after Mother's Day if you want me to. No, that's not necessary. Okay. Sure but, um, I was, I can remember I, that I was training a new service dog as has been discussed. He's a great Dane puppy. He was seven months old at the time and he was too big to sit on the bathroom scale to get his weight. And I wanted to see what he weighed. And Timothy, what we would do is somebody would stand on the scale, get your weight, and then you pick up the dog. And Timothy wanted to help out that day. Um, so I, I thought the dog would be too big for him at that point. He was already really big at seven months old. But uh, I said, okay, let's try it. And so it was, like I said, sometime after Mother's Day. It wasn't very long after Mother's Day. But at the time, he was 104. Timothy was. Okay. Um, he could not pick up the dog because the dog was 102 at the time. Okay. <clears throat> Part of this process of providing child care. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to be the eyes in the house when you weren't there. Is that correct? Yes. And you selected Paul for that purpose. I didn't have a choice. That was my only option. How much did you rely upon what Paul was telling you? I totally relied on him. Do you remember the, the uh, during the reading of the uh, uh, transcripts, the, the text, that you asked Paul? Matter of fact, let me. I have a feeling the prosecutor is going to rip her to shreds on this. Be honest with me. Are you worried about him at all? Or is it all a bunch of BS like it has been for days? Do you remember that? Do you remember that text? Um, vaguely, yes, sir. Okay. Do you remember his response? I remember he said he wasn't worried about it. Okay. Did you rely on that? Yes, absolutely. Again, you're the yeah. mom. I was, I was at home so few hours when the kids were awake. Then take a look at him. And then you had to sleep, try to sleep yourself. I tried, yes, sir. And They slept better than I did. Let's, let's face it, your house is a mess. It's yes, a wreck. it was. Yes, sir. Why was that? It's much of that OCD. I'm, honestly, I'm not a great person at keeping things clean. And having three boys, that contributed. Um, I tried to, to get help, their help cleaning up as much as I could, but 
I just didn't have time or the energy with the lack of sleep and everything else going on. I, I barely functioned. Okay. Why don't and, you make them eat hot sauce? Um, that, when they that disobeyed. Eat, that message I, well, strike that. Eat that. Did you depend, I, I asked you, did you depend on what Paul was telling you? Yes, sir. Did your, in your opinion, did Paul ever, for lack of a better term, sound the alarm? I Not mean, that I was aware of, no, sir. Okay. Do you, that one I message don't was care. Just, You're the mother. That, that was it. That's the only thing I got from Paul that ever had any concern. With the one little pictures in it. Right? Yes, sir. Okay. And it's okay, let's talk look. about some other stuff here. Um, once, once you discovered that that Timothy had passed, uh, and once the police get there, do you tell them the truth? I was so freaked out. I was, I'm sorry. Oh, we're gonna get tears finally. We haven't had any. I'm sleeping. Really I've got one. Of course you do. I'm sorry. Thank you. You're welcome. Why didn't you tell me the truth? Why were you so free? I don't remember what my line of thinking was at the time. I was so tired. I, I don't. I don't know. I wish I had an answer for you, but I don't. Were you tired at that point? I was exhausted. I, the night before he passed, I had had less than an hour of sleep. Were you, you frightened? You let him at that starve. Point? Absolutely. I just lost my son. Do you need a moment? Okay. Okay. Um, Sorry, I was looking on the big screen for tears. Were you, were you, was this some, this outcome expected by you? Absolutely not. No. So would it be safe to say you were surprised? I was shocked. Were you in disbelief initially? Yes, absolutely. Um, you've got a, a, a there's, there's an indication that it took you a while to call the police. In fact, you told, you told, uh, uh, Paul not to, according to Paul's testimony. Why did it take you so long? He said 18 minutes. Out, out Why did it take you so long to call the police? I have no idea, honestly. It was, I was, I'm trying to figure out how to describe it. It was, it was surreal. Like, you're not even, you don't even know what's going on. It was, you just, time slowed down and I didn't know what was going on. When was the first time you found out it took 18 minutes to call the police? Um, was it yesterday or the day before? Um, yeah, it was it, within the last few days. Okay. That's the first time. Do you remember who was testifying when you found out? Um, it doesn't matter. I think we discussed it at a meeting on Monday. Um, it was, was Paul, it just so you know, so. Um, because but, it's Paul. And I heard 14 minutes initially, and then the first time I heard 18 minutes was when Paul said it okay. yesterday. Of course. Um, do you remember, <clears throat> how clear is your memory of, the, of, the, of your time and from the time you found uh, Timothy and in, in he had passed and the to the time you finished talking to the police that day? It's spotty. Okay. Um, the, the, the first officer said that uh, um, uh, you were distraught. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Uh, he said that you were crying. <clears throat> Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Do you remember telling the police that you that uh, uh, you pulled Timothy from his bunk bed when you found him in distress? I remember saying something like that, yes, sir. Was that true? No, sir. Do you remember uh, providing CPR for Timothy? Yes, I do. When, when did you stop that? Um, when the ProMed people walked down into the basement, I, I, um, I had asked them to take over and they didn't take over right away, but they said I had to, to leave the area. Okay. Let's do the hard stuff here. Uh, jury's seen pictures of Timothy. We've all seen pictures of Timothy at the time of his death. How could you not know he was? I will give her the fact that after, after, and maybe, maybe during, that she doesn't have her memory spotty. I will give her that 100%. However, I cannot give her the fact that she watched her son waste away. She had, she gave these orders every day and he sat in an ice bath for six hours. 
per her. The six hours probably wasn't per her orders, but the ice bath was. The taunting with the uh, pizza roll was. She's blaming her son for doing what she told him to do. She's taken zero responsibility for this so far. She's the mom. She should have seen what was happening. She, I was too busy. You're too busy to look at your son. You're you, the the son you're blaming sent you a picture and said, "Should we be worried?" And you're like, "Well, I was busy. I couldn't look at the picture. I was in court." Okay, look later or ask. Why did you ask me that? Since you can't apparently scroll back on your phone because you have too many text messages. I'd want to know what somebody sent me about my child and you couldn't take 10 seconds to just flick your finger down your phone screen and you're sitting here repeatedly blaming your son. It's disgusting. I hope the jury's not buying it. I'm not. I I don't even know what to say and we're going to get into the hard stuff. By the way, don't see a single tear out of her little episode that she just had a second ago. How could you not know? Honestly, I just, I was barely functioning. I missed a lot. Yeah, thank I mean, I hate it because, I mean, I feel like a complete failure, but there was things that I just didn't see. There was a lot that I didn't see, unfortunately. Those, on those, in those texts, you... You instruct Paul to make sure he's getting enough calories, correct? Yes, sir. I did. You had a restricted diet, correct? Yes, sir. Bread and water. You Paul to make sure he's getting calories. Yes, sir, I did. Did you rely on that? Absolutely. Um, Paul says he called the police ultimately. Who called the police? I called 911. It was on my phone. I'm sure you can <clears throat> pull a call and find out where it's from. Doesn't mean that, that you did it just because it's on your phone. Don't you worry. Did I bet they're going to pull it up. Timothy? No, never. Did you, did you know he was being hurt? No, I didn't, unfortunately. The, the, the tactics that you use to, uh, first of all, we're, we're, uh, the tactics, well, the tactics that you use to discipline Timothy? Did they seem extreme or outrageous to you at the time? No. Um, do you re Timothy remained in, you'll admit it was, it, the, the bath was not warm on the day he died. It was a cold bath. Correct, the day okay. before. It wasn't an ice bath though, correct? I so wasn't for routine there in I, your text. From the text it looks like he did, but I, that wasn't the, what was said to do. Okay. Paul chose to do the ice on his own, if you look at the text. Okay. So, do you, there's testimony that you remained in that tub for hours. Were you aware of that? No, I, I didn't realize he was in the tub, no. When you came home, you didn't realize he was in the tub? I did, when I got home, I actually ran him a warm bath when I got home. Okay. Where? In the tub, downstairs. Okay. Where he was so at? Where he was sitting for six hours? Tub, what did you, explain the dream what you're talking about. Um, well, I, I had to get Paul to work, and then I came home, and... Um, my understanding, at least, was that when Paul had splashed water, he had splashed it on his face only. That's what I understood. Um, so I didn't realize he was still there. Um, and so when he, when he, I got home, I was like, wait a second, what the? So I, I decided to go ahead and run a warm bath just to, to warm there's, him up. There's a bunch of stuff in there talk about make sure he doesn't sleep, make sure he doesn't sleep. What's that about? Um, there was a couple of situations where he actually Timothy actually intentionally kept everybody in the house awake. Um, he would intentionally set off the motion sensors. Um, he would make noise. Um, with the house being a bi level, you could hear a lot from the downstairs. Um, but he intentionally kept everybody awake. Okay. Um, and so that was, okay, if you're going to keep us awake, then you have to stay awake. Okay. So here, here's, the, here's my question. If he slept all day. You kept him awake for three days. According to your own text message, 
if he falls asleep now, like he already owed you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or whatever it was, but you, it was three days. You didn't want him even taking a nap. You would punish him for dozing off. Well, you wouldn't because you'd have Paul do it. And I get it. Your life was stressful. I understand that. That doesn't mean you don't look at your child. And if you saw your child in the bathtub the hours before he died, then you had to see the shape he was in. The medical examiner just told us she could, you could count every rib in his body. You could see tissue, the color, like under, through his flesh because it was so thin. He had pressure sores on him. You had, if everything you're saying up to this point is true, you had to see him then. And all you did was run him a warm bath. Yeah, that makes you a complete failure as a mother, ma'am. So go ahead and you can feel that way as far as I'm concerned. You did nothing. And you're still doing nothing except blaming everyone around you. I, I don't get it. Hey, what would he do all night? Oh, he'd be up all night. There's no, he had to, you had to get him up no later than about 10 in the morning or he would. He was, he was up all night long. Okay. If he was homeschooling, why were you letting him sleep so late? And if he never slept, why did you let him sleep so late? Uh, there's, there's a door. Do something different. That has a, a, a dent in it that we saw an exhibit of. Okay. Um, and, and you heard Paul testify that he, he did that. Yes. What is your recollection of that incident? Um, Course. I what I remember is I hear I remember hearing Paul yell from his room because his room was directly below the master bedroom, um, and then I pulled up the I wasn't asleep um, so I pulled up the, the main camera in the the basement area and I see Paul come out and kick that door and I, I went to hit the button he was screaming at Timothy while it happened and I hit the the um, two way talk button on the camera and said hey what the heck go back to bed and I actually had to physically go downstairs and get him away from the door and, and send him to bed. Was the, in the text on occasion, Paul would have uh, say things that suggest aggressions <clears throat> towards Timothy on occasion. Was that, did you know any other circumstances other than what's in the, those, those situations in the text? Oh, absolutely. Paul was, he never displayed that towards my youngest. He never displayed that towards my husband when he was still at home or myself. Um, he would get aggressive when he was playing games. He would get really angry. He had some serious anger, anger issues. Um, and then when Timothy moved up, and Timothy did push his buttons some, but he just, he never reacted well. I mean, he just overreacted to Timothy every time. It was, he hardly ever reacted rationally to Timothy. Okay. And so, uh, other than what he was texting you, and other than what you could see when you weren't working at, at, at your job, uh, you don't have first-hand information as to what's going on between Paul and Timothy. Is that correct? No, I would. I asked my little guy occasionally, okay. um, but Timothy never told me anything that was going on. Okay. So um, I did. I mean, I asked hey, just because I, I Ugh. if if I had texted Sorry. Paul and he seemed upset, um, then I would get home and hey, is everything okay? Um, and my my little guy. Um, Honestly, I don't remember him ever saying that there was there was an issue. He said, yeah, Paul got mad, but that was it. He never said anything happened. Okay. Would that be because you said in your text messages, make sure he doesn't see it. Make sure G's not there. Make sure G's downstairs. Or make sure G's upstairs. Make sure G is not seeing this, what is happening. And maybe Paul, and you could kind of tell Paul did have, he kept it in check on the stand. Because you could kind of tell there he was getting kind of angry at the defense attorney who's talk who's questioning her right now, but he he kept it in check. But she fed it. When he was mad, 
she fed it. Only one time did she say, you're not going to do that to him. I, I think Paul said he felt like slamming Timothy on the floor, or on the ground, whatever. And she, that time, said, you're not going to do that to him. Every other time, and I know we're only seeing a little bit of their text messages, and I know they only pick out the best. I, I got that. But the defense hasn't picked out anything so far. So she's not, she would just go along with him when he was frustrated or say, they would talk, you know, she would talk about he's faking. She would, he couldn't walk. He could, he was stumbling. He was weak. He was dying. And she was talking about how much he was faking it. Faking his eyes being, being glassy. Because he, he, he could stare at something for too long to make them glassy like that. It, it, she just is something. And if the jury did not come back with, they got this Friday, if they didn't come back with a verdict Friday, that might be kind of scary. <laughs> but I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've really been very careful to not look because I want to find out what everybody else says. But I cannot, I never say this, but I can't wait till the prosecutor gets, gets his turn. She's, she deserves what's coming to her. <clears throat> One moment, please. Looks like we might be getting ready. So he may be this, this what part What was of, your intent nope. when you would administer punishments to Timothy? To get him to behave. Was it ever your intent to harm him? No, absolutely not. No, I, the, the, uh, the locks on the fridge and freezer, they're actually, he, that was, he scared the heck out of me after my husband's stroke. And that's what brought those two on. Okay. Uh, I can tell you what happened. What was the incident? And then I got a, what was the incident that caused you to put locks on the fridge? Um, I had just purchased a two pound bag of frozen chicken nuggets and put it in the freezer. Um, and overnight, I guess he got a, around the motion sensors. Um, but the next day, it was a weekend, and the next day I went to, um, little man asked for, for some chicken nuggets. And I went to get them, and the, the bag was empty in the freezer. And I was like, what? On? I mean, we hadn't touched it. Mm -hmm. And so I started asking, and at first Timothy lied to me. He said he didn't touch it. Um, and then I went and checked with little man and with Paul, and nobody had touched the, so I went back because I had issues with both Paul and Timothy lying to me a lot. Um, so I went back to Timothy. I said, "Somebody, nobody else has touched this. He said, I ate them. I said, okay, did you cook them? He said, no, he ate the whole two-pound bag frozen, okay. uncooked chicken. All right. Were you concerned about his health and getting into and eating frozen food? Yes. And um, he ate, um, there was a time where he ate uncooked bacon out of the fridge before the chicken nugget incident. He ate a whole pound of uncooked ground beef at one point. Um, this was all after the stroke when there was less people to keep an eye on. Did it occur to you he's doing those things because he's hungry? He's starving? No, he, I mean, he, there was plenty of food. We were, there was no issues. He never told me he was hungry at the time when these incidents happened. Okay. So, fast forward. You offer him two pizza rolls if he does a certain thing. And you say, I don't care if they're frozen when you give them to him. If you're concerned about him eating frozen food, why would you offer him two frozen pizza rolls? Because the chicken was uncooked and it's dangerous. I was, that actually, I had a, a panic attack when he did the chicken. It was, That's not, it was that terrifying. That doesn't answer that question. Completely. So the nuggets were uncooked chicken. Yes, it's uncooked chicken. That's, it, it, that could have killed him. about pizza rolls. It freaked me out. And, but the pizza rolls were at least cooked. Yes, that was just, you frozen. reheated them. Okay. He was, and I'll give you one more, he was real thin. How did you not notice? I wish I hadn't answered that. Um, part of it, he actually, from the time of the stroke, because my husband's stroke was January 3rd of 2022, so it was, most of this was cold weather. Um, part of it was he wore, he wore big clothes, he wore hoodies, 
the clothes that were sent to him from his dad and stepmom, um, most of the pants didn't fit him well to begin with. And I had gotten him a couple of pairs of jeans, but I mean, I couldn't afford a lot. Um, and he also, um, once the stroke happened, he got really reclusive. Um, he, he just, I mean, he didn't want, and I had to force him, um, for a while, when he was doing his homeschooling, he would do it on his tablet. And then I found out he was, I tried to lock the tablet down, um, but he was doing other stuff on his tablet when he was supposed to be doing schoolwork. So I started the, the curriculum that he was on. You could print the, the assignments and the questions. So I started printing that. And um, literally, he'd be like, just stick it on the stairs. I'd, and he'd give me the other assignments. I would grade them and stick them in the, and put them into the, the program. But he, he didn't want anything to do with me, hardly at all. Yeah, but when you put your arms around him to hug your he son. He didn't want hugged. He was, he was 15. He didn't, want, he, he didn't want me. And he was autistic, correct? He was. He was high functioning. Okay. But he, most of the autism came with like interactions with other people. He struggled there. Okay. So it wasn't, was it just you he didn't want touching? Or was it anybody, he didn't want anybody else? Um, he didn't want Gabriel, sorry. He didn't want little man hugging him either. What about Paul? Do you ever uh, see They him? never offered to hug each other. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Roberts, how, how long do you anticipate your... Oh, I'm <laughs> thinking at least an hour and a half, Judge. So. Okay. Well, uh, it's a little early before lunch. I think it's a natural time to take a break, unless you prefer to start now, no, Mr. Actually, Roberts. there's an issue I think with the, that I'd like to address first. It might cut a small chunk of that out, but... It's going to be quite extensive. So I agree that okay. it makes right. sense to break now and make it come back early. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, uh, we're going to break a little early for lunch. Um, it, you'll be um, allowed to leave the jury room. Uh, you can go wherever you want for lunch. I'd ask you to uh, please wear your badges to and from your vehicles. Uh, that way people know that you're a juror. Uh, please don't. Oops. I don't know if he's going to address whatever the state wants to address. Um, and um, two at one o'clock. Before we go to the other part. 30 start. So I'll have the attorneys back here at the same time. So uh, thank you. Not much time, so maybe in the other one. All right, let me switch it. Give me a second. You get the little spinny thing off of the uh, screen here. We make sure it's still boosted up all the way. All that fun stuff. Here we go. It's still spinny. <laughs> Come on. You were just not spinny. All right, same day. They just, for whatever reason, this new station cuts it in two parts. So they didn't show us whatever his issue was. All right, you may be seated. Mr. Roberts, you can uh, begin your cross-examination. Oh, actually, recall. Yeah, sorry. How to do that. Here we are. Ms. Van Ark. Oh, no, never mind. <laughs> I'd get her back up there. I reminded you are still under oath. Yes, she, she probably oh, didn't want to come up there. <laughs> She's like, never mind. I don't want to testify anymore. Good afternoon, Ms. Van Ark. Now, uh, Mr. Johnson uh, kind of tried to shortchange her a little bit earlier in your cross area in his direct examination when he wanted to talk about your background, uh, your schooling. Um, remind the jury again of your educational background. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science degree, magna cum laude, and then I also have a Juris Doctorate, it's a law degree, that I graduated magna cum laude second in my class. 
And uh, magna cum laude, for those that might not be familiar, means with the highest honors, correct? Yes, sir. In law school, actually, summa only goes to number one. In, in, at the college level, you, it's above a certain GPA, but for law school, only number one gets summa, and then above a certain GPA gets magna. And then below that is even cum laude, which is what Mr. Johnson tried to say you were, yes, and I think he corrected him and made sure the jury understood, no, you were second in your class in yes, law school, sir. correct? Yes, sir. And uh, you took the bar exam. I did. Passed the bar exam. First try, yes, sir. With a very high score, right? Yes, sir. What was that score? 182 out of 200. Uh, the bar exam is an incredibly difficult test to pass, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. And mm. It was like 400 hours of study that went into that. And the pass rate for it usually hovers somewhere around 60%. So four out of 10 people that take it usually fail, right? I did not know that, but I'll take your word for it. Okay. But you understood it to be a very difficult test when oh, we yes. took it. Uh, I believe that score would constitute the highest score for, for your, for that time that, that you took the bar, right? Your score. I, I mean, I don't know. I would assume so. Okay. Um, and you also were magna cum laude in undergrad as well for your yes, bachelor's sir. degree? Yes, sir. And where did, where did you obtain your bachelor's degree? Liberty from? University. You had an opportunity to actually work in this very courthouse for, for a period of time, is that correct? Yes, sir. I did my law school externship, and then after I graduated law school, I stayed on as an intern. It wasn't paid, but the... the experience was invaluable to me, so it was worth it. And particularly the field that you were working when you were working here, you, you worked under Judge Smedley, one yes, of our other circuit court judges, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, the, the your area of focus that you wanted to, to really focus in on was appellate criminal work, is that correct? Yes, sir. And you had an opportunity to work on some cases here in Muskegon? I did, yes, sir. And eventually that, that turned into an opportunity to go work for another judge in another county, correct? Yes, sir. Up in Nuevo County? Yes, sir, for another circuit judge. Right. And, and you're doing the same type of work there? Yeah, even more work than what I was doing here, more specific. Um, I didn't do the sentence scorings here, and I did that there. Um, I actually, I helped Judge Smedley write one opinion while I was here, but I actually drafted most of my judge's opinions as law clerk. It's quite the responsibility that you had there, so congratulations on that. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Um, I think there's a little sarcasm and remind there. The jury again, how many children do you actually have? I have five total. Okay, and go, if, again, we're not going to name the youngest, youngest, little man, I think. Little man, know. yes. Um, Nolan is 23 and married. Um, Paul is 21 now. Millie, my only daughter, is 19. She's in college in Oklahoma, as far as I know. Um, I haven't talked to her in a long time. Um, Timothy was, he would be 17. He was 15, a month, a month shy of 16. And then little man just turned nine in September. And um, with the exception of Timothy, no harm has come to your children in terms of them you know, dying as a result of malnutrition and starvation, has it? No, not at all. A dehydration, hypothermia? No, sir. None, none of those inflicted on any of your other children? No, sir. They're all healthy. Um, Detective, or Detective Pieski, at the time he interviewed you, uh, I, I think attempt, attempted to get some photos uh, of Timothy from your phone, and you told him that you did, had no photos on your phone of him from January on, did you? I had one from January, but after that, no, I didn't have any. But you had a functioning phone? I did, yes, sir. You used it to monitor the cameras that we've talked about, the motion sensors, all that stuff. You had the ability to use a phone that was your own personal phone, Yes, right? sir, that was my phone. It wasn't a work phone where there was a restriction <clears throat> oh, no. to say, well, no. you can't take photos, anything no. of that nature, was it? No. So you certainly had the ability to have photographs of your child on your phone, correct? I did, yes, sir. Um, let's talk about some of your health issues, because we listed quite uh, quite a few issues that, that your, in terms of your diagnosis and health issues that you had. Um, I think you said ADHD, um, something called sensory processing disorder. OCD. OCD. Um, th those PTSD. PTSD. I, I would, I guess, I would kind of classify those more as almost. I don't, I don't want to use. I'm not using this word in a negative context because those are almost more mental disorders. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. No, I, I agree with that. Right. You also had some physical disabilities as well. Yes, sir. And I, I don't know if Mr. Johnson went into those. So why don't you tell the jury what your physical disorders are as well? I have um, allergy-induced asthma. I am allergic to almost everything environmental other than animals. Every different type of pollen and mold. And, and weeds. And then I am a reactive hypoglycemic. Um, I have been my whole life, but it was actually after Timothy was born, it got much worse. And um, they finally figured out right after I moved here why it, I mean, what was going on. But it required, I can eat, and my blood sugar will still crash. So I can pass out, I can be doing whatever and just pass out. So. 
if I'm not mistaken, you actually, I had, I had the opportunity to meet him. Very, very nice, but very large dog. You had a service animal when you worked here, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. Gemini. Gemini, yes. And Gemini's function as your service dog was, was what? He was set trained to pick up the, your blood sugar smell. Um, if you've ever been around a diabetic, when their sugar's high enough, they put off this hubba bubba bubblicious smell. Well, we, as humans, we can't pick up the low blood sugar smell, but a dog can actually pick up your sugar going up about 20 minutes before we can and they can pick up the low blood sugar. So he was sent trained. He would let me know when my sugar was about to crash. So I always carried orange juice with me and that would keep my blood sugar up for two and a half to three hours guaranteed. And then he was also trained if I ignored his alert and this did happen at work a couple of times. Um, he was trained, he was off leash. He was trained to go and get somebody to bring them to me to make sure I took care of it so I didn't pass out. Uh, it's just remarkable that dogs can do that. It's just it an is. aside. Um, and was Gemini the first service dog you had on? No, sir. He was my second. Okay. And so you had one before Gemini and then... One after. Then one after, and that was Sharma? Was Sharma, right? yes, sir. He was another great name. Another great name. Okay. I um, like the big dogs. So you are certainly, you are keenly aware of your health issues and the things that you need to do to address your health <laughs> issues, right? At times. I don't take great care of myself. I will admit that. It, and the fallback to that is you have a dog that will it alert does. you if your blood sugar gets yes. low. Yes. Yeah. So you understand that if so you have a backup plan yes I right do. yeah so if, if if i forget to eat or my blood sugar gets too low then my dog is going to alert me to that so i so i've got a backup plan, yes right? sir. but you understand the how that works you understand yes, sir. the medical need to, to have those things treated right? yes sir and the need to have your other issues that we talk about get treatment for those issues as well don't you yes sir um sensory processing disorder involves basically overstimulation right yes sir And you suffer from it's a disorder which causes you to become overstimulated with what audio and visual stimuli, correct? It's, it's, that's part of it, yes, sir. It can be stress-related as well. But as a punishment for your child, you decided that hot sauce, audio alarms, cold, cold, we'll get into this later, but cold, at least cold, if not ice baths, and isolation and sensory deprivation were appropriate means of punishment. Is that, is that your testimony? Those yes, are appropriate sir. forms of punishment? For some of it, yes, sir. Well, you also train service yeah, I knew animals, he was right? walking or somewhere. And when you train service animals, um, is, is crate training involved, involved at all? In yes, it is usually. Right. And, and explain what crate training is to a jury. Um, it depends on what you're using it for. Usually it's part of house training to begin with. Um, and when the service animal in training is very young, you don't get to take them with you 24-7. Um, so you don't want to leave them unattended a lot of times. Plus, the, putting a dog in a crate, a lot of times that's comforting to them. They like the, the, the more enclosed space. So it keeps them contained, keeps them from being destructive, and it teaches them, like for house training, it'll teach them not to do anything in their, in their house, basically, where you take them outside and where they do their business. And one of the ways you make them feel comfortable in, in their crates and so it's their house is they have a blanket or something of comfort in, in the crates, right? Uh, I don't usually, at least not for house training, because then they could actually do their business on that and shove it to the back of the crate. So I don't usually put anything in there. But that is a method that some, some people, people do use. employ. Some people training. use it, yes, right. but I don't. Right. Um, We've had a lot of, there's a lot of text messages. We had a lot of testimony from Paul yesterday and a lot of photographs about Timothy's small room. Uh, that was basically like a crate, wasn't it? I, I, don't, I don't believe it was that enclosed, but he, he asked for a space that he could close the door. He asked to go in, into that? He asked for a space, he, he asked for somewhere he could, um, some place he can go in and close the door. And it was actually half joking. I was like, that's all I've got because of the other rooms were taken and I, there was no way he was sharing with Paul and I didn't really want him sharing with little man either. But you didn't set that, that up as a room for him, did you? Not originally, no. He was actually out in the, the lower area for a while. But you didn't, you didn't put a bed in there? Didn't put we a did originally, in yes. There. He tore it up. Okay. But How? There, but there was no mattress, nothing of comfort for there in him the day before he died, was there? Not that day, no. He had torn it up. I couldn't afford to get another one. You put a, you put a blue tarp in there, didn't you? It was on, that was what was on the mattress previously, yes. And the tarp was because he would wet himself? Yes, sir. Because he, I tried the mattress covers, I tried plastic, I tried some rewashable, and he kept tearing them up. So his place of comfort was a closet with a blue tarp. 
Is that what you, is that what you want the jury some, to believe? He spent some time there. I wouldn't say that was a place of comfort. I mean, spent some was, time there. Well, let's get into that. He slept in there most <laughs> nights, didn't he? Wait, 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 wait. After, I don't know. I wouldn't. I don't know when exactly. He asked. Her just her testimony went from he asked for a space, to to get away, right? But it wasn't a place of comfort. Well, why do people why do people ask for places to get away to calm down to? It is kind of a place for a safe space or whatever, for lack of a better term is a place kind of a, for comfort. And then now you're just saying it wasn't for comfort. Probably not because blue tarps to lay on aren't real comfortable in a closet. It was, I mean, I know it was after my husband's stroke. I don't know when after that, but um, once he'd asked for that, yes, he did. In, in fact, he rarely even slept on his bed, did he? Um, he had taken the bed apart and lost some of the bolts. I couldn't, it wasn't safe for him to sleep up there. So, so the bed that we see in those pictures, it wasn't even safe to be used? No. So it was a complete lie when you told the police officers that you had to pull them off the bed, put them on the ground to do CPR, wasn't it? Yes. And it was a complete lie when you told 911, I need to put you on hold so I can take them off the bed to perform CPR, wasn't it? Yes, sir. I don't even remember. So that. in all your days, all your confusion, all your blacking out, tunnel vision, all that, you, you were able to somehow remember. I, I ought to tell everybody that Timothy was sleeping on the bed. Remember doing that? Vaguely, yes, sir. Have you ever given hot sauce to the dogs, to train the dogs? Um, I have put it on a couple of objects to keep them off of objects, yes. Keeps them, keeps them away from it, right? Yes, it does. Right, because they don't want to eat the hot sauce. Mm -hmm. uh, and you would, so you never actually grabbed a dog, forced its mouth open, and poured hot sauce down its throat, have you? No. Never put, bread, put hot sauce on a piece of food and then fed it to them make them eat it, have you? No, because I don't give my dogs human food. You can't do that with service animals. No, but you could put it on dog food, didn't you? I guess. I've never even thought about that, honestly. So it never occurred to you to use hot sauce, enforcing the use of hot sauce on a dog, but it occurred to you to use that as a form of punishment for your 14-year-old child? It, it was Paul's idea, but yes, it, I was at my wit's end at, the, at that time. It was Paul's idea, and you thought, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I think we'll do that. Is that what you're saying? I don't remember the exact conversation, but I said, it, like I said, at that point, I was willing to try anything. I was. We'll get into the text, but there's yeah. dozens of texts in here, and this is just a small section of text where you tell Paul, put more hot sauce on the bread, give him four slices of hot sauce. Don't do you remember those text messages? Some of them, not very many, but some of them. Mm -hmm. Use more. So you wouldn't punish a dog Use with hot enough. sauce, but it's okay to punish a child with it. Objection, I'll move on. Okay. Would you stick a dog in an ice bath as punishment? I did, that would never occur to me. But then having big dogs, you don't. I don't bathe them at home anyway. I use dry shampoo, or then I or I take them somewhere else. I, I don't. I'm, have I'm talking about a form of. I'm not talking about giving them a bath. I'm talking about using. I don't have as space. A form of punishment, putting a dog in an ice bath. I don't have space to do that, so I, I wouldn't think of that because I don't have space with that size dog. You're saying if you had a large enough tub to punish one of the dogs, you'd put him, put him in a nice bath? I can't, I mean, I can't imagine doing that, but... You can't imagine doing that, right? Correct. You can't imagine punishing an animal by putting him in a nice bath. Because animals can't think the same way humans can. So it's okay to do it on a human because they can think, right? They can, they can think better than dogs can, so it's okay to put them in a nice bed. Is that what your testimony is? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Is it okay to put a human in an ice bath because they can think better than dogs can, but you wouldn't do it to a dog? I mean, based on the way you asked that, I guess the answer would have to be yes, but it's just a, it's not okay. the way I think. So I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but you said you wouldn't do it for a dog. But we know you did it as a punishment for I never, Timothy. I never did personally. But you but told you Paul to do it. Told Paul um, to yes. do it. A couple of times. And, and it never occurred to you, this is not a good idea. We shouldn't be doing this, right? No, because it was the um, the amount of ice was almost. I mean, it was non-existent. So. So it's okay as long as it's not a lot of ice in the ice bath. Is that your testimony? If it doesn't affect the temperature much. Starts off as cold anyway, doesn't it? Um, not originally. I don't know down the road, but originally I did. That's not what 
what I had told him to do. Because the original time, the first time that happened, was before my husband's stroke. It was, Timothy had, um, the, we, we noticed there was no hot water. And we were like, what the heck? And I went down and I'm looking and I noticed the pilot light's not on on the water, it's a gas water heater. I'm like, what on earth is going this on? This ends when Timothy's turning off the gas, doesn't it? Uh, this, yes, this, sir. This part of the story, okay. And he let, lied about let, it for let, two let, days, but. Let, let me just make okay. sure I understand that. Is, is, so is it's your super, testimony that super punished? you put ice in an otherwise hot bath to cool it down? Yes. Why don't you just start with warm water to begin with? I honestly don't know. That, but that's what that. What yeah, that's Paul. So if you repeatedly refer in these text messages to them as cold and or ice baths, but that's what it was at the end, wasn't it? Cold baths or ice baths, at right? At the end, yes, sir, but not the first time. Not the first time. You, you, you apparently needed ice to cool down hot. I have bath. no idea what I was thinking. I was... We'd, we'd all had to have cold showers for two days, and he'd lied to us about the water heater. I'd had to have the gas company out. You remember taking the law school exam test? The LSAT? LSAT? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I hated that test. Oh, I did too. Yeah, I agree with you there. There's a <laughs> section on there that's about logic and reasoning, right? Yes, sir. And I kind of explained it to my friends as it's the, you know, so-and-so can't next to so -and -so, sit next to so-and-so at a party, and this person can't sit on this side of the table, and this, so, you, so you have to map out all those things, right? Yes, sir. I'm guessing you scored pretty high on the LSAT, didn't you? I, I, I scored pretty well. I mean, I got a scholarship to law school, so... So for a test that serves your interest for getting into law school, you have no problem using logic and reasoning, do you? I mean, I managed to score on it. I hated that test. I know I, I did not miss a single, um, there's a uh, logic games section. I think I missed one question on that out of 25. And I think the reading comprehension was also something like that. So I think the lowest score was actually on the logical reasoning. And yet, somewhere before the time your husband had a stroke, logic told you that you should use ice in a hot bath. Is that, is that your testimony? Yes, sir. But then after that, you do acknowledge that it was cold and or ice baths. Yes, sir. And that you encouraged Paul to pour water on Timothy, didn't you? Just the one day. Just the one day? Yes, sir. Which day was it? The day before he passed away. The day he was dying. Now, not Mr. Johnson asked you some questions about uh, homeschooling and not ever taking Timothy to a doctor. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. And I think you said that the reason you couldn't do that is because you couldn't get your ex-husband to help you out with signing over custody. Do you remember that? Correct. Yes, sir. The truth is you were, by court order, not allowed to have custody of Timothy, weren't you? That's correct. But I was offered the option of either taking him or they were going to put him in foster care. Would have been I better off. I wouldn't want my son in foster care. I don't think anybody would. But there was a court order that said you are not allowed to have custody of Timothy. I'm not talking about a custody agreement. I'm talking about a court order that says you can't have custody of Timothy. Uh, my understanding of the, the order that you're talking about, um, it wasn't that I couldn't. It's just that I didn't get custody that time. Well, well, well. <laughs> huh. I think he hammered home the point pretty well that she treated her dogs better than her son. Because uh, there was hot sauce allegedly forced down his throat. And I'm glad she didn't do it to her dogs. Uh, at this time, ladies and gentlemen, I wish she wouldn't have done it to him either. Back on the record, uh, we're going to have an excuse the jury at this time. Thank you. Ooh, wonder what's happening. What's happening here? Mr. Roberts? Thank you, Your Honor. I would uh, submit to the court that uh, the way that those questions were just answered, it was, a, it was really just a very simple yes or no question. And we covered this, and Ms. Maynard was present when we covered this, and the court was very limited in what it wanted me to ask, and I asked that question. And she tried to explain it away by saying that she was then offered a chance to take custody or have the child go into foster care. 
We know that's not true. We know, and, and I think that gives me fair game at this point to ask her, isn't it true that you are actually subject to a petition to terminate your parental rights, and the only way that was withdrawn was because you agreed to give up and not have custody of Tim? Wow. Sure, John. May I ask my client a question? Did you under did you hear the conversation we had about the custody situation and, and the judge's ruling on that? Yes, sir. What did that what did you think that meant? What do you think his ruling on the custody question, whether you could have legal custody of your child meant? What did you think that meant? Could you rephrase that? Because I, I didn't interrupt that conversation, but while y'all are having that conversation, I mean my understanding of the exit order, the order you're talking about, was not the way it's been characterized. And okay. I mean, from what Mr. Roberts just said, that was not my understanding of, of how that that case ended. Okay. So. All right. So, Your Honor, my response is this: I, I want that that conversation because I want the court to have an opportunity to determine for itself if my client understood the instruction. Clearly, she did not. Clearly, her the way she processes the information is different. And she did not understand that she was not allowed to go into those other details. Uh, quite frankly, she sat right here and she heard Your Honor say, this is how far we're going to go. This was clearly a, a yes or no answer. The rest of that, that, that conversation, those, those responses were, were not, were, I, I would agree with, with people, were not in keeping with the, court, with the spirit of the court's order. They didn't get into a lot of detail, but they clearly weren't in keeping. I would suggest, Your Honor, that my client be be re-explained the limitations of her conversation on that issue and that there be a corrective instruction given to the jury. Uh, I, I would disagree that we've gone so far into it. I think the court stopped, stopped us before we got to that point where, where it, it's opening a door that, that's, that uh, allows evidence in that's more prejudicial than probative. I don't think we're at that point yet. That's my opinion. So I would ask for a a re-explanation from my client as to how far she can go and answer this question, and a, and a corrective instruction to the jury. Mr. Roberts? She, she can't ring the bell, Judge, just because the witness decided to answer the question how she wanted to answer the question. That's like saying, well, I want to take back the answer now because I don't like what, it, what, what happened when I answered it. That, that, that's, that's, it's not fair. It's not fair to the prosecution. She's a law student. She just sat up here and explained how she graduated second in her class in law school and passed this bar of the score of 182. She sat through this entire trial. She's been taking notes. She's been actively participating. She's trying to answer the questions the way she wants to to get her point across. And she wrote judges' opinions as their law clerk. Give me a break. If she didn't understand, I'm sure she would have asked. But she just doesn't understand it now? Plain and simple. And the court's order couldn't have been any more explicit that it was a yes or no question about isn't there a court order prohibiting you from having custody of the kids? I get to come back and explain now why she's sitting here saying that she thinks the order said, well, whatever you want custody back, if you want to take custody or the child goes into foster care, you can do that. All right, well, before I make it. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't make up the court off. I apologize. I, I would just offer the court, I'm prepared for limiting instructions to the jury. But they don't consider this as any type of character evidence or anything of that nature. I think that's perfectly appropriate. But this is this is a mess of our own making at this point. All right. Well, before I make a ruling, uh, I was I didn't hear her exact answer because I was in the middle of trying to look at Mr. Johnson to say maybe we stop this. So before we. Uh, before I make a ruling, I want to hear exactly what her answer was. So I'm going to take a recess. I'm going to look at the record and make a finding. So, yep, we're in recess. Well, that would be interesting. I mean, I know, she, I think she thinks she's driving this bus. I mean, she's repeatedly putting it and driving, driving over her oldest, or her son, Paul, forward and in reverse as much as she possibly can. And it's quite disgusting. And I'm not giving him a pass. All right, we're back in the record in 23. Please don't think uh, that. 110 FC, people versus Shonda Vander Ark. Uh, the... There was an objection before we broke. Uh, it's kind of discussion about opening doors, not opening doors. The parties 
the, excuse me, the attorneys have an opportunity to speak to the court and chambers. Uh, at this time, and I'm just going to summarize our discussion, uh, what the court is going to permit by, I guess, agreement of the parties or, I mean, if it's not an agreement, I'm, okay, I, Mr. Rock, I'm not speaking for you. No, we, we, I think it's fair to say that we've settled on a way to ask the question that I believe everybody, including the defendant, are on the same page. Okay, so essentially the question we're going to ask is, uh, is it true that the order from Oklahoma prevented you or, or only authorized you to have supervised parenting time of Timothy? Is that correct, Mr. Roberts? That's correct. That is that your understanding, Mr. Johnson? It is, Your Honor. All right. Ms. Vanera, do you understand the question? Yes, sir. All right. Mr. Jo or Mr. Roberts, why don't you go ahead and just, I want to make sure uh, before we bring the jury out that we make sure that it doesn't open any other doors before we don't have to. So go ahead and ask the question. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Vanderark, is it true that the last custody order from Oklahoma that involved Timothy indicated you were only to be allowed supervised parenting? Yes, sir. Fair okay. enough. All right. With that, any other thing else before we bring the jury in? Mr. Well, Roberts? No. Mr. Johnson? Well, yes, Your Honor. Prepare. Okay. Please rise. So. <laughs> it's almost like an attorney going, what were they wearing? And they say nothing. And they say, are you sure they weren't wearing black pants and a red shirt? Oh, yes. Yes, they were. I forgot. Uh, yeah. I did not forget. But that's, that's what they were wearing. All right, maybe seated. Ms. Roberts, you can continue. Thank you. Uh, just to kind of put a bow on this and clarify things, Ms. Vander Ark, is it true that the last custody order from Oklahoma that involved Timothy indicated that you are only to be allowed supervised parenting time? That is correct. Now, uh, Mr. Johnson was uh, talked to you about the fact that after Adam had his stroke tragically in January and was out of the home, that that, that was, a, was a significant financial hit for you. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. And uh, as a result of that, you didn't have a lot of income coming in. Um, were you working in New Waco at that time? I was, yes, sir. Um, so you, the, when you worked here, it was not a paid internship. You were working in New Waco for paid internship at that time. Is that correct? For paid clerkship, yes, sir. Right, clerkship. And then what were your other um, what were your other sources of income at that time? Um, which time? Well, it, in January, right after the stroke. Right after the stroke. Um, the rental income that I received from my brother from Oklahoma and then I had I was down to one dog training client um, now you're not suggesting to this jury that you couldn't afford to have food for your kids are you no sir in fact you're we've seen the pictures and you, you don't even show you the pictures of your freezer your oh, refrigerator no. pantry all pretty well stocked with food wouldn't you agree yes sir okay, so you the, sir, so there certainly was a financial ability for you to provide for your children at least in a food sense correct yes sir I bought food first and you're, you're a highly intelligent woman, and I'm sure you're aware of multiple resources available in the community if that ever became an issue, right? Yes, sir. United Way, food pantries, anything of that nature, but, but you never felt the need to reach out to any of those resources, did you? No, sir, because we had groceries covered. Um, you talked about, Mr. Johnson asked you about the motion sensors, and I'm not sure we got like any real sense of clarity about the motion sensors. Um, when we're talking about motion sensors, we're talking about ones that would um, not only go off if, if there was motion, that's what a motion sensor is, obviously, but would give some type of audio alarm, right? Uh, some of them did, yes, sir. And um, Timothy had very sensitive hearing, didn't he? I was not aware of that, no, sir. That's When Paul said that yesterday, that puzzled me. You didn't know about that? You didn't know he had surgery to put tubes in his ears? I was there for the surgery for his tubes, but no, I mean, it was... At least my experience with Timothy was half the time he didn't hear what you were saying. So, um, did you know that he found it d discomforting when that when those noises happened? Did you know that that was, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, that was that was a punishment too for those noises to be going on? No, sir, I did not. Um, um, and Timothy was autistic, right? He was on the autism spectrum. Yes, sir, he was on the spectrum. Loud noises, disturbances, things like that. Those are troubling for folks with autism, aren't they? For some of them, but he never, I mean, he, he liked to listen to his tablet extremely loud. Um, and I remember, because um, little man, sorry, I'm trying not to say his name. Yeah. Um, you know, when we'd have thunderstorms, it, sometimes it would freak him out, and it didn't, things like that didn't bother Timothy at all. And Timothy sat with me, okay, go ahead and judge me or laugh at me, but when I 
before the PTSD, I used to watch, when I watched college football, I would scream at the television every play, offense and defense. That's just who I am. And, um, and Timothy was right there with me hollering at the TV. So, so the, the alarms didn't bother him at all? I mean, I wouldn't say that, I mean, they, they bother people, probably some, everybody, but, I, but they didn't, it wasn't, he wasn't overly sensitive to it. Right, because it begs the question, if the alarms don't bother him, what's the point in having them? Right? Yes, sir. And they were there well, as part, it, a disincentive for him to do the things he wasn't supposed to do. It was to let us know he was doing it, too. Right. That way we knew what was going on. But it was, it was supposed to also be, you're yes. not supposed to be doing this, and we know when you're, you're going to be doing yes. this, right? Yes, it was, it was so he knew we would be notified. And the, the doing this that we're talking about is coming out of the basement area of the home, right? Coming upstairs in the middle of the night, yes, sir. Coming upstairs in the middle of the night? Yes, sir. So, so these would only be active at night? I only turned them on at night, yes, sir. So there's no text messages in there about turning on the motion sensor during the day so we can't come upstairs? I, I mean, I don't recall it, but... But you wouldn't, if those are in there, you would agree with me then that you were using the motion sensors to keep him downstairs even during the day, right? If, I mean, if it happened occasionally, I'm do, just... Do you remember the text exchange about turning off the alarms so that he can go to the bathroom and then turning the alarms back on after he's done going to the bathroom? Do you remember those? That was read the other day? Vaguely, yes, sir. Well, I'm sure you remember them from being read the other day. Do you yeah. remember sending those text messages? No, sir. No memory of those text messages? No, sir. And you're talking, there's, are you talking motion sensor or there was, there was I'm one. I'm talking motion sensor right now. Okay, the motion sensors are, are still, that's not, that, it, that's different. You're talking about a, a, it was actually for a bike alarm, like for somebody stealing a bike, I guess it was. And you, that was the one that, that was, that you were referring to. The motion sensors that we've been talking about are posted in the house and those don't get turned, those didn't need to be turned on in our office. I see, so the motion sensor where the alarm is the one that was outside, is that what you're saying? The motion sensor with the alarm, the, the one that makes noise, was not one that was in the house? No, they were up, up on the stairs. There was, there was a personal one that you could attach to whatever you wanted to. Right. There was one of those and then there were several on the stairs. I see, okay. And the purpose of the one on the stairs one was to make sure you didn't come upstairs. In the middle of the night, yes sir. Right. And the ones to and you actually the ones that you could attach to a thing you actually attached to a person didn't you? Occasionally, yes, sir. So, the let's talk about the cameras then. Um, well, I guess let me ask you this question. So the motion sensor goes off, the alarm goes off. Maybe it doesn't go off. Maybe it's not one of the ones that have have an alarm on it. So what? How is that a deterrent, or how is that a, a punishment to Timothy? <laughs> so it wasn't what? meant as a punishment. It was to let us know so we could go make sure that he was, you know, he wasn't wandering around. He wasn't getting into taking batteries apart and taking other messing with stuff that he shouldn't have been. So you wanted to restrict his movements, and you wanted to know if he moved out of the basement area whenever the motion sensors were on. Yes, sir. And the cameras are, I, I think you testified that the camera, at least initially, you put the camera in place in, Gabe, in G's room to make sure that he wasn't running around without his clothes on, right? Yes, sir. When he was a toddler, he would strip down. How does putting a camera in his room to show him running around restrict him from doing that? Well, it doesn't restrict it. It was to let us know that he was doing it. And then what? a problem with him running around? He naked? wasn't potty trained. He wasn't potty trained, I see. But other, otherwise, if you're potty trained, it's okay to have your children running around naked? No. No. You wouldn't want to have a child running around your house naked, would you? No. You wouldn't want G to see his brother running around naked, would you? No. And I'm wondering why the text message that you sent to um, Paul about, about Timothy making a mess in the garage was that he had to clean the garage without anything on below the waist, and then he could stand against the wall without anything below his waist. I don't remember that, sir. I'm sorry. You don't remember that text message? No, sir. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> Could you remember, like, take a look how at smart you are. This is from the larger the text messages. This is all the text messages between you and Paul. It's a few hundred, if not thousand pages. Uh, take a look at, this is page 5783, if Mr. Johnson wants to reference. The, tech, this, the blue is your text messages. Can you read that for the jury, please? Okay, the blue one like says, my, big, my bigger issue is that you said you checked every minute or so, but checking on the camera would have told you he wasn't listening. I'm not absolving him of responsibility by a long shot, but there are reasons the cameras are in place. What time was that sent? 
4.14 p.m. it looks like. So at 4.14 p.m. you're upset with Paul because he's not watching Timothy every minute on the cameras, right? If I remember correctly, that particular day, yeah, he said he was going to check. That, that wasn't, I didn't expect him to check every day, but there were days that were much more challenging, and that was when I asked him to keep a closer eye on him. Where is the text message that describes what the challenging incident was that day? I don't know, sir. I mean, there was, it was, there was a lot of challenging incidents. Going upstairs? No, sir. Going upstairs was okay during the day? Um, as long as, the, as he was being monitored, yes. You talked about, we, we talked about the autism already. You talked about a number of other issues that, um, that Timothy had. Bipolar, ADHD. Were there some other ones? Was sensory processing disorder. Sensory process. So he had the same disorder that you did. Yes, sir. The sensory processing <coughs> disorder. Um, but there's different, it's, there's different manifestations of it. He had the one where his senses being overloaded didn't, have, didn't make a problem for him. Is that what you're saying? His was, he was more hyposensitive, which means he didn't, he didn't react the way a typical person would is, as far as less of a reaction. Um, there was a, a time I was told about it when we still lived in Oklahoma. Um, I guess he was being given a bath and he fell and, and hit his jaw and they didn't, he didn't say anything. He wasn't, he didn't say he was in pain. Well, I guess he went to someone's bedroom and my oldest son brought him back out and he had completely bitten through his tongue and not said anything. So he, he did not react as much to stimuli as most people do. There's hypo and hypersensitive, and he was hyposensitive. And is there medication for that that you take? Not that I'm aware of. I don't. Uh, do you go to counseling for, for, for you, or did you go to counseling for, for you? Not for that, no, sir. Um, for any of your other issues, though? I have over time. Right. It's been a long time. Um, but in fact, the entire time Timothy was in the state of Michigan, you never took him to a counselor or a doctor to address any of those issues, did you? No, sir, I didn't have insurance, the insurance information. You didn't reach out to any resources in the community that might have been available to help, did you? I, I did actually contact... Yes or no? Did you reach out to any resources yes. in the community? Which ones? I contacted DHHS about uh, getting on Medicaid, but they said that because he had other insurance, that would be primary, so we still had to have that information. Did you reach out to Community Mental Health, or Health West, I guess it's called now? I didn't. I wasn't aware of it. I, didn't, I, I hadn't heard of Health West until I started working in the courthouse. Right. You worked in this courthouse, in the county that you live in, for at least the entire summer, as I recall correctly, you, and you never knew that we had a, a, a mental health agency here, here in Muskegon County? I didn't realize that's what it was for. I, I honestly, I didn't think about it. I re the only, as far as resources go, the only thing that I thought about was DHHS for things like Medicaid and food stamps. Why didn't you ask? Mr. Johnson asked you about the alarms on the doors, and you, you're... <coughs> Your response to him was that the alarms went on the doors about three weeks before Timothy passed away. Is that correct? Somewhere in there. I was approximating Somewhere it. Somewhere in there. Okay. <clears throat> you can look up the Amazon history on my phone. Well, I'll do you one better than that. <laughs> this is page 3932 of the text message. Bring it to you. Could you go ahead and read that exchange for the jury and the date, please? Uh, did he say miraculously? No, I was... This is huh? Paul's response now, right? Yes. No, I was emphasizing because I turned on the alarm, yet he slipped past. Um, that's not good. We need to put up the other two alarms tonight later on. Hmm. That's the motion sensors. But you referred to the <coughs> alarms. Yes, sir, I did. Right. And that was That's in... what we called them. That was February. February. That was motion February. sensors. Right. Months before he died. Yes, sir. You just mixed up what an alarm and what a motion sensor is? Yes, sir. That's what I called. I called them... Alarms. I didn't call them motion sensors most of the time. Mm -hmm. This one's a little bit longer exchange, but if you could read 3996 for me, please. Just this page? Nope, the whole thing that's stapled. Okay. <laughs> no. All of uh, them, please. Is it snowing at home currently? KK, Timothy apparently ate my Pop Tarts a few days back. Not anymore. Uh, are you kidding me? When did he do that? He said he doesn't know the exact day. Um, that's a bunch of BS, and how did he do it? Did he sneak down to the bathroom? He says it was before we had the other alarms. Um, I said, that's not true because we've had those for over a week now. And you had Pop-Tarts in that box as of this past weekend or Friday at the very latest. 
That's still the motion sensors. Okay, so like again, you refer to the motion sensors as alarms yes, there. And you're upset at that point because Timothy did some pop tarts. Is that my understanding of the text messages? In that case, because he stole them, Paul had, had gotten them for himself and because he stole them. Mm -hmm. And that date, uh, I don't know if we wrote it or not, but you would agree with me that it was, oh, it's on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2022, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now I wanted to take a look at 3702. Crossed out the parts that it's not really necessary for you to read, and just go ahead and tell the jury that date and what's on there. Uh, the date is January 24th. Okay. Okay. Uh, did Timothy have to wash his sheets? Question mark. Yes. I said, Ugh, K, pretty sure that is him pouting over the extra camera and motion sensors. So, and that was in January of 2022, correct? Yes, sir. So no problem referring to the motion sensor in January of 2022, but suddenly, come February, you mix up what an alarm and what a motion detector are. <coughs> yes, sir. Correct? Yes, sir. Like I said, you can check the rules on history. You don't want to revise your testimony about when it was that you started using alarms on the doors? No, sir, because it's in my Amazon history when I purchased those. I normally don't like when prosecutors cherry pick text messages to read. I don't like when either side does it because who knows what's before and after them. But the ones that we've heard read already were horrible. So far, though, she's not blaming Paul yet, as she has been this whole time. You, Mr. Johnson, asked you about... Timothy being on medication for a lot of his issues, is that correct? Yes, sir. And uh, I think you said that when he came to you, you, he was like a zombie, right? Yes, sir. So you decided to take him off those medications, didn't you? No, sir, we didn't. We couldn't get refills. We, well, had, to, we had to get a, a refill through a doctor, and we didn't have a doctor. So your testimony wasn't that you took him off those medications? I said that I wanted to. You wanted to? Yes, sir. At he, least some of them, because he, they were, I mean, he was, he was a zombie. It was horrible. Was you it, wanted to take him off the medications, and it doctor, happened anyway, didn't have insurance. you get refills for him. So you're actually happy that that happened. Not the way it happened, but he wasn't a zombie afterwards. But you definitely did not consult with the doctor before you did that? No, sir, because we ran out. But you, you, and again, didn't reach out to any, the, besides DHHS, didn't reach out to any resources in the community that might have helped you out with a child with such severe emotional issues that you have to use motion sensors and later alarms and locks on things. You, you didn't reach out for any resources before you just decided to stop him taking medication. Before we before he ran out, I, I wasn't aware of, like I said, I, DHHS is pretty much the main resource that I was aware of. Did you ever talk to somebody and say, look, I'm at my wit's end here. I did reach out to resources and talk to the judge that you were collecting for. I said, what can I do to get some help here? Did you ever do any of that? I talked to some friends at work. And they but I didn't ask, up with an idea? I didn't ask for resources. I just vented to them, and nobody suggested anything. I didn't ask. Um, it's rather unusual the way this, this question was answered by you. She said there was one time that your mother-in-law saw Timothy? Yes, sir. One time? Yes, sir. Just the once? Um, after the stroke, yes, sir. Just once in six months was the only time? As far as I remember, yes, sir. That's what I believe. In fact, you went to great lengths to make sure that the grandmother, that's Grammy, that's the person Grammy, you referred yes. to as Grammy, right? Your mother-in-law. You went to great lengths to make sure that she wasn't allowed in your home, didn't you? I mean, that was just because the house was a mess. Did you have some type of tracking device on her to know where she was? <laughs> um, she, we had her phone under our, our phone plan, so I could look up on find my iPhone. Because usually when she was, that way um, Paul wanted to know when she was coming to get Gabriel. Oh, gee, sorry. Uh, let me show you what's uh, page 4284. This is a lengthy exchange, but go ahead and read that for the jury. It's from I believe, March 28th. Before she starts this, her whole testimony on the medication has changed, and I'm kind of surprised they didn't bring it back to her because she told her attorney, the defense attorney, that they couldn't get the refills because she, her ex-husband didn't give her the insurance information, so they weren't able to get refills. And now she just said we didn't have a doctor when they ran out. 
But what we've learned, and uh, apparently she was never supposed to have custody of him in the first place. So the ex-husband should have never sent him back. And she should have never taken him. He'd probably still be alive. But the fact... If a parent loses... Like, you cannot have custody. You did something. She did something. We're, we don't know what that is. But... That's a pretty... Big step for a court to take, I think. To just say you cannot have custody of him again. Um, she was only allowed supervised visits. So there, there's something in her past that for him that made the judge say that, but we don't get to hear what that is. Uh, I thought we were going to, cause she did open the door a little, she cracked it and the judge said, nope. <laughs> he said, no. All right. On to these wonderful, wonderful enlightening text messages that she had with her son, Paul. Uh, soot. Mm. Uh, stupid thing writing on my watch. That should have said good. Uh, Grammy left home about 10 minutes ago. Hopefully she will not beat me there this time, but please have him ready to go. And please keep a very close eye on your messages. I will track her on the app as I head home. Um, hey, I need to, see, to make sure you're seeing these messages. And please make sure his new shoes are on him. Okay, thank you. Um, and do not, do not, do not let Grammy inside. Exclamation point. Yes, sir. All right. Okay, uh, she will probably beat me there, but not by more than a couple minutes. You get clothes on too, please. Okay, uh, go ahead and take Gabriel outside and sit down and stand up against the wall downstairs. You can, it says create the puppy too, but. Um, oh well, and then okay. She should be pulling up pretty soon. Okay, I got it. I'm glad you got it, but you better be outside. Uh, he's outside. Do you want to say goodbye? That's Paul's response back to you, right? Yes. And I said, yes, I do. I'll be there in just a minute. Headed to the car now. How's it going there? He said, good. Already taped the coat rack. I think you can stop there. Um, so you're tracking her movements on your phone as you're driving home. <clears throat> At stoplights, yes, sir. Because you're worried that she's going to see a messy house. Yes, sir. And the solution to that is put Gabriel outside when so that he's outside when she gets there, right? Yes, sir. That was, I'm sorry, I misspoke. That was March 8th, right? Yes, so rather than his grandmother come into the house, into the, even the entryway of the house, in the middle of winter, not middle of winter, on March 8th, your solution was put Gabriel outside, make Gee. sure she doesn't come in. Do not, do not, do not let her in the house. Paul was outside Exclamation with point. I wouldn't, and I've never put him outside by himself. Paul was outside with him. 4044. Stop calling him by his name. Not that you guys <clears throat> haven't said it a thousand times. Uh, please also have some decent clothes on in case I need you to bring a little man out. I'm hoping Grammy does not beat me there. It looks like it will be close. Uh, he said, okay. He said, I will tell you when to take him outside to wait for her. Just please make sure she doesn't leave until after I get there. I haven't been away from Gabriel at night since this all started and I wanted to give him a hug and kiss before he goes. Uh, okay, go ahead and go outside and wait for her. It shouldn't be more than a few minutes before she gets there. Just please don't let her leave until after I get there. Uh, she is almost there. Are y'all outside? I would like a response to that message. Um, question, question mark, question mark, question mark. You might need to make Timothy stand with his nose. It says of against the front door on the inside. Please tell me that you and the child are outside. Seriously, no response. I am almost there, and I'm more than a little upset at the moment. You're upset because at that point you don't know whether or not she's going to come into the house, aren't you? I was upset because I wasn't getting a response. That drives me crazy. It's a pet peeve. I hate not getting a response by a text message. Right. So you better have my child standing outside so his grandmother doesn't go inside. And oh, by the way, put my other child up against the front door with his nose against the wall, right? Because he was in trouble for something. I mean, I don't know what happened before that exchange. <clears throat> Well, then why would you be... What would he do to get punished to have him make sure he's standing against the wall with his nose against the door? That's, that was one punishment. He would we'd make him stand against the wall with his nose. And the reason I had it against the door is because I didn't want him getting into anything. But that he didn't know Paul what he did. Why was he being monitoring. punished? 
Remember, we're not saying you're younger, son. Like, yes. When you yeah, get home, please make sure G space is not a mess and he isn't filthy dirty. And then please get socks and shoes on him and his headphone case in his backpack. And maybe his blue headphones as well. Okay. Uh, also, please watch him, but please have Timothy get those two pumpkins off the front porch and into the trash can before Grammy gets there. Grammy well, isn't supposed to get there until 6.15, but she was early last time, so she might do that again. I hope not. Uh, remember to bang loudly on the door three times, please. I will let Timothy know to listen from here, for you here in the next few minutes. And Grammy may just beat me there again, which doesn't make me happy, but anyway. If she does, do not let her in the house this time. Okay. Work was fun. I accidentally scratched my palm with a knife opening a bag and then cut my elbow from banging my funny bone on a metal carton. That was Paul's response back to you. Yes. Yeah. So that's three text exchange all within a couple of weeks of each other where you are absolutely consistent that you're, the, the boy's grandmother's, the boy's grandmother, G's grandmother, not come into the house. Right? Yes, sir. To the point where you're tracking her phone while you're driving home from work. Right? Yes, sir. I did. I only tracked it when I was stopped. I wouldn't do that while I was driving, but. Well, that makes it better. Now, Mr. Johnson asked you about the uh, leg irons. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. And you said that those were uh, Timothy's leg irons, correct? Or, no, I'm sorry, that they were. Your testimony <laughs> well, she did not. today was that those were ordered by Paul, and Paul would use those on Legos, correct? Yes, sir. Actually, I don't think I testified about the leg. I just, I know that he heard that they were Paul's purchase. I don't think I actually testified about the Legos. I think that was a conversation with police. Well, I'll leave the jury to their recollection of that, but I, I, I remember you saying Legos, and I'm not ashamed to admit the fact that I'm actually a fan of Legos, too, so that's why it stuck out in my mind that you just said it earlier today. Um, but to be clear, your testimony is those were Paul's, those were never used on Timothy, right? As far as I know. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Let's look at that top text message, 5460. <coughs> and I don't just like when you're, <laughs> like if you're watching a police show or whatever, and and the cops say, Do you, is there anything illegal in the car before I search it? Uh, not as far as I know. That's always, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it'd just be easier to say. So her saying, not as far as I know, he didn't use those on him. So that's probably, well, yeah, he sure did. Top two text messages. Again, the blue is you. Uh. Just don't trust the wise the transaction is handcuffs and lead cuffs for Timothy from Amazon. Figured it would be okay to get those right away till we can talk about the sensors and stuff. If not, please say so and can cancel the order. Okay. I don't remember that. You, you don't remember that message? Yes, sir, I don't. Wow. You really do have some memory problems, don't you? <laughs> yes, sir. Common with PTSD. <laughs> Page 58, 29. If you could read that last text uh, there at the bottom and then continues on to the next so page. That's so awful. Uh, he has moved around, so he got the cuffs in front of him instead of behind him. Go ahead and flip the page and read the next one. I knew that was coming. Uh, I put the cuffs back behind him. I will have to deal with less than two hours of sleep today, but not letting him get away with this BS. I put the cuffs back behind him. That is your text message. Yes, sir. So you use handcuffs on Timothy? I don't remember, honestly. You don't remember using? No, sir. And you said that the transaction, the wisely transaction, was the leg cuffs and handcuffs for Timothy. That was your text message. That's what the message said. Is that the I don't know as well? You don't remember that one either? There, between the time of the stroke and Timothy's passing, there's, I don't remember a heck of a lot. But somehow you can remember when the police ask you about the leg irons and the cuffs, you say those were for <clears throat> Paul for a TikTok video, right? I, I think that's what I told That's them. what you told the police? Yes. So you don't remember things, but you have the wherewithal to make it look like, no, no, those don't involve Timothy. Those, those were Paul. It's pretty self-serving, isn't it? Objection, I'll withdraw the last part. You had the wherewithal to say that the, like, the, the cuffs that they found belonged to Paul when your text message indicates they were actually for Timothy, right? Apparently, yes, sir. Mr. Johnson asked you about the zip ties. You remember? Yes, sir. Do you ever use zip ties on Timothy? Uh, to attach the um, the personal sensor. 
Okay. And then I, I, I remember hearing about a conversation about them, yes, on text. I don't remember it, but I, I remember hearing about it when it was read. You remember hearing about a conversation. Did, did, that, did, did that make you stop and go, oh my, oh my goodness, we can't be putting Timothy in, in zip ties? Yes, I mean, that's what I thought here. Yes, yeah. sir. Sure, okay. Well, then this, uh, if you care to read the bottom of 42.27, that's Paul's message to you. Uh, oh, this is from earlier. He just won't listen or does something I didn't tell him he could. He just tried claiming his zip cuffs were too tight when I didn't even tighten them to where there's no room for his wrists. This is your response now. Yeah, leave them as they are, and I will check them when I get home, and you can tell him that. And if he lied about that, he gets himself in even more trouble. Do you want me to keep going? No, that's fine. Leave them as they are, and I will check them when I get home. <laughs> You want to revise your earlier answer to the question when you said that you would have said, oh, no, don't use zip cuffs on Timothy? I don't recall that, sir. I'm sorry. Don't recall that either? Huh? No, sir. Good. Um, you, you seem to be having a lot of difficulty in when it comes to the text messages that are talking about the things that you either did or want done to Timothy. Um, is, is that where the, the, the memory issues kick in for you? It's most of what happened. It's not just text messages. It's... And it doesn't just involve him. It's, I mean, the events of the whole six months are. So if, if so, all the other text messages that are just about, you know, hey, how's your day going, or get your bike tire fixed, all those types of things, those are all clarity moments, right? So, you know, I, I don't. Issues with... I don't know if I. Rem I mean, if you showed me, I don't know if I'd remember them or not. Honestly, that's we sent a lot of text messages. No, but I'm, what, what I guess that was a clumsy way of asking that question. You're certainly capable of engaging in a conversation with Paul that's not about anything for Timothy, right? I mean, I would assume so. I don't, I mean. You don't as know. As far as memory goes, my, my memory of those is not. Um, I'd say you don't anymore because well, he doesn't just, talk to you. Let's see what your explanation is for this. So we're, this is 5785. This is June 21st of 2022. This is a week or so after that picture, and we'll get to the picture in a minute that you say that you never saw. Go ahead and read your text message to Paul. Uh, four with hot sauce that he has to eat, and he has, has allowed another four without, it says house sauce, but he has to do the hot sauce one first, and then set a timer for 30 minutes before you can eat the others. What time is that set? Uh, 8.05 p.m. To the, to the second, please. Uh, 18. Okay. What's your next text message? Um, 8.05.47. 30, 30 seconds or so later. Yes, sir. I was using Siri because yeah. I was driving. Yeah. You could tell by the issues with the text message. Sure. I found enough in change to get Gabriel some chicken nuggets and french fries from Burger King. It's like three bucks total. So we will be home as soon as I do that. You remember sending the hot sauce text? I don't remember sending either one of these texts, sir. Don't remember sending either one of those? No, sir. I don't. But you can process that Timothy needs to eat some bread with hot sauce on it. But you scrounged up enough change to make sure that G gets some chicken nuggets and fries. We Within 30 seconds, processing that all in your mind, sending it all out in a text message, right? Apparently, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Like I said, he's Siri. Uh, Siri figure it out for you? Let's talk about the photograph. It's... Ah, uh, this is... <clears throat> I'm glad we haven't been able to see these. People's 36A. Uh, Mr. Johnson asked you about it, so if you remembered the text exchange, <coughs> including the photograph of Timothy, right? Yes, sir. And just, oh, I, the jury's seen that a couple of times. I don't think they need to see it again right now. Let's go ahead and read the they exchange They probably don't want there. to. Starting with the message that Paul sent to you with the photograph. Um, Timothy tried to sneak food. I yelled at him, and then he became momentarily unresponsive, and then I saw this. He's bone thin, Mama, I think. I think we need to actually feed him. Okay. And what's your response to that? I said, Kay, give him bread, please. And then I said, I hear you. Give PB sandwiches and water. You want me to keep going? Yeah. Okay. The unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. Okay. And go ahead and move to the next page. Uh... Also, it's no wonder he's hardly capable of standing. Then that's the one with photographs of his legs, right? Yeah, and then I said, I'm in court. So is it really your...
And those are the ones she said she couldn't go back and look at. Because she just didn't have any idea how bad it was. That's what her testimony was earlier. She has no idea. She has no idea about a lot of things. Or she can't remember. Or it's Paul's fault. It's never hers. She bought her young son chicken nuggets and he gets bread with hot sauce. I, 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 uh, by the way, I do not like this process. This prosecutor has been good, but his little arrogant walk back to the uh, podium as he, after he gets her with the text message is a kind of annoying. Just, <laughs> and, his, and his little arrogant tone is getting a little annoying. He's got her. She's, she's kind of screwed, I think, unless the jury is buying this. Uh, if they are, then uh, I don't know what to tell you about them, but I hope they are not. I'm, I mean, I guess I'm not, so that's why I hope they're not. This is horrible. She's horrible. Your testimony that you never saw that photograph? I do not recall seeing it. I didn't quite don't want to. I feel like I want to throw up. I bet. I bet. You don't recall seeing the photograph, right? No, sir. The unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. You literally use the word see in your text message about see what you mean. But your testimony today is, I didn't, I didn't look at the photograph. I didn't see the photograph. Yes, sir. That's, I mean, it's a phrase that you use. It's a phrase that you use? I see what you mean? Yes, sir. Isn't that usually when you see the things that the people are talking about? Sometimes. Mm. I'm wondering why your response to your son saying that your other child is bone thin and needs to eat, actually feed him. That's the phrase actually feed him, right? That's what he said, yes, sir. Right. And your response to that is, okay, give him bread, please, or bread with peanut butter. Is that right? Yes, sir. Not, oh, my goodness. This is, if he's that hungry, yeah, make him, a, make him some chicken nuggets, make him some pizza, make him some pizza rolls, make him any one of a dozen or so things that were in your freezer or your refrigerator, any of that. But that wasn't your response, was it? No, sir. I was, like I said, I was in court. I just was scrambling for an answer. You were in court, but you were able to send one, two, three text messages before you said you're in court, right? Yes, sir. And the first answer you come up with to feed your child was give him bread? I don't remember what I was thinking at the time, sir. I just know that I was distracted because I was in the middle of stuff with court. But not so distracted that you can say, well, the unresponsiveness is probably fake, but I see what you mean. Like, I don't know how, I mean, I don't know what was going on when that was sent. Mm -hmm. I honestly don't. Oh, uh, he was dying. Mr. Johnson Slowly. asked you about the hot sauce that you uh, ordered, and we saw the bottles of hot sauce. Those weren't <clears throat> those weren't just ordered from Meyer, were they? No. You had to special order those, didn't you? On Amazon, yes, sir. Um, I think you said the reason that you couldn't just get those from Meyer for your grocery delivery things is because they just didn't have hot sauce, right? No, they didn't have that type of hot sauce. That type they of have hot sauce. Hot, hot how did you, sauce. How did you conclude that that was the type of hot sauce that Timothy... How do I put this? Both loved and got to be used as a punishment. Because <laughs> the, the hot sauce that I had and the ones that I could access on the apps, he, could, he loved those hot sauces, so. So you had to go out of your way to find one even hotter, one that he didn't like. Yes, sir. But you said he couldn't get, uh, he loved spice. Like he, he couldn't get enough. And the, the hot sauce started as Paul's idea? Yes, sir. How do you come up with the idea to do hot sauce if Timothy likes hot sauce? Um, well, he said that, that if he, I guess he'd read something, if I remember correctly. I don't, I mean, this, the conversation's not, I mean, it's vague at best, but um, from what I remember, he'd said something about, he'd read something about something really hot, some new something. He's like, oh, this might be an idea to do it with a, a sauce that he doesn't like. So you tested out other hot sauces before you got to that point, and because he didn't react, you figured, let's just keep increasing the heat? Is that it? No, the, I mean, I don't remember which, I mean, how, how many I ordered, but I just went with something that was, that, was super, that was hotter than what I could get. So you tried to punish him with a lower hot sauce, but he, he doesn't respond. So then you increase how hot it is, right? I didn't try with the lower because he already knew he liked the lower hot sauce. <clears throat> how did it even occur to you to be a punishment for him for, to find one even hotter then? How is that even a punishment if he likes hot sauce? He never liked even the hot sauce, did he? Huh? Yes, he did. 
He, he, he ate spicy food. You heard, you you heard know, Paul's like when testimony you forced him. I did. And you heard him say that he never wanted to eat those slices of bread with the hot sauce on it, didn't you? You heard that testimony. That's what he, I heard him say, yes. And, and, and your response to that in a lot of these text messages was make sure you use even more hot sauce than <clears> you did before, right? If that's what you say the text messages say. Well, you just read the one that said he can have four, and then he can wait 30 minutes, and then he can have some without hot sauce on it. You read that one, right? Yes, sir. But again, you don't remember sending that text message. No, sir. But aliens didn't take a hold of your phone and... Well, I sure hope not. She wouldn't answer this question, but I want to know the 30 minutes, because in my mind, it's to make sure he didn't throw it up. And then he could have something normal. Normal. Also, I'm sitting here thinking, if you just needed something so hot, we'll just go get one of those super hot chips that they... I guess don't make any more or have to make them different now. Didn't somebody die from eating one of them or burn their mouth really bad or something? I don't know. I've never had one because I don't like to feel like I'm on fire. But yeah, the prosecutor got her there. He loves, you've said, he loves hot sauce. He loves spicy food. He ate a whole bag of hot Cheetos with ever not ever taking a drink. So he loves this, and you're using this as punishment. But you can't use this as punishment. You had to keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and pushing it until you found one that was going to melt his face off. Did that one work? Oh, and you didn't like the pictures? Did you count his ribs? Because the medical examiner did through his skin. Take over your body or anything like that, did they? No, sir. No. Mr. Johnson didn't ask you, so I'll just go ahead and ask you. You used a number of other physical methods of punishing Timothy, didn't you? Define number. Yeah, okay, fine. Two. Define number? You made him do wall sits. Uh, one time, and that was Paul's suggestion as well. He said, of oh, this, this used to drive me crazy. Um, I guess he said that, Paul said that his dad and stepmom had used that as a punishment with him. And so we decided to give it a try, and Timothy could have cared less. He, uh, he what? Couldn't you have could not have cared less. No. Thank you. So, so being made to stand as if there's no support under your legs, he was he was okay to do that. I mean, how I, long did you have him do it for? A couple of minutes. A couple of minutes? Yes, sir. When was that? I don't remember honestly. And running the stairs. Yes, sir. You had him do that a lot, didn't you? I wouldn't say a lot. I, it was some. In fact, there was one. There's one text exchange in here where you talk about make sure that. He does it a lot, even if it's raining and cold outside, right? That's what the text says, yes, sir. And Paul talks about doing it chasing style at one point, where he follow, he chases him up and down the stairs, right? Yes, sir. And the stairs we're talking about are outside. Yes, sir. They're not inside. No, they're out back. So cold, rainy, yep, go go run the stairs outside. What what did he do? what was the awful crime he had done to warrant doing that? I don't remember, sir. Doesn't that just kind of sound like she's, he's getting punished so much so she can't remember. It's not like it's out of, he did something and so she did this punishment because of, he did something so extreme so she did something extreme. She can't remember what he even did to get these punishments, supposedly. Her memory is not the best as she's showing us. She's making it sound like, well, that doesn't happen very much, but I don't know what he did. In the direction of page 6011, bottom text. I wonder how it would feel to have that hot sauce on your private parts. I'm not saying yeah, touching it or not at all, but dripping a little bit there is that horrible. Yes. Did you have to ask that question? I wouldn't think so. I don't know what that. I can't even imagine saying that. But you did. I know, but I can't even imagine it. About your child, right? Who at that point was in the middle of an ice bath that had lasted at least two and a half hours at that point, right? What, are you asking if I said that? I'm asking you if you said that when your child was in an ice bath for two and a half hours at that point in time, 
because this is 425 in the afternoon and you're watching on the camera from work and texting with Paul about what he's supposed to be doing with him, with him in the tub. That's, right? I, I mean, if that's what was, was, I, I don't remember. I, if that's what it says, I'm not arguing that. I'm not trying to argue that. I'm just saying I don't know. It just popped in your head today. Yeah, I wonder what hot sauce on your private parts would be like. That. I have no idea where it came from. I have no idea. Did you ever try that hot sauce? No, I don't like food as spicy as mm. okay. About the hottest I can handle is um, jalapeno cheddar Cheetos. I'm, I'm with you there. I can't handle hot sauce either. So you never even, but administering it as a punishment multiple times, you thought was okay without even trying it yourself first. Yes, sir. I have a very weak stomach. And so I didn't want to throw up. <laughs> well, you poor thing. Um, let's talk about the ice oh maker my for gosh. a second. Uh, People's 31 and People's 32. Yes, sir. You recognize that as the ice maker? Yes, sir. It's the countertop ice maker. Right. You said it makes about a cup and a half of ice? Yes, sir. Right? This is a cup and a half of ice in your mind? No, I've measured it. I actually used it to, um, you can get, I don't know if you've ever had a frappe from McDonald's, but, uh, Walmart sells a powder mix that you can you add uh, milk and ice to. And it's really good, and it's only like a dollar, three dollars at McDonald's. And so the, it calls for, I, for some reason, I want to say it actually calls for more than a cup and a half, but that's all I could get up with. But yes, that's in a measuring cup, like don't a sitting up her. measuring cup. It's a cup and a half. That's I've all seen one does. of those. I don't believe her. And the. Uh... I think your testimony earlier was you didn't know that ice was being used. Is that right? As far in as the what? cold baths. Not unless it was specified. I mean, there was there was there was sometimes where it said cold and sometimes where it said ice. I didn't say I didn't know it was being used. Yeah. It was if it if it was cold, it was supposed to be just cold. But all you would use would be the ice. What she said was. That she was putting ice in there to cool down the warm baths, like the water was too hot. Instead of just making, instead of just making sure the water didn't get too hot, supposedly she was just cooling it down with the ice. In the beginning, who knows? She doesn't know. She's not been consistent at all. That was that you get out of the ice maker. You wouldn't make any more ice and put it away and no. store it up so we could have extra for the next day, would you? Not that I remember ever doing, no. Okay. Page 5823. I have a feeling we might learn differently okay. here. For all your text messages. Um, oh, yeah, I know, but I wasn't nice tonight either. It made me feel horrible, but no way was he getting away with that crap. Um, let him know that if he tries to sleep at all, he'll get another ice bath sometime before you leave for work and another when I get home. Um, and I said, might want to toss that, the ice that is made into some Ziploc bags in the freezer tomorrow for if we need a bunch more. You want to change your earlier answer? No, because we never did it. Not that I, I mean, you can ask Paul, you can recall him, but I don't remember ever tossing it. But your suggestion to him was, hey, we need to be ready to make more ice and using the ice baths, right? That's what the text message said, but we never saved the ice. So that was your intention, was to have a backup plan if you needed to have more ice, right? That's what the text says. And that was Mar That was June 27th, or excuse, yes, June 27th. That was about a week before Timothy died, right? Yes, sir. And that's about two weeks after you sent the text message with the picture that you didn't see. Yes, sir. Mr. Roberts? Yes, sir. Uh, can you sidebar, please? Sure. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know what, what keeps happening with these two, but we keep having to get sidebars. Please, I used to do this in private practice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as much as I, I always, I used to do this in private practice, it was always tough to take breaks during examination, but as much as I hate to do it, uh, I think it's a good time for a break right now. We've gone uh, over an hour and 45 minutes, so we're going to take a 15, eh, a little bit shorter than 15 minute break. And uh, come back at three. Okay, let's see if he's going to talk to the attorneys. I will say this judge takes a lot of breaks because there's a lot of sidebars. All right, let me see it. 
Uh, anything for the record before we break, Mr. Roberts? No. Mr. Johnson? No, sir. Thank you. Uh, we are in recess. She's a tiny little thing, isn't she? She looks tiny up there in that chair. Attorney's like, you're, you're doing horrible. <laughs> you're doing horrible up there. Oh, I don't know how he brings it back around because he has not asked good questions. He asked horrible questions with the medical examiner. I don't even know why he asked any. It wasn't anything for him to ask. Van Ark, I think we're just finishing up. I was just talking about the ice bath with you. And again, your text was, let him know that if he tries to sleep at all, he'll get another ice bath sometime before you leave for work and another when I get home. So let's let's break apart that sentence for just a moment if we can. And that was on March 27th. All right, so yeah, about nine days or so before Timothy passes away. Let him know that if he tries to sleep at all, let's start there. This is at three o'clock in the morning. You're saying he is not allowed to go to sleep, right? Yes, sir. So 3 o'clock in the morning, your 15-year-old child is not allowed to be sleeping. And if he does, he gets an ice bath, right? Yes, sir. And he'll get another ice bath, i.e. there's already been an ice bath prior to this text being sent, correct? No, sir. That, that was, it would be one and then another is what it says. Okay, well, let me read it again and make sure I, maybe I've misread it. Let him know that if he tries to sleep at all, he'll get another ice bath sometime before you leave for work and another when I get home. There's two anothers in there, isn't there? Yes, sir. The first another refers to the first ice bath. In other words, there's already been an ice bath, right? I mean, I don't know. It's I'm maybe not, not that the, day. The, what's in the text, but I don't know. Okay. And then sometime before he before Paul leaves work, he, he'll get another ice bath, and then another one when you get home. So two ice baths, in addition to the one he's already had, right? If that's what it says. And that's for the crime of sleeping. I don't know what the, uh, the original, whatever happened before that. But you know what it was to, to get to not do another one, right? Yes, sir. Let him know that that's if he says. tries to sleep at all. That's what it says, yes, sir. Yeah. Might want to toss the ice that is made into some Ziploc bags in the freezer tomorrow for if we need a bunch more. I think that kind of speaks for itself. We'll move on. Let me show you an exchange um, from May 9th, 2022. This is pages 5348. 5348. Sorry, 5347. <laughs> I thought he was going to say 5348. <laughs> Start at page 5340, and this is from May 9th. I don't think you need to read the top one. That's Paul's message. Go ahead and start reading there. From May 9th, 2022. Um, what is daddling anyway? Um, please make sure Timothy goes into his room with the alarm on when you leave. I should be home not too long after you go, as long as you, as long as you before you go. And please let me know where you put the alarm when you leave. All right, let me stop you right there. This is May 9th. And again, you're referring to an alarm, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. This Go is... Ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I know just, what that's referring just, to. Let's keep going. Okay. KK, thanks. Uh, YW, you're welcome. Um, I logged out of that for you, but you will not be allowed to have any devices tomorrow before work unless you manage unless you manages to get everything done I assigned to M standards, which will not be easy. <coughs> I'm not sure what part of Timothy going nowhere but the bathroom without being watched closely but he stole a bunch more of the Easter basket today and hid the wrappers behind the washer and dryer because he obviously wasn't washed as he should have been. Okay, so at that so at this point on May 9th, you're saying that Timothy needs to be watched if he goes everywhere except for the bathroom, right? He needs to be watched, yes, sir. For committing the crime of what? So like uh, Paul was in trouble We had there. a combined Easter basket that year, and so I had divvied it out between everybody, and he stole some that was... Gabriel, uh, Butch, cheese and... Uh, I don't remember if it was Paul's or mine, but he's 
he had already had his portion of it. So taking candy from an Easter basket means that, that he gets watched and can't have any privacy anywhere except the bathroom, right? Yes, sir. Okay, keep going. Um, that I it was a star. What part of watching Timothy closely was unclear? Sheesh. Let me stop you right there. What okay. part of watching Timothy was unclear? Why was it that you believed at that point that Paul wasn't watching Timothy? I was correcting. It's the little star. I was correcting what, um, where was it? Usually, if I use the star like that, it was for um, to correct something that Siri messed up or something I messed up. I don't know. I'm not sure. I've only got these messages. I'm not sure. Okay, but but the, the part that you read there said what again? What part of watching Timothy closely was unclear? Sheesh. Okay, so you were upset at that point that Paul wasn't watching Timothy closely enough, correct? Yes, sir. And the only way you would know that Paul wasn't watching Timothy closely enough is if you were also watching Timothy closely enough, correct? I don't know at that point. I don't know if... Somehow I found out about the Easter basket. This is well. This is hold on. <coughs> okay, yeah. This was we must have been in a baseball game. It was 6:20 p.m., 6:43 p.m. So yeah, I must have been watching him from. So you're in a baseball game for G, and and you're watching Timothy, Timothy and yes. Paul to make sure Paul's watching Timothy closely enough. Correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you remember all this text exchange? No, sir. I don't. You don't remember this at all? No. Okay. Go ahead. Keep reading. Okay. Okay. There's no way that was today, Mama. Don't blame me. He that's literally. Paul, right? Yes. Sir. I mean to cut you off, but that's Paul, right? Yes, sir. Okay. He literally never had the opportunity to steal anything. I made sure of that. Now, the response to that is, uh, when he was putting clothes on my bed, he did actually, and watch it's ye tone with me. Should have been the, not ye. Right. Um, so you knew that Timothy had done something when he was putting clothes away. Yes, right? sir. And the only way you would know that is by monitoring the cameras, right? Yes, sir. Um, I never gave him permission to even set foot in your room. I swear he must have done it when I went to the bathroom. Okay, keep going. He's trying to get me in trouble here, this Mom. This is all Paul, right? Yeah, this is okay. Paul. And I told him to go to his room when I did. I brought him downstairs with me so his sneaky butt escaped. I watched him go into his room. And what's your response there? We uh, I said he never. He said he never asked, but I've mentioned before you need to take him downstairs when you go to the bathroom so he can't escape. Right, yes. Let me just. Okay. That's. I think we can stop there. You don't remember sending these text messages. No, sir. No memory from this time period. No, sir. Because of all the blackouts, all the tunnel vision, all the PTSD, right? Yes, sir. Okay. He said he never asked, but I've mentioned before you need to take him downstairs when you go to the bathroom so he can't escape. Escape. That was what you said, though, right? Yes, sir. You actually used the phrase escape in relation to your 15-year-old child. Apparently, yes, sir. As if he was some prisoner. No, sir. Well, who else needs to escape but a prisoner? I'll withdraw that. May 9th, right? I, it's, yeah, that's what it said. You don't remember that at all? No, sir. When was Mother's Day 2022? I don't remember, honestly. If I told you it was May 8th, would you have reason to doubt that? No, sir. Not at all. I believe you. Mr. Johnson was asking you, uh, and you careful. were very eager to tell him about something that you remembered happening on sometime just after Mother's Day, right? Correct. That Timothy got on a scale and weighed 108 pounds. 104. 104 pounds. I'm sorry. I'm glad you corrected me. I wrote it down as 104 pounds, right? It's amazing your memory is that good that you can remember what your son weighed sometime after May 8th, but you can't remember talking about having him escape. Would you care to explain that to the jury? Yes, sir. That happened with the PTSD, with everything else that was going on. I would, especially when I got stressed, it would, the, the tunnel vision, and I mean, I can't, for lack of a better term, blacking out. Um, it, pretty much any time my stress level went up, and it, I mean, it wasn't up that day that, that we did the weigh the dog. So you can't remember all of these text messages about the ice baths and the hot sauce and the zip ties and the handcuffs, but you remember over 18 months ago that your son weighed 108 pounds sometime after Mother's Day of 2022, correct? 104, yes, sir. 104. You, well, it you was, got it down. You're right. He 104 made, pounds. Well, he made a, a comment that... And are you not just stressed out of your mind right now? Because I would be. Yeah, it's a bad pause for her, but I don't care. So, how much stress do you have to be under before you get to the 
tunnel vision and the passing out or blacking out or whatever hits you. Because I'm pretty sure you're in a pretty high stress situation right now. And if he weighed 104 pounds, May 8th, he weighed 69 pounds, July 5th. I don't know anybody that loses weight that fast. It just even on a things two like that will stick out to me sometimes. And when when he couldn't pick the dog up, bear in mind this is a service dog in training, so he's he's used to being getting commands. And Timothy, I remember he put his hands on his hips and looked at Sharma and said, "Next time you get to pick me up." And the dog tilted his head like I don't understand that command, and it just that struck me. It sticks in my head. I don't know why, but that sticks in my head. What day was it? I don't know what day of the week it was, sir. It was during the week. But how long after Mother's Day was it then? I don't remember, sir. I know the reason I know it was after Mother's Day is because um, mom, my mother-in-law, for a for probably the last four or five years, as a Mother's Day gift, has given me um, cherry tomato plants and then miniature cucumber plants, and I keep them in like plant bags. I normally have a black thumb, I admit it, but I've managed to keep these. Um, alive pretty well, um, and I had just when we came when I came upstairs to weigh the dog, I had just gone downstairs and checked on my plants. So the plants were outside then. So I know it was after Mother's Day. I just don't know when. Plants never missed a feeding, though, did they? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I take back what I said. It wasn't May eighth. It was sometime after Mother's Day, which I he said was on May eighth or ninth. So still, not a lot of time from this guy to go from one hundred and four to sixty nine pounds and die and I hate what she talks about her dogs because they're Great Danes and I have Great Danes and she should have never she didn't deserve to have a Great Dane or two because they're great dogs and she's not a good person I'm gonna know about it she's, she's proud of herself and she's been plants a lot Mr. Roberts says it's no relevant question so sustain so your That's testimony is kind of you weighed 104 pounds sometime after May 9th, correct? Yes, sir. That doesn't look anything like 104 pounds, does it? Ooh, yes, you could see that. That's not even a month. That's barely a month after May 9th, isn't it? Yes, sir. I lose weight very quickly. I'm assuming you got that from me. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're again, right. The response to this was give him bread, right? If that's what the text message says, yes, sir. But but not through genetics. <clears throat> Mr. Johnson asked you about the, uh, some text messages back and forth between you and Paul during the ice bath the last day, the day before Timothy dies. Um, and you were observing that ice bath from work, right? I glanced in on it. I wasn't observing the whole time. I, didn't, I couldn't. You weren't observing the entire time? Not the entire time. I glanced in on it. Whenever you'd send a text message, you were also looking at the camera, weren't you? No, I wanted Paul to think I was. You were kind of specific about things. Mr. Johnson asked you if you remember the text about, honestly, tell me if you think this is all fake. Remember that? Vaguely. You vaguely remember that text? Yes, sir. So you can remember the text where it, it, it tries to provide you with a defense to this, but you can't remember any of the horrible things that you did to Timothy. Is that your testimony here today? Yeah, she just nodded her head. I don't have any control over what I can remember and what I don't, sir. You recall Paul's testimony yesterday about what he did in response to that photograph that he sent you and about saying we really need to feed him, Mama? I think we actually need to feed him, I believe, is the actual text. Yes, sir. I remember his testimony. And what was his testimony? That he gave him peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, and I guess he cooked him some eggs. That was the first time you heard about that, wasn't it? Yes, sir. And that was not his instructions, was it? No, sir, but that was fine. I had no problem with that. Well, why did you just tell him to make him some eggs in the first place, then? Because I didn't think of it. I was in the middle of something. I think we actually need to start feeding him, and the only thing you can come up with, instead of Paul thinking to give him scrambled eggs, is give him some bread. That's all you could think of. It's, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I was in the middle of something. I wasn't, I wouldn't have thought of eggs anyway, not in the middle of the day. You said that you would, the, the punishments, and I guess this 3 o'clock in the morning one about not letting him sleep or he gets an ice bath, so he's got to be awake at 3 o'clock in the morning. You said that was because... 
he would keep you guys up in the middle of the night or wake you up in the middle of the night? Yeah, yeah that makes no sense. Can, and again, you did really well on the logic and reason por reasoning portion of the, the <laughs> LSAT exam. Can you explain the reasoning behind keeping somebody awake when they're keeping you awake? To show them how it feels. But they're already awake, aren't they? It made sense to me, sir. That's Now that you ask it, but it, it doesn't seem to make sense. But. It made sense to me at the time. You didn't actually mean that as punishment. That, that was just out of spite. You were just angry with Timothy for keeping you awake, weren't you? No, it was meant as a punishment, sir. <laughs> but it's also a punishment for yourself because you have to stay awake as well, don't you? I don't sleep much anyway. <coughs> yes, sir. Or Paul has to stay awake, right? Yes, sir. Paul's an insomniac as well. You testified that you gave, Paul, you gave Timothy a warm bath the night before he passed away, that last night, July 5th. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. That was the first time you told anybody connected to this case that you've done that, isn't it? Yes, sir. You never told the police officers you did that, did you? No, sir. <clears throat> I imagine a warm bath sounds just like, it's just what it sounds like, right? You, you got him, you took him to the bath, you drew a warm bath for him, and you put him in the bathtub, right? Yes, sir. I think he was already in the bathtub. This is hours before he dies, right? Yes, sir. You look like that when you put him in the bathtub? <coughs> That's gross. <laughs> kind of don't believe her. Sorry. You had to think of, you had to think about that. Do we have a trash can? Yeah. Surely she's throwing it in a trash can and not on the floor. Yeah. Right. Please rise. Oh, sorry, jury. Jury, jury's probably like trying to run. <laughs> I don't feel sorry for. I'm not buying this. Judge is out. <laughs> Judge is out. <laughs> she deserved to have every single one of those pictures slapped down in front of her. And I just don't buy it for a second. She hasn't cried. She's tried. She's tried. And I will be the first person that say to say that if I know that there are times when, you know, if you cry, the police will say things. And if you don't cry, they say things. I'm 100% about that. But if you're talking about the death of a mom, especially a mom's child, and she doesn't shed a single tear, it's telling. And she's tried. She has tried. And hasn't shed one. So, just not buying her. She said she had a weak stomach. And I think she's been kind of up there. Trying, it seems like she's almost been trying to make herself get sick. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. So back in the record, 23110FC, people versus Shonda Vanderark. The jury is secure in the jury room. Anything before we bring them out? Mr. Robert. Yeah, one thing, Judge, my client was shown three exhibits. Can we, for the record, get, get the number of those exhibits that she was shown? Yeah, what were the numbers, Mr. Roberts? I mean, so, right. 34, 35, 33. Okay. 33, 34, and 35. All right, and Ms. Vanderark, you feel well enough to con uh, continue, ma'am? Yes, sir. All right. They were like, rib number one, rib number two, rib number three. You see that, Sir Roberts, you can continue. Thank you. Uh, before we get back to the question I originally, originally asked Ms. Vander Ark, um, you just obviously smells have quite in there a, now. A, a visual reaction there to the jury, a physical reaction in front of the jury looking at those photographs. 
That's not the first time you've seen these photographs, though, is it? No, sir. In fact, you sat in this very courtroom not even a week ago on Friday when we had a hearing about those photographs and looked at those photographs, didn't you? I did not look at them last week, sir. You didn't look at them last week? No, sir, I did not. But you've looked at them before, haven't you? It was, I think it was at the prelim, and I just felt, I gagged that day, too. It just wasn't as bad. Didn't throw up, though? No, it wasn't as bad. So if there's video from that hearing that we had last week where you thumbed through the photographs, including the autopsy photos without vomiting, do you just not remember that as well? We didn't have those autopsy, we didn't have those photos over at our table, sir. You, it won't be on the video, I can promise you that. Well, then I'll return to my original question. Those three photographs depict your son hours after you supposedly put him in a warm bath. Did he look like that when you put him in the warm bath, but for the fact that he was alive? I did not look at him, sir. He was 15. I tried to give him his privacy. It may sound lame, but I, I intentionally look away. That's, that's why Paul did most of his baths, is because he's 15 and I didn't think that was appropriate. So you didn't put him in the bathtub? No, he was already in the tub. I just did, looked. Did you get him out of the tub? Um, I don't remember. I think I think so. Later that night, I would assume so. Later that night, how long was he in the tub? Well, night to me is any time after work. So. Okay. How long was he in the tub? I don't. I mean, I don't think it was long after I got home, but I don't know. And again, you didn't tell the police officers this when they talked to you about what had happened the night before, did you? I, I don't remember. Apparently, I didn't. Well, so you don't remember what you told the police officers? I remember part of it, but I mean, I'm, I, if you say I didn't tell them, then I, I trust your word there. If you told the police officers that you noticed he was skinny, so you made him some bread and put some butter on it and watched him eat three quarters of it and then sent him to bed, is that, does that refresh your recollection about what you told the officers? I mean, I, I hear what you're saying. I don't remember saying it, but. So you don't remember saying those things to the police officer? No, sir. And those things clearly didn't happen, did they? No, sir. How did he get into his room that night? I don't remember, sir. Last page of the text messages. You can go ahead and read that very top text message, please. Please set your alarm for 6 a.m. I ended up dragging him back to a small room because I wasn't going to risk him having access to the tub or other things overnight. He's still trying to be stupid, but I will tell you more tomorrow while I take you to work describing how many different ways I proved that he's still faking. He's still doing it, though. It's beyond ridiculous. <laughs> the only person that's beyond ridiculous here is her. I don't think he... I, I don't think he probably had the strength to get in the tub himself or get out of the tub by himself. She's small. So dragging's probably appropriate way to describe what she probably had to do. But I don't know. They haven't really been clear because Paul's testimony was he was in that ice bath. I thought he said he started it and then he went to work and she got home and he left him in, in there. So he was in there for like six hours. I mean, he had hypothermia for crying out loud. I don't believe he got a warm bath when she got there. And whether you looked at him or not, because you were trying to give him his privacy, you had to, there's no way he was able to walk without help. He was stumbling already and you guys thought he was faking. You kept saying he was faking. He, I, I think somebody, somebody was talking about him him shaking and I don't somebody mentioned seizures but I that nobody's really talked about that so I don't know who that came from Paul may have said that nobody questioned him the poor kid's body was shutting down he was dying he was hours from death I, I just don't believe her She had to know. She had to know. I don't believe her reaction there. I'm glad he called her out on it. And I'm glad he was able to give some why he called her out on it. I don't believe her. I think she got in trouble. I also don't know that I believe she intentionally did anything. And that's where the her attorney is going to keep harping because if she didn't intend to do it, I think what he said, like, 
this wasn't intentional, then it's not going to be first degree. Um, but again, my statement was how many people abuse children, they end up dying and they say, I didn't mean to, I lost it. Or I didn't know it was this bad, or I didn't know it was going to go that bad, or what have you. That happens all the time. I ended up dragging him back to his small room because I wasn't going to risk him having access to the tub or other things overnight. Plan was for him to sleep in the bathroom, wasn't it? I don't remember, sir. I mean, I know that if in the text message, but if that's what the text message says. Okay. And you had to drag him back to the small room. Again, the small room being the closet, right? Yes, sir. Supposedly that he wanted to sleep in. Yes, sir. But you had to drag him there. Why was that? Well, dragging, I mean, that could be anywhere from grabbing hold of an arm and because someone's not being cooperative. That's... And you had to feel him. You had I, to touch I him. a range of things, sir, so I don't know what I was referring to there. He, there would have been nothing to grab a hold of. You've seen of. the video, haven't you? You had to feel that. No, sir. I haven't seen any videos. Do you need your, do you need your memory refreshed about him getting back in the small room that well, night? He really wants to get these in. No, sir. I mean, like I said, I'll take the... I just, I don't remember actually doing it. Did you physically pull him into the room that night? Yes, sir. I mean... And did you set, did you push him down onto the ground so that he was laying and facing the camera? If that's what it shows, then yes, sir. And did you put, position his face towards the camera? If that's what it shows, I... And did you tell him that he owes you the biggest apology on the face of the earth and then maybe he can get out to go to the bathroom? If that's what it shows, sir, I... I don't remember. And did you return a little while later because he had rolled over away from the camera so that you couldn't see him on camera? If that's what it shows, I don't and, remember any of this. And did you tell him you don't need to open your mouth every time you breathe, dummy, and then hold his mouth shut? Wow. I don't know what I said, sir. I mean, I'll take your word for that's what the video Oh, you don't have to take my word for it. Let's play the video for you. Sir, that's not necessary. If that's what you're saying it shows. I believe you. I'm not. So you're acknowledging that the night before Timothy died, hours before he died, you dragged him, looking like that, back into his small room, positioned him in front of a camera, told him he owed you an apology, then came back later because he rolled over away from the camera and held his mouth closed and said, see, you don't have to open your mouth when you breathe, dummy? You're acknowledging you did those things. If that's what the camera shows, yes, sir. You didn't put him in a warm bath that night, did you? Yes, sir, I did. But you have to drag him away from it? If that's what it says, I don't... I know that he, I, I know he had a hoodie on. You said the locks on the refrigerator were there because he got into the refrigerator, and if I heard your testimony correctly, he ate a pound of frozen hamburger? Yes, sir. That was back. And a bag of chicken nuggets? A frozen bag of chicken nuggets, yes, sir. And, and frozen hamburger? Yes, the hamburger was not frozen, it was refrigerated. But frozen chicken nuggets? Frozen chicken nuggets and raw bacon. And raw bacon? Yes, sir. Frozen raw bacon? No, it was in the refrigerator. The, the frozen stuff was the chicken The chicken, chicken nuggets. nuggets, that was the only frozen, yes, sir. Did you think he had an affinity for frozen food? I, I didn't know. The, frozen, the only thing he ate frozen was the chicken nuggets. No pizza rolls. Is that why you sent a text message to Paul while he was in the ice bath at 3.43 that afternoon and said, oh, okay, crazy thought. Tell him if he actually sits up by himself and stays sitting up, he will get some pizza rolls. Don't tell him it's only two, and I'm okay if they are frozen rather than cooked. Why'd you send that text message? I don't know. Don't remember that even either? No, sir. So you're not worried about him eating frozen pizza rolls if he sits up? If that's what it says. You've heard it read several times. Yes, You're not sir. doubting that's what it says, right? Yes, sir. Just another one of those memories that you just just gone from your head, right? Yes, sir. So when you told Detective Pisky that the reason the locks were on the refrigerator is because he would he would get into them and he'd leave the doors open, that was that was a lie, wasn't it? No, that was also true. He did that as well. How does putting the locks on fix that problem? He can't get into it then, so it doesn't get left open. So oh, so, he was so you admit that he was not allowed access to the refrigerator or the freezer or to the pantry? As far as the refrigerator or <laughs> freezer, after we put the locks uh, on. He couldn't get into them, could he? No, not after that. And the pantry had an alarm on it as well, didn't it? No, it didn't. 
We'll move on. We can circle back to that one. Let's talk about some of the other things that you told Detective Pisky. <coughs> You told Detective Pisky that long, long after the stroke happened in January, Timothy went on a hunger strike. That was a lie, wasn't it? Not long after. And no, that was not a lie. That was the truth. He went on a hunger strike. Yes, sir, he did. It, was, it wasn't immediately, but it was within a few days. And uh, a hunger strike is refusing to eat, right? Yes, sir. So he's refusing to eat food not long after your husband has a stroke, right? Yes, sir. Then you don't need to put locks on the refrigerator in the freezer, do you? If he's refusing to eat. He, he stopped. He, he actually he started eating again. He started eating again, so then you decided he's been on a hunger strike. He's eating again, so now we better lock up the food. No, I did the, the locks to protect him because he could have he could have killed himself eating the chicken nuggets. I didn't I did it for him. He did the hamburger or the bacon, but the chicken nuggets, he could, it was raw chicken. Allegedly. Chicken nuggets are cooked, aren't they? They're pre-cooked. Are they? I didn't even think about that. But it's okay if you have to You didn't have to be that scared now, though, did you? Because they're pre cooked. Mm -hmm. That's what you said. February 18th, 2022. Find out what he has snuck right the heck now. Because I know he has snuck all stuff since you weren't doing what you were supposed to. What do you mean you didn't know he was awake? You both should have been awake at 10.30. I am not happy. You know he wasn't just sitting there. Check the brownies in the kitchen. Check everything not locked away. Check where the flipping keys have been. So starting February, you had to lock up all the food. Make sure he's not getting into the brownies, right? And all of the food was never locked. We had it, there's no pictures of it, but one of the, the lower cupboards had um, quite a bit of canned food in it. And he actually would get into that and eat stuff out of cans as well. But there was never there was never a lock on that lower cupboard. I don't know if they. So I, I know they took pictures of it because I showed it to them. So he had access to one cupboard of food. Um, the pantry wasn't locked it, it, the whole time. I know that. But the, there were times the pantry was locked or had an alarm on it, wasn't there? It, it, there was no alarm. I never got one for the pantry. I don't. I mean, I've heard the text messages. I don't remember there being a lock on the pantry, but I've heard. Two twenty-eight. Messages. Check his breath. I can almost guarantee he's eaten something. He was chewing Check on something when he walked breath. downstairs. You and I will be talking about this. On a later date when we're both home, Paul's response, yes, he grabbed some chips. I know. So he wasn't allowed to eat chips on 2.28 at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Couldn't have some chips, right? I mean, it's, I, I don't know what happened in that situation. I've well, you didn't say make sure he didn't get into the frozen chicken nuggets because it might kill him. You said find out what he's been into, and Paul says he's been into chips, right? That's what it says, yes, sir. So I imagine the next text message then is, oh, great, that's fine, he can have some chips. Well, no, the point of it was he was sneaking things. He knew better. Couldn't have chips. It wasn't that he couldn't have chips. It was that he would sneak things. It so was how would dishonest. He, how, would, how would he earn getting chips? He didn't have to earn them. All he had to do was ask. I was trying to teach him not to sneak. He snuck. It wasn't just food. He would sneak in the garage. He would sneak toys. He... he um, snuck around and messed with his his baby brother's homeschooling materials. I've got like flashcards and stuff for him. He messed with those and got them all out of order. Well, oh no. March fourth is around the time that you that, that you acknowledged that he was in zip cups. You, you, we talked about that a little bit earlier, but I don't think we clarified your final text message where you said, you know what, we will start cutting off the ends once they are tight, so he can't do that. Is that one of the can't remember texts too? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. March 19th. Okay, that only makes partial sense. What did he grab? LOL. Paul's response, I don't know, chips or something small he had in his pocket. Okay, let me just re restart it. He's not eating again. That was you. March 19th. Tell him he's just restarted. He's not eating again. So he took chips. So the punishment for that is now he's not allowed to eat anything again, right? If that's, I don't remember, sir. Don't remember that one. Okay. Talking about the punishment outside, um, Paul.
Paul says, wall sits question mark, and then you say, push him until it looks like he is about to fall over, please. That was for running up and down the stairs, wasn't it, on April 14th? Sir, that's what it says, yes, sir. So you wanted Paul to run him up and down the stairs until he was ready to fall over? That's what the text says. What was what crime had he committed to warrant being physically driven until you fall over? I have no idea, sir. April 18th, he managed to come upstairs, yank the locks off of both the freezer and the pantry without you noticing, and he stole a bunch of crap that squished and rattled and did all sorts of stuff, and you slept through everything. KK, no devices until tomorrow, at least my lunch other than messaging, until at least my lunch other than messaging me, which would be very little. Remember that? I don't remember it, no, sir. So, but if the text message said he yanked the locks off the pantry, then there were locks on the pantry as of... April 18th, right? Apparently. <clears throat> 426, almost freaking caught him again. I want all the fruit in the fridge, freezer, or pantry, and those locked. So locking up all the food again on April 26th, correct? Well, the cupboard still was never locked. And what was in the cupboard? Um, canned a bunch of canned stuff. There's a bunch of cans in there. Bunch of cans in there? Yeah. So you're okay with him getting into a bunch of canned stuff? I mean, he got into it all the time. So, so what, do you go to the drawer, get a can opener, open up the can, put it on the stove, warm the stuff up? No, he didn't. He, just, he would eat it straight out of the can. So that is weird. Huh? That didn't worry you? Well, when I discovered it, it did, but I just never put anything on that cupboard. So what, what caused this almost freaking caught him? I want all the food in the fridge and the freezer of the pantry, those locked up, April 28th. I have no idea, sir. Without having it in there, I don't know what caused it. It's likely related to the text before that, isn't it? I don't know. He keeps pulling his arms down, and that doesn't set off the camera alarm, so please watch him for that. Well, why did he have his arms up? He was standing against the wall with his arms on his head. So he'd have to do that for long periods of time, right? Stand there, but he didn't have to have his arms up the whole time, but I'd set a time limit on how long he had to have his arms up. Well, that's big of you. And you're, you're either you're watching or watching an alarm to make sure his arm doesn't go down, right? From the sound of it. The uh, response to you about locking, to, from Paul, about locking up the food, it's just he pulled the pantry door lock. What do you mean he just pulled it? Did he take it off? Paul says, yes, that part that attaches to the wall is dangling right now due to sticky locks. Okay, get another one on it right away. Last I saw, they were on the floor in a bag in my room. And you need to make him run up and down the stairs a ton for that, even in the cold and rain. So trying to take some food, not in his cabinet full of canned goods, and pulling, a, pulling the alarm, the pantry lock off, means he doesn't get food, it all gets locked away, and he has to run the stairs, even in the cold and rain, right? And being deceitful and sneaky. He was deceitful and sneaky a lot, wasn't he? Yes, sir, he was. Did that ever hurt you? It's because he was hungry? He was that way a lot, well before there was issues, well before the stroke. I mean, he, we always had issues with him over that, but his, that his stepmom warned me about that. Well before there were, you said well before the issues. What, what, what issues? Before his first hunger strike, before any of this, he was extremely sneaky. Did it ever occur to you that this is not the way to deal with a person who's been on a hunger strike? Locking up their food, locking up their access to food, punishing them when they, when they try to take food? Did, did, did that ever occur to you with your, your brilliant legal mind, as it was, that that wasn't a good idea? I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. April 27th, Timothy is no longer allowed anywhere near the fridge, freezer, or pantry, or any other place where food is. Now it sounds like he can't even get into his cabinet full of canned goods, right? I mean, that's what it said. We never put it, there was never a lock on that. But he wasn't allowed near it. I right? Mean, if that's what it says, I don't. It doesn't even sound like he that should was, go that in was the April kitchen. April 27th. Just a few days before, somehow he managed to be 104 pounds, which, as we've heard from the testimony this morning, is still a good 30 pounds under average weight, right? 
Um, well, my, my kids are, most of them are slim. Paul is 6'1 and 130. He doesn't even hit the 134 for a 5'8 person. And I lose weight extremely easily. So mm -hmm. he, the, he, at 104, he looked average. February 14th, I may need some help with it, but I am about to get a lock for the pantry door and a lock for the fridge in both freezers. And then we won't leave any food out of those areas, and he won't have access to unlock those. Okay, Paul's response. Your response, if you disagree, please say so, but he is not going to win this. I may need some help with it, but I'm out, about to get a... Oh, it's the same thing. So you were bound and determined that he wasn't going to win and get food without asking for permission first, weren't you? Even no, if that meant locking up all the food. No, sir, I was bound and determined he would stop being deceitful and sneaky. <clears throat> he is not going to win this. Because he was being stubborn. He kept sneaking. He snuck stuff. We found out, actually, it was well before the stroke. Um, Paul discovered it. This was before his first hunger strike. I mean, before anything. Um, Paul went down to the downstairs bathroom one day, and I think it was, I want to say it was at least three cupboards, if not four across. And I guess he'd opened one of the cupboards. And... Timothy had snuck a bunch of stuff. I mean, there was wrappers and cans and all sorts of stuff. He did that. I mean, that was, I don't remember if it was before or after my oldest son's wedding, but it was, it was around that time. And again, your response to all of this, rather than to seek some professional help for him because of these eating issues that he apparently has, is to restrict even further his access to food, right? And then watch his every move on a camera or with a motion sensor or with an alarm, right? My response was to try to, to prevent him from being deceitful and sneaky. April 28th, do you want to have just the one on the pants for tonight? When I leave, you will have to have both of them on so it doesn't get away with anything. So by April 28th, you were putting multiple alarms on his person, weren't you? If that's what it says, I didn't realize I even owned more than one. I only remember ordering one. <clears throat> okay, take off the arm one but warn him that I will count how many times he moves his arm from the camera picking it up, and he'll be doing stairs for that tomorrow. That's at 11 o'clock in the evening on 428. So you're watching to see how many times he moved his arm when he was in his room? How many times he dropped his arm? Was he in his room? I don't know. You I'm tell me. I wasn't there. The wall, All normally... I can do is read you the text message. It says, okay, take off the arm one, referencing back to the alarms, but warn him that I will count how many times he moves his arm from the camera picking it up, and he will be doing stairs for that tomorrow. That he He's not sneaking around there, is he? No, he was up against the wall, and he was supposed to have his arms on his head for a certain amount of time. Okay, so at 11 o'clock at night, Sometimes. he's supposed to be up against the wall, and you want to make sure that it, it, he knows you're going to know how many times he moves his arm, and if it's not satisfactory, he gets to do stairs for that the next day. Yes, sir, apparently. I don't think that water is going to help you through this, but you keep drinking it. April 29th. What did he eat? I ate my burger already. Paul's response, he ate the crust. Do you remember what your response was? I don't remember. I heard it the other day, but I don't remember sending that. I do. I Go remember. Go try to make him throw up, please. Yep. That was your response, wasn't it? If that's what it says. Don't remember? No, I'm put that one in the don't remember category? Like I said, I did. unfortunately, between January and the time he passed away, I don't have a lot of memories in general of Gabriel, I'm sorry, of G, of Timothy, of Paul. I know that there are times that I went over to my in-law's house and there's I don't remember a lot of that. It's not just this. So the crime he committed here, just so we're clear, wasn't, wasn't sneaking frozen chicken nuggets or a bag of chips. It was eating the crust of what sounds to be an already half-eaten burger or an eaten burger. <coughs> and your response to that is, go make him throw up, please. That's what it says. And the crime was, again, it's being sneaky and deceitful. It's, it was never about the, it wasn't about the food. It was because he, <laughs> he, 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 every time we turned around, he was sneaking something. So you're going to force him to throw up and you're going to make his brother do it? That's not good. What's... You go do it. I noticed she, her hands were 
put your tray hands off and all this. And I will give her credit on this one. Paul is very skinny. Uh, so I'll give her that one. But yeah, Paul, Paul had to go do everything. Paul do this, Paul do that. And he did. His life is ruined. And it, maybe he'll get out. I don't know. Don't know what his sentence is going to be. I don't even know if he's going to go to trial on it. He may plead. I don't know. I'm trying to kind of keep an eye on his stuff, but I hope. I kind of really kind of do hope he gets another chance because I think he deserves at least it. I, I if if he can make it through prison, I think he deserves another chance because I do think he was only operating under her orders, and I think he understands. But it wasn't just food. He snuck toys. Like I said, he snuck batteries. So make him throw them up. May 5th, did Timothy work hard enough to sleep tonight so you and I can both get some sleep? He will still have to work super hard tomorrow to earn the same, but wanted to ask about tonight first. you want to explain how that falls in with your statement that the reason he wasn't allowed to sleep was because he would keep you guys awake? I actually do remember that. Timothy asked if he could trade off um, not getting to sleep for something else, and I had him doing chores. You don't help yeah, yourself. I'm packing that sentence, so I think I'll just start at the end. So he had to ask for permission to sleep. No, right? this was just, this was because he had kept us up. Like I said before, he had kept us up, so he wasn't going to get to sleep. And he asked if, if he could trade that punishment for another punishment. How was that not asked, having to ask for permission to go to sleep, Ms. Van der Ark? It wasn't because it was a punishment. It wasn't anything about, he didn't have to ask to go to sleep. Yeah, it's, I'll, I'll do something else if you let me sleep, right? I'm tra it was trading a punishment for a punishment. That's... <laughs> not what you said. May 16th, where is Timothy? Paul's response, sorry, I was getting dressed. Timothy is on a five-minute bathroom timer. Well, four now. And your response, why is he on a five-minute timer? He doesn't get five minutes. He gets 60 seconds unless he needs to poop, then he gets two minutes. He only got to go to the bathroom for one minute or two minutes, depending on what he had to do? I don't remember. I didn't, I don't remember ever enforcing that, but obviously I sent it. But does, doesn't that it strikes you as everything else that happens is just cruel and unusual to tell a child, heck, to tell anybody that you only get a certain amount of time in the bathroom. That that doesn't strike you as cruel. Objective, it's not argumentative. It's certainly an argument that uh, she can answer the question, but certainly the way it's phrased that is is an argument. There's no question there. There's a, it's an argument here. The judge with a question mark at the end. No, I, I really want to know if she thinks it's cruel to put somebody on a bathroom timer. And the relevance of if she thinks it's cruel, the it's, it's simply argumentative. Judge, it, it's it's. Um, I, I don't think it's argumentative. Um, it, it would tend to give some insight, I suppose, to her intent. Uh, if Mr. Why he doesn't want it Johnson, you would like to clarify or have it clarify what her definition of cruel or unusual is, so that we're all on the same page with the witness. That's fine, but I think the. Uh, question can be asked. So the Thank objection you. is overruled. So you, but you, your response to that, well, I, I want my question answered. Is it cruel to make a child go on, go to the bathroom on a timer? Yes, sir. May 17th, before I left, when I was having you sign into the camera and turning on the, sec the sound for the camera so you would hear the alarm if it went off. And by the way, I told him yesterday that if he did that in the garage again, he would sleep in the garage for a night. So let him know that he would be doing that as soon as the temperatures are safe enough for him to make, it, to make him do it. So you were going to have him sleep in the garage for a night. I actually remember that text message, and I was bent. I was frustrated. I never would have done it, but I was frustrated. I, I type really fast, and I, I admit I have a bad habit of saying stuff when I'm upset, and then calming down later, and it being totally different. But I do remember that, and it, it never happened. It didn't happen? What didn't happen? Did, did, did you didn't make him sleep in the garage? No. Oh. Yes, thank goodness for that. Same day, 12.53, did he heat the pancake in a cup? Otherwise, it's just powder, and it's not safe to eat without being heated either. It actually says, did he hear the pancake in the cup? I assume you meant heat the pancake okay. in the cup, right? 
Um, do you remember this test text exchange? I vaguely. And Paul's response, no, he just ate the powder. And your response, that could make him sick, the dummy. Tabasco in his mouth and make him swallow, and lots of it, and do it every 30 minutes until you leave. This was May 17th. Do you remember this exchange? Well, at least it was only Tabasco. I don't remember the Tabasco, because I never called it. I said Tabasco. Tabasco in the mouth and make him swallow, and lots of it, and do it every 30 <laughs> minutes until you leave. I don't remember that being a... I was trying to give her some credit that she only used Tabasco, and she's like, don't be silly. I use the Carol one with the Carolina Reaper and the Scorpion whatever. I use the extra hot sauce that we had to order online because we can't find it anywhere in the stores. Dummy. A part of the, I remember part of the conversation, but I don't remember that part of it. Well, but Jake I, the obviously didn't like Tabasco, did he? We didn't have any Tabasco sauce. That's why it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> don't be silly. Hot we only sauce, had we super hot sauce. sauce. That's what okay, so the punishment for eating pancake in a cup is, to, is Tabasco or some type of hot sauce in the mouth. Is that right? Sneaking something dangerous. Um, if that's what, I mean, if you're asking what he's punished for, it would be for, for sneaking. You were concerned something. for his well-being. Yes, sir. Right. I don't that, know what a pancake in a cup is. Change, right? You're yes, really, sir. You're really concerned for him at that point. Yes, sir. Those pancakes in a cup had, um, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, but I think they had eggs in them. That could make him sick, the dummy. Do you always refer to him as a dummy when you're worried about him? No, sir. You can look at the text messages. I hardly ever said anything like that. Hardly ever said anything like that? It's, it's not a good idea to call a child a dummy, is it? I never would to him. I was frustrated, like I said. <coughs> to him. Maybe just about Later on him. in that same text exchange, Paul says he also crapped himself. And your response is, what? In his pants? Seriously? Paul, I told him to take a five-minute shower. Make him do the work in the garage with nothing on below the waist. Just make sure the garage door stays closed. And then he can stand down against the wall with nothing on below the waist until you leave. Just please make sure G does not go downstairs at all while he's standing there like that. Break that up again. So make him do the work in the garage with nothing on below the waist. So his punishment for having an accident was that he had to do chores without pants and underwear on, right? If that's what it says, I don't remember this. That's pretty humiliating, isn't it? I mean, he was by himself. It wasn't... I would never... I mean, I don't remember this. At I all, mean, sir. I didn't make. I you didn't make G. No, sir. Uh, but you, you did I have the presence of mind at that time. Says just make sure the garage door stays closed because you don't want anyone seeing him doing that, do you? Well, I, I didn't want the garage door open ever because we had a lot of stuff out there. Hmm. So. And then he can stand against the wall with nothing on below the waist until you leave. So, so in addition to cleaning the garage, then he has to stand against the wall with no pants and underwear on, correct? I mean, if that's what it says, I don't, I don't remember this. Please make sure G does not go downstairs at all. Don't remember that either. No, sir. Didn't want, but you, again, you, you physically typed these words into your phone and sent them to Paul to make sure that G doesn't see Timothy like that, right? Yes, sir. Please don't make her throw up again. His that clothes was need to be washed right away, but he gets to be without anything below the waist for a while today. Did he see? Did he say why the heck he did that? And Paul's response is, he didn't, he said he didn't want to disturb anyone. He had to ask for permission to go to the bathroom, didn't he? No, sir, not usually. If he was on the wall, he did. Because he was supposed to be standing still. Just the handcuff transactions, we've talked about that. So. so let's get back to your statement to Officer, or excuse me, to Detective Pisky. Um, I mean, you, did, you didn't tell the detective about the warm bath. Um, but you told him that you realized how skinny he was the night before and threatened to take him to the e ER if he didn't eat. That's not true, is it? No, sir. And you didn't make him a piece of toast and give it to him and make him eat it, did you? No, sir. I have no idea why I said that. I was, I was traumatized. I actually didn't come out of the first month I was in jail. I, it was... I thought she really I did threaten to take him to the ER. That used to work for the public defender's office visited me, and she, she said it was, it was pretty obvious that I was under severe trauma. Mm -hmm. I didn't eat for my first month. This Aww. was, this was while the, you were searching <laughs> breaking my heart while you were sitting in your house. Yes. Mm -hmm. My gosh. So you're thinking, oh, well, I better, better tell him, yeah, he looked a little skinny last night and I thought I should take him to the ER and then make some toast with butter on it and watch him eat it and he walked away. None of that happened, did it? No, I don't, I don't even remember that. But you had the presence of mind to lie to the officer at the time when he was investigating. Like I said, I was traumatized. I don't know. I don't remember this, sir. Um, he wouldn't come upstairs when she said goodnight. She walked down to the last couple of stairs and asked for a hug and a kiss. That didn't happen either, did it? 
I don't remember. I mean, I would assume not, but I don't remember. In fact, you're acknowledging that the, that video that shows you dragging him into a small room, looking like he does when he dies, calling him a dummy for breathing with his mouth open, is actually what you did to him the night before he died, right? If that's what it shows, I don't remember, sir. I, I think as he was dying is what she did to him. Your statement to Detective PC continues. She got ready for work in the morning and went to check on him. She said his name, but he did not respond. She put her hand on his chest and he was not breathing. She remembered her 20-year-old son, Paul, helping her get him off the bed. That was all a lie, wasn't it? Yes, sir. You know where he was when you found him that morning, right? In, in the closet. In, in the small room. room. And er, prior to that, you told Officer Stephanie, well, it was about 5.30, he fell out of bed, and I had to go and put him back into bed. Also a lie, right? Yes, sir. I have no idea why I said that, sir. Like I said, I was traumatized. <laughs> <laughs> I don't give a, who cares how you felt. That Timothy started a, stated he was on a hunger strike two weeks ago. This is two weeks before he dies. He goes on a hunger strike. Yes, sir. Did he go on a hunger strike? Yes, sir, he did. In January? Show me the text message between you and Paul where it says that he's on a hunger strike. I don't know if I ever texted him about it, sir. We talked about it, but I never texted I mean... If it's not in there, I don't, we didn't text about everything. You, 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 never, you never texted Paul about him being on a hunger strike? No, I would have told him that in person. I wouldn't have said that over text message. No, I said the rest of the stupid stuff over text message. Paul has to watch him for the day when you're not home, right? Yes, sir. So it would be Paul's responsibility to get him some food, right? Yes, sir. So while he's on a hunger strike, instead of talking about the hunger strike, your response to that is give him four slices of bread with hot sauce on it, and if he eats them and waits 30 minutes, he can eat four without. Right? I don't know what day that was, sir, if you're... Well, let's find it and make sure. I mean, we, we tried to, just because he wasn't eating, we tried to feed him. That was... And the best hot solution sauce. you could come up with is force him to eat the bread with hot sauce on it. That was the response of the hunger strike? I don't remember, sir. I mean, it wasn't... We tried to feed him. That's... That's all I remember. <clears throat> So when would that hunger strike have started? Um, end of June, late June. Again, you never looked at the, the bone thin photo to see what kind of condition he was in before he goes on this hunger strike, right? Yes, sir. And did it ever occur to you like he's on a hunger strike now? And I know Paul had sent me that text about, you know, he's bone thin. I think we actually need to feed him. We need to actually feed him. It never occurred to you that maybe you should go back and look at that text message now and see what condition he was in at the time? No, sir. When With me, when something's out of sight, it's out of mind. Once that's scrolled up, I don't scroll back <coughs> to the text messages. Like your out son? of sight, out of mind. That applies to Timothy as well, doesn't it? That applies to, to a lot of things, sir. It's not just, I mean, if uh, little man wasn't... No. If the answer was, was not no. in front of me right then, then I wasn't necessarily thinking about it. Paul wasn't. June 19th, you can do his bread with hot sauce at any time, though preferably sooner rather than later. Put more hot sauce on than you did yesterday, please. And he has to eat at least three slices with hot sauce, but he may have more as long as they have plenty of hot sauce on him. That was June 19th. Was he on his hunger strike then? I would assume not. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have an exact date. That was about two weeks before he, he passed away, and that's when you said the hunger strike started. Is that right? Yes, sir. But did it occur to you that the hunger strike was because he didn't enjoy eating bread with hot sauce on it? Did it occur to me? No, sir, because he did it way back in January, and that wasn't the case. June 21st, how, how is everything? Did you make him eat his bread with hot sauce? Yeah, and that's when it's the, uh, he gets four with hot sauce and then four more, 30 minutes. That was June 21st. You don't know if hunger strike started there then? I don't know, sir. Like I said, I, I can only guesstimate. That's... <clears throat> The only reason I remember the three weeks the first time around is because it was right after the stroke and it, he started eating again before the end of January. Did you, did you think he's on a second hunger strike now? <coughs> I really need to get him some treatment for this. Did I think along those lines? No, sir. He, he admitted to being, he told us 
very early on after the stroke that he was taking advantage of that because we didn't have the extra set of eyes with my husband and he was being difficult. He, he actually, Timothy told me that his dad and stepmom used to let him get away with everything. Whether that's true or not, I don't know, but he's, I've always been a stricter parent anyway and he, he told me on multiple occasions that if, um, if he thought that if he pushed me hard enough that I would just quit making him do stuff and I, I wouldn't make him cooperate. All right, well, here's an exchange from June 29th. Maybe this can shed some light on the hunger strike feeding situation. Trust me, I know he's thin. Trust me, I know he's thin. That was your, your text, no? Paul's, you sent. You I, sent I Paul don't that remember text, the right? text, but I mean. You don't remember that one either? No, sir. Trust me, I know he's thin. That being said, he told me a week and a half ago that he wanted to be thin to make me feel bad for punishing him. You don't get to grump at him for that, though I already lit into him plenty for it. Is this while he's on his hunger strike? I mean, I would, I would assume so, yes, sir. This is June 29th. This is yes, about eight days before he dies. Yeah, I would assume so. And Paul's response is, of course he did. And your response to that is, yeah, so while I want to fix it, he will get most of his calories from plain bread and rice or, you know, pulling that. He will get plenty of calories but not get to enjoy them that way, you know? Uh, that doesn't sound like somebody who's on a hunger strike to me. Can you clarify that for me, please? I don't, I don't remember, but I know he wasn't eating. A good question would be, and we would not have an answer to this because he didn't go to the doctor. Uh, when he went on his hunger strike in January for three weeks, what was his starting weight? What was his ending weight? You say you lose weight really fast. So you're saying then maybe he loses weight really fast. 30 pounds in two weeks, that's super fast. Not saying out of, you know, maybe. But I'd be curious, what was this to this in January? We don't know. Because you either didn't take him to the doctor because you didn't have your husband's insurance, or you didn't take him to the doctor because you didn't take him to the doctor. Cause, oh, because you didn't have a doctor. Sorry, I didn't remember what your answer was. Just like you don't remember a lot of stuff. And I know, I am not dismissing that people go through a lot of traumatic stuff and they may not remember everything. But this is ridiculous. And I'm sure when her attorney gets back up, She's going to start blaming her her son again that was on the stand. So just in a fair warning, in about 10 minutes, <laughs> they're, they're just going to say, see ya, without warning, and cut this off. So I will play it until, until the uh, cameraman at that news channel apparently says, I'm out. There was... Continues on. KK, so yeah, we'll tell you more about what he can eat later, June 29th. Just because we offered him food doesn't, I mean, we offered him food when he was on the hunger strike in January. Um, at least I did. I mean, I would assume Paul did as well. Sure you did. But just because you offered stuff, I mean, you couldn't, even though it says try to force him to eat, he couldn't force him to eat stuff. I mean, if he didn't You heard Paul's it. testimony yesterday that he had to force him, force him to eat the bread sauce, the bread with hot sauce on it, didn't you? Yes, sir. I don't know what he means by that. Uh, it's interesting you use the phrase, we, we tried to tempt him with food. Uh, that, that came up while he was in the ice bath, didn't it? Tempting him with food. Do you mean the day before he passed? Mm -hmm. Yes. Pizza roll. I mean, I, I said, I, yes, sir. I mean, I... <clears throat> You told Paul to heat up some pizza rolls because she needed the pizza rolls anyway, right? Do you remember that? Yes, sir. I, I don't remember the text message. Don't remember, so this falls in the I don't remember category as well. Is that right? Like most of it. Well, yes, the sir. text message says... Heat one up, hold it in front of them, but be ready to pull it away if he tries to grab it. If you don't remember sending any of that. I don't remember it, no, sir. You heard, you heard the text messages read yesterday, correct? Yes, sir, I did. Is it, is it fair to say that you just don't remember those text messages? Most of them, I don't remember. Most of them. But then you've got your big bind. I can, I can pretty much guarantee I don't remember most of that either. I don't, and it's not just my text with Paul. 
you, you don't remember anything. No, sir, I don't. But somehow you were able to hold down a job as a judicial clerk during that time period, right? Yes, sir. And pass the bar with a really high school. You were able to at least provide dog training to one client at that time, correct? Yes, sir. And you remembered to tell Paul to get up and walk Sharma just about every morning, didn't you? I mean, I, that would be automatic. It would be reflex. If it's in there, then, then I would assume so, yes, sir. That would be reflex to, to tell Paul to get up and walk Sharma? Is that what you're saying? I mean, if, I, if it's a habit, if I do it enough times, then... And plus, it served to get Paul out of bed when I left, because he liked to go back to sleep. You told the officer that there was an alarm on the basement door. That, that, that's this, the closet. This is the small closet, because there were some sewing stuff stored in it. That was a lie, wasn't it? Yes, sir. There was sewing stuff stored in it before he asked to do that. But, but the alarm I don't know why I told him that. The alarm wasn't on there because there was sewing stuff on it, was there? No, sir. The alarm was on it because Paul, because Timothy was supposed to be in there, right? I mean, as far as I know, like I said, I don't. Don't, don't. You don't remember, but you were able to lie to the police officer at the time? I don't remember talking to the police I mean, I don't remember this part of the conversation with the police officer, sir. You tell the officer that there were cameras in the home because, they, because G would strip down naked and wander around. Um, well, that wasn't the only reason the cameras were in the house, was it? No, sir. You left out all the other details about that you had to monitor Timothy and make sure he didn't go to certain places and sneak places and be deceitful, right? You didn't tell the officer that, did you? Apparently not. I don't know why I didn't, but... You said he fell out of bed and you went and had to get him and put him back into bed. He never fell out of bed that night, did he? Not as far as I know. I don't remember, sir. Well, you know he didn't sleep in the bed that night, don't you? Well, yeah, so I'm sorry. Right. Saying that you got up at 5.30 and had to put him back into bed uh, and then you changed it to 30 minutes because it's sometime with the ending in a 30 because you learned at that point that rigor mortis had already set in and he'd been deceased for a number of hours. That was still a lie, wasn't it? I mean, yes, sir, I don't remember any of this. I'm sorry. <coughs> the, hot sauce, the hot sauce in the bathroom downstairs was for food. Um, but it wasn't, was it? The hot sauce was for punishment, right? It was also to put on food. But you didn't mention that oh, we also use hot sauce as a form of punishment, did you? Apparently not. I... I'm guessing you probably didn't mention the officer. Oh, we also had the crazy idea yesterday to pour some hot sauce on his penis for a punishment. You didn't mention that either, did you? Apparently not, sir. Like I said, I don't remember. You told the officer that you did not restrict Timothy's movement at night with shackles. That was also a lie, wasn't it? Again, I don't remember, sir. I know we talked about it, but as far as overnight, no. But you would restrict his movement with shackles, wouldn't you? Whether it was zip ties or handcuffs or leg shackles. I mean, I can only go by based on the text messages. I don't know. Why did you wait 20 minutes to call 911 after you found Timothy deceased in the small closet in the small room? I have no idea, honestly. I did. I had. I learned of that gap, what, just a couple of days ago. I, it, the whole. I mean, the whole day is surreal to me. So I, I have no idea why we waited like that. I don't know. I can't imagine waiting, but apparently it happened. I don't know. Well, your son said you were getting him dressed. Do you remember Paul asking you, "Should we call 911"? I don't remember him ever asking. I, I don't, I mean, because I was the one that called. And I was the one, I, I, he, I remember performing CPR. And he did help me out a little bit when I got tired to take over a little bit. But, I mean, I can't imagine ever saying no to that. I, but if it's on the video, that's what you said, right? If it's on there. So if the video showed that it begins with you with movement outside of the room at about 6.19.21, and 911 is actually called
she's smart enough to know she doesn't want you these said, videos you tell out Paul there. You have to so. call at six thirty-seven. So about that's about eighteen minutes, isn't it? She's going to agree with him. I mean, I'll, let's see, nineteen. Yeah, that's eighteen minutes. And Timothy was never responsive to you, was he? No, sir. His eyes were completely wide open, completely glazed over, weren't they? As far as I remember, yes, sir. He never moved. Never took a breath. Never did anything, did? No, sir. And while this is all going on, you tell. Paul will have to tell them he was on a hunger strike, right? You remember telling him that? No, I don't. Don't remember that either? No, sir. Do you remember telling Paul, or do you remember saying, put his pants on to make it look like he's been this way? I don't remember saying that. Do you remember asking Paul to put the belt on to make it sure that that's the way he looked? No, sir. But if they're on video, you said those things, yes, right? Yes, Van Ark, isn't it true? Timothy had just become nothing more than an annoyance for you, and he wasn't even a human being in your eyes anymore. That is absolutely not true. Are we going to get a tear? Oh. No. Ms. Van Ark. Yes, sir. Did you... In, in your Lord, did you reduce everything you did and said and 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 the comments you made into text that you put in your your your, your phone and sent out? Oh, absolutely not. I talk a lot. I admit that. I, the text was probably ten percent of what I said. Okay, so it, it would it be true to say that there there are other conversations, other issues, other details that are not contained in those texts? Many, yes, sir. Okay, uh, you were asked. Um, if you only couldn't remember the, the, the bad things or the, I guess, the incriminating things. You remember having that question? Yes, sir, I remember that question. Were you, do, during the course of this conversation, yeah, with Mr. Roberts, were you ever asked about any of the good things that were going on? Not really, no, sir. So, in, and I, as I recall, you reported that you can't remember some of those as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I know my son played baseball. I don't remember most of his games, and I know I caught for the team because the coaches were on first and third, but I don't actually remember doing it most of the time. I remember a couple of games, but I know we had more than two games. Let me ask you about this. You, you, you had children, and you taught dogs. Yes, sir. Do you teach children and dogs conduct or responsibility in the same manner? Absolutely not. Uh, did you ever uh, deprive your son of water as far as your No, sir. No, sir. Uh, there was conversation from Paul, and he asked, he said that you broke a chip in the four places, and you threw it out the window. Did you do that? No, sir. No. The, uh, show the jury in, in using your fingers how big a, a chip is. It's a micro SD. Yep. That's what these people do. <laughs> ah, it's so frustrating. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> I was expecting this one. I was not expecting it when they did it to me on Friday. When I was streaming Friday, it just went up ABC. I'm like, what? We're right in the middle of something here. Jerks. Alrighty. So. I like I said I have no idea. I know this went to uh, the jury. I believe it went to the jury on Friday. Uh, apparently, because when I was streaming on Friday, somebody popped in <laughs> and said, "Is there a verdict?" I'm like, "I don't know," because I wasn't there yet. I was doing the first day. This is the second day. Tomorrow we're going to do the third day, which is the final day, and. I have no idea if there is a verdict. I have not seen it. Uh, I've really not been looking. So, I don't know. Find out when you guys find out. Uh, so, we will do the rest. We will do, not the rest of. We will do uh, Friday testimony tomorrow. So, I don't know if she's the only witness that the defense puts on. I don't know who you put on after her. 
because he said he wasn't putting on a doctor that could say about her, um, what'd she say? Disassociative, like disassociating things, whatever that was supposedly called. She, he tried, her attorney tried to get that in and the state said she's not an expert in that and they don't have a doctor testify, but I've got one ready to go on rebuttal if they want to talk about it because he's met with her and says she doesn't have it so that was that was nipped real quick uh i don't know i have no idea so we'll be surprised together i don't know if she's still on the stand with redirect because well he's redirect and then he'll get the state will get recross i have no idea so we'll um find out tomorrow together um my guess is she is will be on the stand for a little bit. And then if the uh, defense doesn't have any more witnesses, we'll do closings and hopefully get a verdict. I would thought this wouldn't take very long, but I don't want to sound like those people on the other, other channels that, you know, think a verdict should come back immediately, like on TV after commercial break. Uh, or they ask when the verdict's going to be. Nobody knows that. And it's really annoying. So tomorrow at 1030, we'll do this. Should, if, as long as there's a verdict in, we'll finish this up tomorrow. If not, I'll keep an eye out for a verdict. But I do not plan on, tomorrow will be my last day streaming. Um, at least until after Christmas, but maybe until after the first of the year because, um, my sister is supposed to be coming for Christmas and I only get to see her once or twice a year and I'm not sure whether why she's come from Minnesota. So, you know, snow can happen anytime up there. So she's supposed to stay a little bit after Christmas. So I'd like to spend some time with her. So I may not be back until the Wednesday after New Year's. What's that? The third but I don't know. We'll see. I'll probably do some short stuff, like quick stuff if I can, if I have time. Um, but yep, I know everybody's busy anyway. And this kind of stuff is heavy. I wasn't not going to do this trial until I saw how short it was. Uh, I don't like this woman. <laughs> yeah, I'm picked up on it. I don't like her. I don't believe her. I think she's horrible. I don't think she deserves five kids that she has. I'm glad most of them are away from her. I wish this one had never come back to her because he was away from her and he would have been better off staying away from her. And the courts agreed, although we'll never find out why because that's not being allowed it I understand why it's prejudicial but I'm curious so I will see you all tomorrow 10 30 a.m eastern time and we will wrap this puppy up till then y'all have a good night we'll see you in the morning or evening, whatever it is for you. See you tomorrow.